Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It is May 25th. We are on the seafloor at 260 feet off the coast of North Carolina. We are slowly approaching the shipwreck of the World War II tanker, the E.M. Clark, and we're very proud to bring you the shipwreck and the ecological story that we'll be talking about today. So we are the Valor in the Atlantic Telepresence Project. Uh, this is a cooperative agreement between NOAA, the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, and the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration. So GFOE, as they're known, are the ones that are bringing you this live pictures that we're seeing now, live from the seafloor. So they build these ROVs, these remotely operated vehicles, they design them, and they pilot them as well. So this is all of their technology that's helping you to do this first-hand exploration with us as we're offshore of North Carolina. Um, I'm also with the North Carolina Office of State Archaeology with their underwater archaeologist, Chris Sutherly. And on the line as well from NOAA, we have the National Center for Coastal Ocean Science Ecologist, Dr. Avery Paxton. And Avery, are you with us today? I am, Tony. I am really excited to see that just uh, maybe 10, 20 seconds ago, there was a large predator in sight of the remotely operated vehicle. It's a shark called the sand tiger shark, and we can talk more about those um, animals as the dive progresses today. But good sign means we're approaching the wreck. Yeah, so it just shows you, I mean, how much we're really looking at when we go to the shipwreck site, that it is the history and it's the archaeology and the shipwreck and that story of World War II. But, of course, today it's really important to talk about the shipwreck as a habitat, this living resource now that's providing this, this home and shelter for so much marine life. So that's a big part of what we'll, we'll, we'll be discussing. So I mentioned our partners that we have today talking about this multidisciplinary science project we're doing on the seafloor. But a key part, of course, is the NOAA ship that got us here to begin with. So it's a very complex maneuvering that we have to do in the water column and on the seafloor itself with the ROVs. But the other part of that equation is, of course, the ship on the surface, and that's the NOAA ship Nancy Foster. We like to think of it as the, the pride of the NOAA White Fleet. It's a ship that can do it all. And we're very lucky today to have their ops officer with us, uh, Lieutenant Dale Gump, who's a NOAA Corps officer. And Dale, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, Tane. Uh, it's great being here. It's been just an incredible experience for me to be part of this this collaboration and uh, seeing some of these really stunning images that we've been able to acquire on the seafloor. And um, you know, as a NOAA Corps officer on board the ship and working with our our wage mariner crew of professional mariners, um, and it's a it's a team effort that really starts first thing in the morning. And when I say first thing, I mean <laughs> 3 a.m. Uh, or before, uh, getting set up and, and checking conditions and transiting to see what sites might work. So it's a, it's a process, and it's, it's been really fun to, to just be part of this expedition. Well, and I, I got to say, as the part of the science party of this, this expedition, um, you guys make it easy for us. You take a lot of the stress off us. But, um, you know, we talked about um, your role as an officer with the NOAA Corps. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the NOAA Corps. I don't think a lot of people know about it, but it is a wonderful career path. I think I'm quoted somewhere online saying it's the government's best kept secret, and uh, I think I stand by that. Um, we are a, a cadre of officers, about 320 of us, um, that get trained at the Coast Guard Academy, but we are our own service uh, of uniformed officers um, that operate um, NOAA aircraft, NOAA ships, um, and ashore. Um, we have divers, you know, people, people are really focused on the operational end of NOAA and we function within all the different line offices of NOAA. So we have mathematics backgrounds, science backgrounds, engineering backgrounds. Um, so we really um, understand and appreciate the work that we're doing, but we're really focused on, on what we call the pointy end, doing the, doing the operational side. So our job here on board the ship is to uh, drive it, um, keep it safe. Uh, make sure that the operations that we're, we're conducting are going to keep everyone aboard safe, the equipment safe, um, and just assessing conditions. And, and really our job here is to be, be the professional mariner that, that guides us into, into position. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's, you know, again, you got, you're all in the ship are doing an incredible job and, you know, basically allowing this interaction on the seafloor. Um, you know, maybe you can talk to us a little bit about the challenges we've had the last couple of days. Uh, we've been experiencing some really high currents um, that have kind of moved us beyond our safety parameters, but what's it like for the ship trying to hold station? That means holding its position over the shipwreck. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a challenge for sure, especially here. I think this is one of the most unique parts of our American shoreline, and 
Um, if it's not one thing, it's another. There's just so many different things that can that can halt operations, um, including surface conditions, wind, sea state, current, um, not to mention the current uh, all the way down at the seafloor. And you're thinking about that entire water column from top to bottom uh, when we're setting up on, on station. So uh, when I said we started super early in the morning, what we're really looking for then is, is which direction is the wind coming from? What, what direction is the, the swell coming from? Are we going to be able to hold in a surface current? Um, you know, and typically our limitation is between a knot and a knot and a half, depending on some other things. But um, so we're we're taking all those factors into account, and we're assessing uh, our our environments. Um, and if we get to a green light, red light situation, a go no go situation, you know, we'll we'll confer with you, of course, and and the GFOE team. Um, and this is a, a decision that really takes all parts uh, to, to come in. But, but what we're looking at is, uh, from a ship's operations perspective is those environmental conditions. Yeah, and just to, for folks to realize the challenging conditions off Cape, uh, Cape Hatteras, I mean, I keep saying they don't call it a cape for nothing. Um, so we could be working with a wind that's going in one direction that's quite strong. The waves are going in a different direction that could be quite large. And, of course, the current on the surface in the middle of the water column and the bottom can be in three different directions. So it's it's almost like, I don't know, trying to do uh, ballroom dancing on ice. I mean, you guys do a fantastic job. Um, yeah, and we're well equipped for it on this ship. And uh, it's the first ship that I've, I've sailed on that's been, uh, it has something called dynamic positioning. So we have um, basically two 360 degree motors that can kind of drive the, the stern end of the ship plus a, a main engine and a bow thruster. So when we come onto a station like this and we want to determine whether or not it's going to be safe, we'll shut down the main engine and we'll drive kind of with those two back corner uh, motors and then just uh, a, another one right at the bow. So we can try to hold ourselves exactly at a particular angle such that we can stem those conditions and, and hold us at a, at a certain speed through the water uh, and a certain speed over ground. And then we say, okay, this is it. We want to we want to dive here we want to operate here we can go into a hold position mode uh, we can kind of just stop everything and sit still and we have the, the a computer really assesses where we are using gps um, and it'll use just enough motor to keep us in that particular location so it's really really technical and it's really awesome um, it's nice to be on a, a ship that has that kind of capability yeah no absolutely it's very special um so, you know, when we think about a, a ship or a boat, you know, they have the main propellers underneath, like four, four blades or so that are spinning. So you use those, but also something called the Z-Drive, right? So you mentioned they can actually, so you'll stop those main propellers and use these Z-Drives that can literally spin in 360 degrees. And I think you described it perfectly yesterday, like a, almost like a fan. Yeah, it's, a, it's an azimuthing um, propeller, really, that can... Um, you know, push push you from the right corner left, and push you from the left corner right, and use it just in the right balance to keep us uh, pointed in the right direction and on station. So um, it is a really special mode of of navigating or or, or, or pro uh, propelling through the water um, that helps us hold hold station really well. So it's. It's something that's absolutely necessary when you're conducting these types of operations because of how delicate it can be. Um, and, and having just, say, one main engine, like a lot of ships or recreational boats that we think about, uh, where there's a throttle and, and one, one motor, one propeller right at the back of the, the boat, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be adequate. There's, there's no way to hold in these extreme conditions with, uh, without all of the special, the special things we're equipped with. Yeah, no, that, yeah, well said. And, you know, for the folks at home to realize, too, that we are working with two uh, remotely operated vehicles or ROVs, which are uh, un uh, they're unmanned, they're, they're not human powered robots on the bottom. So they actually have a tether or line that goes all the way to the surface. So just like uh, mm -hmm. Lieutenant Gump was telling us, we have to hold the station above it because that tether, that line is coming all the way back to the ship. And you know, if you just have regular propellers back there, not only would it be hard to stay where you need to, uh, there's a chance that line could be pulled into those main propellers and now we've got a whole other yeah, issue to deal with. All sorts of problems <laughs> for everybody, yeah. So we, we certainly don't want that. And then, you know, Dale, as we're uh, on the bottom here, we're, we're on the seafloor, we're slowly uh, approaching the shipwreck. You know, as a, as a mariner and a, an officer at sea the, working the bridge, you know, what's your thoughts thinking about uh, what this very similar American vessel did during World War II and where it is now. Man, this is special. I'll tell you, this is um, this has been so so fascinating for me and something that I think about all the time. And once upon a time in a previous life, um, I served aboard submarines, um, and, and it's impossible to be down there thinking about 
are not thinking about what's around you, you know, and what happened and, and what your history is and, and your predecessors and thinking about, you know, how close warfare came to our shoreline. And it's, you know, much like the NOAA Corps is, is this forgotten service, um, war on our shoreline was forgotten in World War II. And people think about the, um, you know, the Pacific, uh, people think about what happened in Europe. Um, but, but World War II came right here to our shoreline and to be part of it and to be thinking about the history there, but also that this environment that's around you and, and as a submariner you're thinking about, um, like, if I just had a window, what would be out there if I just had a window? Um, and, and being able to see that now and then now in, in my more recent life, being a hydrographer on board my last ship, you're sending sound waves into the ocean that make these beautiful three-dimensional yeah. images of what's on the seafloor. Um, but finding it is, is really when you're making chart additions is, is the main point, is, is just knowing that it's there, making sure that it's navigationally safe, um, that, that shipping that's coming to and from our shores is not going to hit it. Um, and then we move on and we don't ever get to know like the really cool, gritty details of, of what's the story behind that vessel that's down there and that wreck we just found and, and when did it happen and, and you know what's the, the historical significance and of course all of the things that, that peak human curiosity about shipwrecks and just it's really fascinating and it's it's been so cool for me for the first time in my life while dancing around it finally being able to see it with my own eyes and being part of this expedition has been really special yeah well no ex exactly yeah we're, we're all very proud and privileged to be here and, you know again i mentioned we're on the sea floor at 260 feet um off cape hatteras north carolina on the world war ii tanker em clark uh we're slowly moving um our way to the shipwreck itself um, you know, uh, Dale, you made a good point mentioning your past uh, service with the United States Navy, and thank you for your service. Uh, you know, it is, uh, you, I think you have a unique perspective, again, as a submariner in that history. Again, you know, I think a lot of us don't realize as civilians, like, oh, yeah, that's right. U.S. Navy submarines don't have portholes. <laughs> you don't necessarily look out visually um, using our traditional sort of video cameras and things right. that we know of, <laughs> I'll say. Um, but, you know, with that U.S. Naval heritage and being that this vessel is actually sunk by a, a German U-boat, um, what is some, maybe some of your thoughts about that? I think that'd be interesting. Yeah. Um, first of all, a totally different era of submarining than uh, we, we have now, for sure. Um, you know, the, the sacrifice that went into everybody, both on the German and, and American side, and everybody you know, in that world, thinking about what it was like to be on a submarine um, with zero comforts of life. Um, just people living uh, as rough as you possibly can imagine and then worse. Um, and, and transiting you know, across oceans and, and serving, um, it, it's, it's really mind-blowing. And, and the more you think about it, the more you learn about U-boats um, uh, and, and the warfare that came to our shoreline, um, the more appreciation you can certainly have for it. But it certainly, is, um, it certainly is special to me because when you walk into submarine class, when you, before you ever step foot on board a submarine, uh, the first thing they do is teach you about the history and, and where you came from. Um, and we're very proud. Uh, we're all very proud of our service. And um, it's, it's been this, this particular expedition, being that it's so U-boat focused, whether it be the, the tankers that they shot down or the U-boats themselves, um, it's, it's, it's somber, um, it's sobering. Um, it's moving, um, but it's it's really impactful, and, and it's been it's been a it's been fun for me to see. Yeah, well, well, thank you. And you know, the more we learn about the silent service in World War II and and up to modern day, it is a, a fascinating story. As pieces and parts of it become more and more available to the public, but it's a fascinating part of our history. And um, a little earlier, we saw a sand tiger shark swim by um, that uh, Avery had pointed out a little bit earlier that we'd seen, and in the distance, we can see I believe some more marine life and the shipwreck is in front of us as well and we do have something else kind of slowly swimming towards us maybe another sand tiger shark as well coming out of the gloom but the conditions even though the current is a bit strong it looks like we're in the gulf stream waters if it is a sand tiger shark so we've got some nice views here um, the currents are quite strong but it is providing that very clear very blue water um, and as a scuba diver <laughs> we've dove this site several times and uh, i would love to be on the seafloor now to physically be there but there's also a part of me that loves to have this unlimited time on the surface to really work with our our experts um, on the ship and on land uh, to to study the site without any sort of time requirements or uh, putting our bodies through stress the decompression you know i believe uh we, i think on the line we also have uh joe schwartzer who is the director of the north carolina maritime system are you here too joe
and maybe maybe not uh, quite yet, but we're going to have Joe Schwartzer here a little bit later, and they have an exhibit coming up at their graveyard at the Atlantic Museum in Hatteras, North Carolina, that'll be interpreting this shipwreck and so much more from World War II's Battle of the Atlantic. Um, you know, so again, we can see the sand tiger sharks were on the sea floor. We're moving forward. This is the Valor in the Atlantic telepresence project. And again, a lot of this capability is being brought to us by the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration. I mentioned the ROVs, their expertise with the piloting. But I should also mention it's that satellite capability, too, that they also brought on board. So they're enabling not only what we're able to see on the ship here live, but sharing that with you live to have that real-time exploration that really no one else can provide. So this is a very strong partnership with GFOE, and we're very, very happy to be working with them to share this story with you, this very unique story. And, um, and Avery, I think we're seeing some more predators here. Is that right? Yes, on my screen, Tane, on feed one, I'm seeing several sand tiger sharks um, moving close to the seafloor, and I had also seen some smaller but still large predators called jacks. They are silvery, and they have a very lunator, very strongly forked, as we call it, um, tail. And so one of the things that we often see as we approach these shipwrecks, like the E.M. Clark, is that sometimes we can start to know the shipwreck is in the distance, um, even without our navigation aids, because we see some of these large predators that associate so frequently um, and pretty tightly to these ship structures. And I think as we go through today, um, we're going to be learning a lot more about how these animals are using shipwrecks for their home. Um, and I'm hoping we'll see a variety of behaviors that will help illustrate that story pretty nicely. Yeah, I hope so, too. As, as we're approaching, we can actually see the shipwreck uh, in the distance with the ROV. And what we're looking at is the stern of the vessel, which is the end of the vessel. It has something called a fan tail, which is sort of this beautifully designed sort of the end of the vessel where it goes underneath, where it's going to see the rudder and the propeller, but also just kind of literally sort of fans out a little bit like a hand fan. Um, and it, it's quite uh, a beautiful uh, piece of uh, architecture and uh, ship construction. So that would be to the right and then to the left of the shipwreck. That's actually the deck there. So that's the top part where the crew would have walked and worked. But that's what we're seeing here on the seafloor. And if I bring in a, a compatriot I have on the ship, uh, underwater archaeologist Chris Sutherley. And Chris, you know, as we are approaching the ship, especially some of these war casualties, do you sometimes expect to see sort of, sort of uh, detritus and artifacts and things strewn from the wreck site? Is that sometimes things you can, you know, could be indicators that the wreck is coming up to you when you see those things? I guess that, yes, honey. In a lot of cases, depending on the, the type of wrecking process that you have, you know, the, in this case, the, the Clark was torpedoed in the, the port side, so there's a lot of, a lot of possibilities for some of the, what we call material culture, the, the stuff that people use, the artifacts, as an archaeologist to come out and spill and depending on the type of wreck sometimes you'll see it as you're saying a debris trail or uh, something along the seafloor that will lead to or from wreck uh, in some cases you'll see a, an anchor had been deployed so you'll see a long length of anchor chain that might be strung out that might be a clue uh, to, to locate the wreck uh, but one of the things that we see here because of that the environment is so dynamic, unless it's a pretty large object, in, in all likelihood it's going to be swept away and not much left of anything surrounding uh, the wreck unless it, it becomes buried or, again, it's a larger, heavier object that would stay rooted to the bottom. Uh, so the, most of the artifacts and content would probably still be within the, the wreck itself. Uh, okay, well, it's good to know as, as we're watching here, looking at the shipwreck, it's a good thing for the folks at home to watch too, um, to see, you know, if we're seeing artifacts on the seafloor, things of that nature. Um, again, it was, it was quite a violent uh, end to the shipwreck. It was slammed with two torpedoes by the U-124 on, the, on March 18th in 1942. So the ship went down quite quickly as well. So I, I should point out, we've got a bit of, a bit of engineering going on here on the seafloor and you, you've seen sort of an arm extend out from the ROV with a box at the end with what looks like three bubbles on it. That's actually a 360 video camera. So 
one of the products we want to come out of this project with is actually creating sort of a virtual reality video experience so we can put it on a website you could download it and have this sort of this first-hand experience on the shipwreck yourself and especially if you put on a pair of vr goggles and you've downloaded this video to it which will be for free will actually feel like you're in this space itself swimming around the shipwreck with a fish swirling around you we've seen a couple sand tiger sharks actually come up to the um the boxfish 360 video camera which it, what that is called and uh we're really hoping to bring this incredible experience to you and, and we've got a beautiful scene here is the boxfish camera and the rovs approaching again that stern which is the end of the shipwreck and we can see um, the lower underneath the hold or part of the hold the rudder the propeller on the right hand side and above the shipwreck if you're able to see that on one of the feeds you can actually see almost like a phalanx of sand tiger sharks all swimming in the current there and of course they're down below the wreck too but it's a quite dynamic uh picture we're seeing here and, and avery maybe uh can you help us understand this i've seen two kind of behaviors with the sand tiger sharks one they're very low lying against the sand but also they're up in the water column. Is there a reason why they're in the two different locations? That's a really good question, Tane, and we don't fully understand that um, difference in behavior yet. Um, one thing I can tell you, though, is that we do know that sand tiger sharks rely on shipwrecks as key habitats. Um, we'll often see them just kind of resting um, on the bottom, like we've seen some today. Sometimes we'll see them resting close to the shipwreck, other times further away. Um, and sometimes we do see this really interesting behavior where they're hovering above the wreck, um, oftentimes holding position um, as the current is coming towards them. And it, on certain days, we see hundreds of sand tiger sharks exhibiting that behavior. And on other days, we sometimes don't see sand tiger sharks on the same wreck as the day before we saw so many. And so it's such a dynamic environment. And I think to me, one of the things that makes it so intriguing to study these shipwrecks and the biology of them is there's so many unanswered mysteries um, that remain. And footage like this that we collect from remotely operated vehicle um, dives where we're able to get such a limitless time on the bottom is so valuable in helping to untangle some of those mysteries. And can you talk, Chris Sutherly, a little bit from the archaeological side of how being able to spend so much time on the bottom on these sites is advantageous? Oh, absolutely, Avery. The, you know, the, the wreck that we have here is you know, sitting deep enough. She's about you know, 260 feet that this is a, a technical dive for putting scuba divers in the water. And that, you know, there, there's a small percentage of divers that have that skill set. And the, the main issue with that is not only is it just a dynamic site to get to, being this far down and with the currents that are running, which make it challenging for the diver, but the dive time is extremely limited. So you might get 20, maybe 25 minutes at the most on the bottom to have your task done, which limits you to a very small area and a, a sh kind of a snapshot or a short time frame to, to do the work. And then you have to, to come back up and spend a lot of time decompressing to return to the surface safely. It's physically demanding. Uh, it's mentally demanding because you're, you're focused on your task in a very short period of time. But having the ROV down there with all the cameras and the high definition recording. Uh, as you said, from, from the biological and the ecological observations, we have almost unlimited time that we can spend on the bottom cruising around this wreck, looking at the details, studying things very closely. Um, and the, the ROVs also have the capability to do measurements for us. They have a, a laser measuring guide so we can actually get good measurements on um, on some of these objects. And it's, it's really a tremendous benefit to, to be able to have that unlimited time on the bottom. And Avery, I'm looking at the, the, the quad camera and it looked like there was another fish down there that was sort of uh, had these large fans for fins and it was sort of striped colored, so sort of almost like a pointy ends. What, what was that we're seeing? It was down at the bottom of uh, 
the, underneath the hull almost, it was swimming around, very, very brightly colored white and sort of a red color. Yeah, so good eye, Tony. That was a lionfish lionfish that was um, is they're an invasive species, so one that's usually found in the Indo-Pacific, um, but several days ago started showing up on the uh, east coast of the United States. Um, and a team of researchers led by one of my colleagues, Paula Whitfield, has been at the forefront of studying lionfish or using some of the offshore rocky reefs that we have the North Carolina coastline, as well as sites like the shipwrecks that we see today. Um, and it's really interesting to see lions here. Um, so far, I've just seen one or two this morning. But one of the things you can identify them by, first of all, like you said, they're very brightly colored. Um, they have, I kind of like to think of them as like a porcupine of the sea almost. Um, they have these red and white colorations. Um, they are venomous, so you would not want to touch them. They have venomous spines. But ecologically, the really interesting thing is that because they aren't usually found here, um, a lot of the fish, the small reef fish, for example, aren't used to how lionfish um, may hunt. And so because of that, we have situations where lionfish being on shipwrecks can potentially um, alter the fish community dynamics that we're seeing. And we don't have evidence that that's happening on this particular wreck today, um, but we will use this opportunity to hopefully count lionfish and understand a little bit more about what they're doing on this site. And I'm seeing another one um, on feed one, as well as at the bottom left of um, the quad view, is using one of these spaces inside of the wreck that's hanging out there right now. And, and I think that's another interesting point is that the animals that we're going to see today are not only using the space around the rack and above the rack, but some of them are actually using the nooks and crannies inside of the rack structure and other organisms are growing on the rack, so encrusting it. And it's just it's such an incredible reflection that these sites that have such a profound historical and cultural significance are now islands um, of habitat resting on top of the sand, providing home for such a diversity of marine life. Um, and, Tani, can you tell us a little bit more? I know you spoke early on about what we're looking at, but what is the significance of this um, portion of the vessel historically? Yeah, well, as I mentioned before, so we're approaching it um, from the end of the vessel, which is the stern. The vessel is actually hit by two torpedoes by the U-124 on March 18th, 1942. This is, was a uh, time period was the height of the World War II German U-boat activity off the coast of North Carolina and the whole eastern seaboard, of course. But, you know, in North Carolina is really where the war came home with this tight congestion of these shipwrecks and the shipping lanes. And uh, the Germans knew we were here, and they really used that knowledge to devastating effect uh, to hit these sh ships. And they were taking the war material um, up and down the coast to be ready to be taken to those major convoys across the Atlantic. So the Germans knew if they came here, they could really start choking off um, those materials that were so badly needed in Europe in 1942. So what we're looking at here is actually the end of the vessel. The vessel is laying on its port side, which is the left-hand side of it. We're looking at the starboard side, which is the right, which is on the upper part of the hull. And, and on the left-hand side would be the deck, of the vessel where people would walk and work and then to the right we're actually seeing very large one of the very large propellers the other one is buried under the sand but for scale think of each one of those blades is about six feet long so it's huge and just behind that is a giant rudder and that rudder um, is about 15 feet long so it's just enormous for sense of scale and of course we're seeing the sand tiger sharks swimming above the wreck and to the left too so um yeah, just just magnificent, and I I think it's a beautiful stern. I, it's a it's called a fantail stern because it sort of fans out, um, and I think it's it's really just an attractive, uh, beautiful shot what we have right here. And then maybe uh, Chris Suddenly, you know, we, we're we're looking at the rudder, and a lot of that design hasn't changed for hundreds of years. Is that right? I guess so. Yeah, the 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 modern rudders that that are used today in the from World War II are the same as what have been used back in the, the age of discovery uh, with the wooden sailing ships. You have the what's called a the hinge mechanism on the rudder is, is called a pencil and gudgeon. 
system. Uh, the, the gudgeon strap attaches to the, to the bottom and the back of the ship and literally has a hole in it. And uh, there are pins, uh, angle pins that are on the rudder itself that, that drop into those gudgeon holes and it, it hangs off the, the stern of the boat. And you know, early on, it would have been done with a with a tiller or a whip staff, and eventually a ship's wheel. And in modern times, of course, it's all uh, mechanically or hydraulically driven to to turn the rudder. But yeah, the technology hasn't changed in in terms of the mechanics in hundreds and hundreds of years. Yeah, exactly. You know, and for for Dale, you know, as we're looking at this ship, and you're a you're an officer, you're with the NOAA Corps, you're, you've been around ships for a long time. You know, when we're looking at the bottom of the E.M. Clark here, um, you know, we look at the bottom of the Nancy Foster. Obviously, we have something called Z-drives. But if we remove the Z-drives, it seems like we're seeing a pretty similar bottom and in, in engine that we might see aboard the Nancy Foster in 2022. Yeah, I'd say that's one thing that doesn't really change too much is the idea of just pushing water, you know, using something to push water over a rudder and, and making the rudder make the ship move. Um, the, the general, the physics of it, the idea of how, how to make a, a, a ship move through the water really hasn't changed all that much. But I, I will say seeing some of these images and thinking about what it took to bring this project together, it, it, it's also worth it. Just fascinating, really outstanding uh, images. Um, and knowing that this, this project really started uh, years ago. Right. And, and people don't think like, oh, well, we, we've got this idea. Let's just load some ROVs and go. And uh, that's, that's, not, that's not how it works at all. It's a, it's a lot of people uh, that come together to make something like this happen. And, and I'm so thankful for the teamwork from GFOE, from NOAA Sanctuaries, um, and our crew here on board who work so hard, our engineers, our deck department, our officers. Um, you know, this didn't just start yesterday. And it's, it's been years of work to come to this moment. And it's really special to be part of it right now yeah well thank you i mean like i said we're, we're proud to have you with us and of course the ship and you know we, we've been talking about this project for close to three years you know we had weather we had some equipment issues that delayed things years past you know there's there's a pandemic that we had to navigate uh, but we're here and all that planning has actually made this possible what we're seeing today yeah. we really got to think it out because it is incredibly complex yeah and um you know just thinking about the story too and how you know the, the fact that the war came here to our shoreline and how much success the U-boats were having and you're talking about how much technology hadn't really changed over the years for ships but it really did change quite quickly particularly during World War II um, and German boats German U-boats had so much success uh, at the beginning there along our shoreline because we didn't really have a good idea um, what how to how to defend against it we didn't have our convoys built we didn't have really sufficient radar systems uh, to detect them and it led to, to a lot of losses a lot of casualties uh, for the for the American fleet up until we really started to figure things out in you know, 1942 and 1943. But you know, that's part of the submarine history that they teach us is technology moved so fast then, and this is why it's important. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're, we're getting some great views here. We're sort of uh, moving towards the deck side of the World War II tanker E.M. Clark. Uh, we're at 160 feet off the coast of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. We're getting some fantastic views as the RV is slowly kind of moving its way to the deck side as we can explore some of that structure um, that folks have probably recognized uh, from just looking at any kind of vessel aboard. See, there's what is called bits, uh, these two little projections up on the deck there, which you tie the lines off to when you come up to the dock, almost exactly what you find on a modern vessel. So it's, it's pretty funny that, you know, even uh, people who aren't versed in uh, marine construction or architecture can still look at this and be like, oh, I recognize that. And it's, you know, as archaeologists, too, it's really important to look at all these features. If we didn't know what the ship was, we could say, okay, well, here's where some of these bits was positioned. It looks like maybe there's a house, a wheelhouse or something, a structure here. We could look how many propellers there are, how many blades on the propeller, the shape of things. You know, don't tie into it, which could damage things because it's essentially a, uh, a crime scene on the bottom that we could come to 100 plus, if not hundreds of years later, put all those pieces together and really kind of figure out what this is. We're very lucky this is modern history, but yeah. this is how it's done. And I'd say, and I know you can attest to this, is, you know, in being a hydrographer on my, my previous ship, you spent a lot of time looking at multi-beam and side scan, side scan images trying to figure out what's what. Um, there's a lot of interpretation, a lot of guessing, a lot of, hey, what do you think? Um, and there's no 
equal to being down there and seeing it with your own eyes and being like, oh, that's what that was. That's what I was looking at. Um, and being able to tie that whole story together. That's why projects like this are so important. And actually, it's a good point that you are a hydrographer. Uh, NOAA produces those NOAA charts. And it's these white ships that are actually helping to produce those charts with the, the surveying. And so maybe, you know, looking at the data, the multi-beam sonar data, which is uh, a sonar type that creates a 3D representation of the shipwreck, that was done here on the NOAA ship Nancy Foster. And it's a gorgeous view. So what's that like actually seeing that sonar view and now seeing the real thing? Uh, there is no comparison in my mind. Um, it's, it's, it's just so, it's so real. And that's, that's the difference is you can look at, you know, two-way travel time of a sound beam through the ocean, or you can get a camera on it and see what it looks like in real life. Um, but I, I, I know that both things are really important, especially when it comes to, to navigational safety, to know exactly where things are, what they look like, how deep they are. Um, and, and that's a extremely important. And in fact, it's the, it's the very origin. It's the roots of the NOAA Corps and the roots of, of, of our service is, is charting and right. making sure that we do that uh, uh, properly and, and to standard. And, and so it's, it's truly important, but, but I do love seeing these images as well. I, I, it's, it's just great that NOAA, NOAA's overall mission spans all of it and we get to take part as, as operational experts to, to take part in all of it. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, talking about NOAA and it's all its different offices, so, um, Avery, you know, as we're got some fantastic views here on the upper part of the hole, we're seeing the sharks, but it looks like there's also some fish too. Um, what do you think those fish might be? Yeah, so we're seeing the sharks, like you mentioned, so a, a big type of fish. Um, and then we're also seeing a lot of jacks, but they look to me like Almaco jacks with maybe a few amber jacks mixed in. And we're seeing one come across the screen right now. Um, they're silvery, they're very fast swimming. And then off to the upper left of our screen, if you're looking at the quad feed um, on feed two, you'll see in the top two panels some um, very slender bodied fish, and those are barracuda. Um, and then it looks to me like we're also starting to see a big school of fish um, mixing up with the sand tiger sharks that are hovering above the wreck. And we're a little too far out for me to tell exactly what those are, but it is really interesting that we're seeing so much activity above the wreck. Um, and this particular wreck is a really interesting one from an ecological perspective because the wreck structure itself rises about 50 to 60 feet off the seafloor. And so basically what it's doing is creating an underwater skyscraper, if you will. Um, it's creating this vertically extensive habitat um, that can interact with the currents, especially on a day like today, and often creates a buffet where animals are being moved by the currents that um, they're called zooplankton, that some of those bait fish can sit there and snack on if they come towards them. Um, so if later we're able to get a closer look at some of those bait fish and the sand tiger sharks that are um, right above the wreck, we might be able to tell a little bit more about what's going on with that interesting dynamic. Yeah, well, yeah I wanna... but I, I think it goes to show that this area is just so dynamic, ecologically, biologically. We have, as it's already been mentioned today, the warm water associated with the Labrador current, or excuse me, the warm water associated with the Gulf Stream current mixing with the Labrador associated colder water flowing um, southward from the north. And that creates this environment that is ecologically diverse rich um, but I, I think Tane I'm wondering from the archaeological perspective how does that dynamic environment influence the ship structure perhaps the preservation of it or maybe the deterioration over time well that's a good question I do want to maybe point out for the GFOE pilots and our video engineers that we're getting some spectacular shots here um, on sort of the HD cameras where we see the mass of sharks above the wreck and the marine life some beautiful things here uh, if we're able to capture that. I know we've got a strong current here, but I mean, wow, these, uh, some of these views are really special. There's sharks everywhere. Um, yeah, in terms of the current, uh, that's a good question, Avery. We, I'm not exactly sure, but you know, we are really interested in looking at how climate is affecting these shipwrecks, you know, with uh, the warming oceans, um, oxygen levels decreasing, um, you know, pH, acidity, you know, what is happening here? What's happening to the shipwrecks? And that's Part of what we're doing here is that we're visually looking at the wrecks and getting a great snapshot of what they are in place in time right now and really looking at that. So 
that's why working with folks like you are so key to look at the habitat, you know, what's growing here. Are they healthy? Are they not healthy? Do we know if they're healthy? Do we have enough data? What more data do we need? But that's a key part of the story. But I, I will say from my experience looking at Rex that this site gets such a high current that it almost sweeps the hole clean with a lot of things. So we're not seeing, to me, as much growth as we see on maybe more um, shallower sites or ones that are a little more protected. Um, and it can pull off structure and things. You know, we do have a little structural collapse here we're seeing on the cameras where it looks like some deck structure and maybe machinery has sheared off and fallen sort of peeled off there. But a good majority of the wrecks in really good shape. But just visually, Avery, for me, um, I'm not seeing as much growth or concretion on this site as perhaps we see on shallower sites. But that's just uh, my unprofessional observation. Yeah, that's a really interesting observation, and I'm wondering if the ROV pilots might be able to come in. It looks to me like the current is moving along the ship. Um, is that correct? Can you all provide an update on what direction the current is coming from? So I think it would be really interesting to think about that in the context of where some of these sand tiger sharks are. that our, the pilots are doing some, some work right now, but it appears that it's coming right along the shipwreck, just looking at that sediment in the water column. Um, you can sort of see that flying at us in the quad view. It is. We're coming up, we're getting some more spectacular shots for our videographers on the HD cameras here of that sheer like, wall of marine life and, of course, the giant sand tiger sharks, too. And um, Avery, what do you estimate the size of some of these sand tiger sharks? They're pretty big. Gosh, so sand tiger sharks can grow to be about 10 feet long, um, and it's hard for me to estimate how long some of these ones are. Um, one thing that we may be able to do later is the remotely operated vehicle is equipped with lasers, um, and we know the distance between two laser beams, and so by knowing that, we can shine those lasers on the side of an individual sand tiger shark and then be able to um, estimate its length. Um, and so one of the things I do want to point out is that as we get a closer look at some of these sand tiger sharks. I mean, gosh, this is just stunning. Um, but you'll notice that they have spots along their sides, brown spots, and we can use those spots to identify individual sand tiger sharks because the spots almost form a thumbprint, a fingerprint. Um, and so these small fish that we're seeing in here, I did see some vermilion snapper. Um, I'm, I'm having a hard time getting the resolution I need to identify some of the other ones, but it looks like maybe some scad mixed in there. Um, and just uh, this to me is such a quintessential example of how valuable these shipwrecks are as habitat um, after they sink to the seafloor. It's just a, a whole new life for these shipwrecks and it's just so remarkable. Um, and, and Tani, are you, from the archaeological perspective, surprised to see so many sand tiger sharks on this wreck? What do, what do you think of that? Yeah, well, just my experience as a scuba diver, as we've been docu documenting the site over the years, um, we always saw a lot of sharks. But I've, I've seen, personally, from my experience on this, these shipwrecks, more sharks than I've ever seen. Um, and we've only seen a small portion. I, I want to point out, too, what we're seeing here. This is the starboard side of the vessel, um, which is the right-hand side. The bow or the, the, the front of the vessel would be along the hull in front of us, and we're gliding back towards the stern at the end of the vessel, and we're getting a good view now of the propeller, and the rudder is going to make an appearance here too. But, um, yeah, I think it's phenomenal, and we uh, it always makes it a little exciting when you're dropping down and you're documenting and you're surrounded by these beautiful uh, sand tiger sharks, and we always... Uh, you know, move forward with caution and with respect, but uh, I've never had a, uh, an interaction that caused me concern with them, but we always do keep a wary eye, but they are very special when you dive with them. And, um, you know, Dale, if you, with your experiences diving, have you seen anything like this before? I have not, um, and it, it really is just is spectacular. And, and you may have heard when we were asking uh, the GFOE pilots before, there's a, the low discussion that's happening in the background, and that's the ROV and the bridge having a really close discussion about exactly where to move. And, and these moves are so delicate, and I, I, I really mean meters at a time, about five meters, ten meters at a time. Um, you have to be very cautious, especially in currents that 
that we're seeing right now. So um, it takes really intense, col intense collaboration um, between the ROV pilots and the bridge to move at specific directions at specific differences. Um, and they were in the midst of one of those moves before, which is what the, some of the conversation you were hearing in the background. Yeah, and absolutely. And you know, when that happens, uh, as scientists, we get out of the way and let them do their work because, uh, you know, uh, it, that's the most important thing is the safety of equipment and personnel. So, um, so we let them <laughs> have their space. But again, we're getting just some spectacular views here uh, with the HD cameras, and it's just just magnificent. And sand tiger shark coming into view. And I should point out that we're also having an interaction today with the North Carolina Aquarium on Roanoke Island at 11.30. Uh, at 11 a.m., we're going to be joined by Carol Price, um, who's um, working with the aquarium system in North Carolina. And we're very excited. You know, if we're excited here on the ship, I can't wait to share that with the audience at the aquarium because we are seeing some spectacular views here on the seafloor, 260 feet on the tanker E.M. Clark off North Carolina. That's really great. Well, I really appreciate you having me today. Um, speaking of operations and duty, the bridge calls. Um, so this is awesome. Keep up the great work, and I hope to get a few more dives in before this expedition is over. Yeah. Well, thank you, uh, Dale. Uh, Lieutenant Gump, with NOAA Corps, on the NOAA ship, Nancy Foster. You're the ops officer, so that means you're pretty in the, th in the thick of everything. Um, but we truly appreciate you and the ship and your expertise and professionalism that made this, ship this uh, project possible. Well, NOAA ship, Nancy Foster, or the rest of the ships in our fleet will be welcome. We'll welcome you back at any time. Thanks again. Oh, thank you. You know, uh, Chris uh, Southerly, as we're looking at these sites here, um, and we're looking at, I mean, just these, these magical views, how does this shipwreck maybe compare to some of the other shipwrecks you've worked on in North Carolina? Because, you know, you work all over the state, near shore, you know, the, the river systems, some things offshore. What, what does this shipwreck mean to you and what we're, what we're seeing live here today and sharing with the world? Well, one of the the first things that, that strikes me is just the absolute amazing visibility that we're getting here. Uh, it's not something that we typically typically see closer in to shore where we do the, the off the state archaeology and the underwater archaeology branch of it do the majority of our work. Uh, so our, our oversight and jurisdiction extends three nautical miles out into the ocean. So we get a lot greener water, a lot more turbid water. Uh, we still have the currents and the surge to deal with. Uh, but the, the one of the things here is just the preservation is so very good out here compared to some of the wrecks that are closer in to shore. The shallower depths let the, the conditions be a, a lot more dynamic. Uh, the currents, the wave action, uh, as well as the temperature change. Uh, you know, Avery mentioned we had the, the Gulf Stream coming up from the south and the Labrador Current from the north, and it mixes off of Cape Hatteras here. So there is some some seasonal variation in temperatures, but uh, not not as rapid as you would see. So the the change of environment, uh, the dynamic nature, really affects the preservation of the the shipwrecks, uh, and and also lends to scattering of, the, of what left of them breaking the town. So a lot of the, the Civil War period blockade runners that are around in the, the Cape Fear region, uh, the southernmost Cape in North Carolina, uh, have, have been pretty well degraded and, and broken apart in some cases or periodically scoured out and exposed or silted in and sand coming in and covering them. So it's... Um, you know, just being able to, to see uh, what's out here and so much of it being intact is, is just really, it's impressive. And the, the diversity of marine life out here as well, uh, it's just a, amazing to see. Yeah, yeah, it absolutely is. You know, talking about marine life, um, Avery, I believe we have another NOAA expert that has joined us on the line. We do. We have a, an ecologist, um, Paula Whitfield, who we're very thankful is able to join us this morning. And Paula has led assessments of the fish communities on shipwrecks and rocky reefs off of North Carolina for multiple decades. Um, and we're just so fortunate to have her and her expertise on the line today. 
So, Paula, we're starting to see some um, grouper, and I think I may have seen some snapper mixed in there, and I'm hoping you can share a little bit about those types of fish with us, maybe get some IDs if you're able to. Um, what do you think? Um, yeah, I could I could do that, except that I missed them. So, <laughs> they're probably, no my guess is, yeah, my, my guess is probably scamp, because we've seen a lot of scamp, and then red snapper from yesterday, but... I, I just, I can't stay away from you guys because I, I checked the email this morning and Avery's like, we're diving the Clark again. So, um, so anyway, I just, I just wanted to, to, to mention that I agree on one of the things about the Clark is that it's, it's unusual in the fact that it is probably North Carolina's diving at finest, you know, because you're talking about this intact shipwreck that rises so high off the bottom and then, also, where it's situated in the Gulf Stream, because what we found out with a lot of the research that we did off North Carolina is that you know, the, the presence of the Gulf Stream keeps those winter bottom water temperatures at a, at a nice level for a lot of tropical species. So people that are familiar with driving in Florida or the Caribbean can come up here and be like, wow, these are the same species. And the reason is because the temperature really doesn't get below, you know, 60 degrees at these offshore sites and this is definitely one of the sites that we know that the is a very tropical one in part because the lionfish survive here because they're definitely you know a tropical species so when you see them surviving then you know that it's not getting that cold there but um back to your original question i just want to say that uh, i still haven't seen um, a group or a snapper yet, but when you when you guys were on the top of the wreck, like that was where the action was with the sand tigers and the tom tapes and the other schooling fishes, and um, and I agree that this wreck I've never seen this many sand tigers on it, and if there was always sand tigers on it, like maybe two or three or whatever that you see in 30 minutes, but not these bigger schools. There was only one other wreck that would attract this level of sand tigers, and I think Carol Price will be talking about this, but it, I guess it was formerly known as the Papoose. It's in about 120 feet of water off Cape mm. Lookout, and that wreck, which is upside down, also has a pretty large superstructure on it, and that wreck is known for um, having attracting sometimes hundreds of lionfish, which I've seen, um, just massive schools sometimes. With that, I will stop. No, absolutely. I'm going to point out the um, you'll see what looks like a box that's been pushed out and an arm in front of the ROV with some domes on it, some clear domes. That's actually a Boxfish 360 camera. And what it's doing is shooting video footage in a, sort of a 360 uh, environment with three different lenses. So what that'll do afterwards is allow us to piece that together and edit it and create sort of this virtual reality experience where you could view it on your computer uh, using a mouse to move around the screen, or no. you could put on a pair of virtual reality goggles, and you'll be in that physical space surrounded by the fish, and there's a microphone in there. So we're really excited to see what this footage looks like afterwards, and it'll be on our website at monitor.noaa.gov, and, and we'll share it with the world for free. So we're very excited by that, because um, we're getting some spectacular interactions with uh, the wreck, the marine life, and the sand tigers literally coming up and bumping that camera so um great stuff here and it's 11 o'clock so i should say uh who we are so we are part of the valor in the atlantic telepresence project this is a cooperative agreement between noaa's office of national marine sanctuaries and the global foundation for ocean exploration uh, the office of national marine sanctuaries uh, manages uh, 15 uh, uh, marine monuments and sanctuaries around the world and we can think of them as the nation's underwater national parks, uh, protecting our, our ocean treasures and wonders. You know, just like we're seeing today on the screen with the sand tiger shark swimming with us. I mean, it is fantastic on the quad screen. And I should mention that, so I talked about the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration, GFOE, and they, they're the ones providing this ROV technology, the camera systems, they build them, they design them, their pilots are here using their expertise to move around this very complex, dynamic underwater environment they also built the satellite capability. So we have their engineers here that are flipping switches, changing cameras, and beaming this to you live via satellite to your homes and offices around the world. 
So it's an incredible partnership. Um, there are experts online, uh, include myself. I'm Tony Casserly with Mo the Monitor National Marine Sanctuary. I'm a historian and an archaeologist. We have got Chris Settley here, underwater archaeologist with North Carolina's Office of State Archaeology. We also have from NOAA the National Center for Coastal Ocean Science, uh, Dr. Avery Paxton and Paula Whitfield, they're ecologists. And I believe we also should have uh, Carol Price on the line too. She's an ecologist. Carol, are you with us? And may maybe not quite yet, but Carol's going to be helping to lead an interaction we're having with the North Carolina Aquarium at Roanoke Island with an audience there, which we're very excited by. Um, but yeah, just spectacular. And on the view screen here, you know, we're seeing some of that machinery that sort of sloughed off the deck and fallen here. And uh, Chris, what do you think some of the things we're seeing here? I guess it looks like, I'm, I'm just saying, these are some amazing views of the some of the deck machinery that we're seeing here. Um, probably it looks like we're looking maybe at, at some type of uh, windless system uh, that may have been mounted on the deck here at, at, at some point. It's, it's kind of hard to tell. I'm, I'm trying to you know, turn my head upside down to, to see it right side up and, and get a perspective of it. But the uh, Yeah, it does look like maybe something, that, a windlass that would sort of uh, move, be line handling. Mm -hmm. using, instead of your hands, it'd be mechanical to help move uh, you know equipment, move things with booms, anything with cables. I say, so, yeah, because this was a, quite a substantial ship, almost 500 feet long and almost 70 foot of beam so there's a you know capable of carrying large cargo and, and heavy cargo that certainly could not have been done manually um, and you know what what a lot of folks don't realize is is these ships even up until this time period still had masts large masts that that stood up and the 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 arms and the yards off of those you know would be hooked up with with pulleys and block and tackle to to be able to you know, load and unload and shift things around on on deck. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, we on our website at monitor.noaa.gov, we have a shipwreck page. One of them dedicated to this World War II tanker, the E. M. Clark. Um, so you can see historic pictures of the vessel there. But you know, we also have that modern multi-beam sonar image of it, and you can actually see the mass laying uh, very faintly in the sand. So really, this ship was hit by two torpedoes, went down very quickly and laid on its side and everything just sort of gently fell to the sand and that's exactly what we're seeing here is that some of that structure and more sort of you know small rooms and the mechanical structure on the deck has just sort of sloughed off and literally just peeled off and is laying right where they would have been uh, position wise on the ship they just happen to be on the seafloor right now mm -hmm. so it's it's really magnificent um this is great yeah some of what we're seeing here is is probably some of the uh, the deck structure of those uh, the the lighter weight bulkheads that would have been up there as well, because if you you know you look at the historic images as you mentioned, the you see you know cab cabin structure and, and ship structure ab above the deck where the the crew and the the bridge would have been basically. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it is. It is magnificent. And um, you know, Avery, you know, we've been talking about the sand tiger sharks, and I know there's. A program you've been uh, associated with that sort of tracks sand tiger sharks by looking at sort of the size of them. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So the North Carolina Aquarium runs a program called Spot a Shark USA, and it's a really fantastic program where they're able to use the spot patterns along the sides of individual sand tiger sharks to identify those sharks. Um, and so one of the things they're able to do with that is they're able to, it's kind of like mapping a constellation in the sky. So you can imagine each spot, like a star, and you can take that map of the spots or the stars on the sides of the shark um, to identify the individual. And so what the aquariums are able to do with this program is they're able to take images from videos like those we're gathering today and if we're able to get those side views of the shark, those are very valuable. They can put them into their system, identify the shark, and then with successive images, um, identify that shark over time. And so using photos submitted to that program, for example, um, we've been able to understand that some of these sharks are going back to the same shipwrecks or nearby shipwrecks over time. 
which is another piece of evidence that these shipwrecks are important habitats for sand tiger sharks. Um, and I'm wondering, is Dr. Carol Price perhaps on the line now? I am. Good morning, Avery. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, ship crew. Thanks for having me today. Good morning. Good morning. Good, Good morning. morning, Carol. So Dr. Carol Price is the Conservation Research Coordinator for the North Carolina Aquarium System. Um, and Carol is one of the folks who runs the Sand Tiger Shark Identification Program that we were talking about earlier. Um, and Carol, can you add a few words about that? And then it, it seems like we're going to be starting, hopefully, the interaction with the North Carolina Aquarium visitors soon, correct? Yeah, uh, I think we're going to um, have guests in the theater at the Roanoke Island Aquarium starting at about 11.30 they come in and then, you know, takes them a minute to get situated and um, so we'll be fielding questions um, from that audience through me to um, the ship and you guys to get answers um, in pretty much real time. So um, this was a great treat to wake up on a Saturday morning and come in and see a screen full of sand tiger sharks at the, the E.M. Clark this morning. Um, so I, I had a quick look through my previous records, and um, since Spotted Shark started, we've only gotten about nine records from this wreck of sand tiger shark images that we were able to use in Spotted Shark, which you were talking about just a minute ago. And so, I mean, I can see that many sharks already in the in the feed right now, just in that one little view there. So um, once we get this data, like you mentioned, we can pull still images out from the video feed here and we will easily double, if not triple, our numbers um, from this wreck, just from the data that we're getting today. So that's really exciting. <laughs> oh, that's great. And, and Carol, this is uh, the ship, and um, I'm here with uh, Chris Headley, and I'm Tony Casterly, and we're slowly moving the ROV and working with the ship to maybe get a little closer view of those sharks that are on top of the hole. So we're just kind of positioning ourselves, uh -huh. but earlier in the broadcast, we moved up to the top of the hole, the hole and there was a, a fleet of, I'm not sure what you call it, like a mega school of sand tiger sharks. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to get some good data for you today. Well, thanks. That's really exciting. Um, I, I just gave a talk last night here at a local um, fundraiser for our shark research at the aquariums. And um, some of the data I showed um, actually involved a project that a student of mine did that was looking at how, how the sharks orient themselves around the shipwreck. And um, and so what we found is that most of them are either, you know, pretty tightly associated with the wreck um, or maybe out, but often over the sand, just out from the wreck. Um, but here it seems like what we're seeing today, if I'm seeing this right, is also seeing a lot of sharks just hovering right above the wreck. So that's also really interesting um, data that really we have to have video data to be able to see those kinds of behaviors. Um, we can't always get that from still photos. So great stuff. Good, good. Yeah, we, we were just commenting on that earlier. The we we're seeing some of those sharks that are swimming uh, above the hull, you know, swimming in the water column, and then these guys that are a little bit lower and hugging the sand. So it's interesting. They're they're at two different heights. Yeah. So my student actually collected data on that from some other videos, not at the EM Clark, but at, at other shipwrecks um, close to close to the EM Clark, also there off of Hatteras. And so she and I are still working on putting that data together in terms of trying to define what I call sort of, you know, the shark cloud. What is the shape of the cloud of sharks around the shipwreck? And by that, I mean, are they big, poofy clouds of sharks, um, you know, where they're really spread out and far apart from each other and maybe far apart from the rest? Are they like super tight and clustered um, close to each other and close to the wreck. And, um, you know, what is their height in the water column? Um, those are things, you know, that are interesting to me. Um, I think it's really, um, you know, helpful to understand, you know, the, the value of these shipwrecks as they've gone from being in service for humans for, you know, many, many years and now providing just a whole other kind of service to the biological communities out there in the ocean. And that's a beautiful way to put it, Carol. And I, I want to point people's attention to the feed too, if you're looking at that, that we've got some great views with our HD camera where you can see the shark swimming on the seafloor, but also up in the water column on top of the hole. So just some beautiful shots. And, and, and Carol, really, that's uh, for, for me, that's the crux of the whole project where we're looking at these sites 
historically and ecologically, you know, again, how these weapons or transports of war are now oasis of life. And that's the key messaging here. And uh, it couldn't be more apparent from what we're seeing here on the, the live feeds we're sharing with people around the world. You see, and actually speaking of those live feeds, if you are watching uh, the live feeds, there is a chat box uh, attached to the side of uh, feed one that if, if you at home are watching, you can type questions in and it will pop up and, and we'll have one of our appropriate uh, researchers uh, address that question for you as they come in. I want to remind people we are um, part of the Valor in the Atlantic Telepresence Project. We are off the coast of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. We are on the World War II tanker E.M. Clark, and we're 260 feet on the seafloor, bringing this spectacular views to you live now. And I believe there's only maybe even a sixth, uh, perhaps eight second lag from what we're seeing live here on the seafloor to what you're seeing at home. So just incredible technology uh, made possible by the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration. Um, it's just, just incredible. So Chris and Avery, uh, this is Carol again, just with a quick question. Um, I know y'all have been on for a while this morning. What kind of fish have you guys been seeing? So, so far this morning, we have been seeing a lot of sand tiger sharks. We've also seen almaco jacks, likely amber jacks. We've seen some grouper, um, some spots and hogfish, some vermilion snapper, and other bait fish that we haven't been able to get a good identification on yet. And we've also seen several lionfish that are resting um, sort of beneath the wreck structure and then in a few circumstances we're inside of the stern portion of the ship um, and so pretty strong currents today and so sounds like the ROV team is um, really having to navigate very carefully today and coordinate very highly with the NOAA ship Nancy Foster. So I'm wondering if from the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration side somebody might be able to comment a little bit um, on what's going on behind the scenes, um, how navigation might be tricky today with the added current. I can see uh, Avery right now the, uh, the navigator and the pilots are working to uh, change the ship position a little bit because as, as you said the, the current's running pretty strong today. Um, but uh, in, until they're freed up, and it's like I can kind of a, the it's it's kind of an amazing view here to to be sitting in the control room. The we have the the primary pilot who's flying uh, the ROV Yogi on the bottom that is free swimming. It is uh, tethered. If you're looking at feed two in the lower right, you can see the uh, the tether. That's the kind of the rear view camera on Yogi, the one that's in the, the black and white. Uh, that's a 100 foot long tether that goes from, from Yogi and strings back to the other ROV. ROV. Uh, the, our second pilot, our co-pilot, is uh, controlling uh, the ROV Guru, which is uh, a camera, camera sled, uh, as well as a lighting sled that is hanging directly from the, the a frame on the back of the boat hanging down in the water column and the uh, then to, to his right is the, the navigator who is keeping an overall situational awareness looking at the, the ROVs monitoring on, on all the cameras uh, we have the uh, the high pack uh, multi-beam survey map uh, up on one of the screens uh, with the positioning of the ship over top of it uh, and the position of both of the uh, the ROVs and uh, then the uh, you know they coordinate via radio as as we were talking with uh, Lieutenant Dale Gump earlier this morning the dynamic positioning on the the ship itself 
in in combination, and it's it's a it's a very careful and, and delicate dance with uh, the currents running on the surface, the currents running on the bottom, which are somewhat different, um, to to make sure everything is positioned uh, just right for the the safe operations here. And so, Chris, as you were talking, I've been seeing some lionfish um, that are pretty easy to identify in some of the feeds that we're looking at, mm -hmm. and they just seem to have gone out of the view of the main feed on feed one. Um, but one of the ecologists on the line, Paula Whitfield from NOAA National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science, has studied lionfish on shipwrecks like this. Um, for multiple years. And Paula, I'm wondering if you can weigh in with some observations about what we're seeing today and how that might fit into the uh, bigger picture of the lionfish invasion. Um, sure. Uh, lionfish actually first showed up in North Carolina on one of the wrecks that's in about 140 feet of water in 2000. So since that time, um, lionfish really have, in basically their populations have increased from that time period and so what we're seeing now is is the is the um, density of lionfish after what 20 years 22 years that they've um since they've been in the atlantic and so and then so last week though we saw a lot more lionfish like earlier in the week but but here you could see them like hanging out in the sand like right next to the superstructure or the, the wreck structure and and to me like, I love this shot when you're on the sand because, you know, being at the top of the wreck is great, but there's something about the, what you can see and how, and I being the fish when you're near that sand interface that, that I think is also um, just, it's a, it's a great habitat, that edge habitat there in this video that you see here. And that's a really great point, Paula, from the ecological perspective. One of the things that can be very um, helpful, for example, is having a habitat that is bigger or taller or has more edge spaces. Um, sometimes uh, we often see higher numbers and um, a greater variety of fish on habitats that are more complex. And what we're looking at here is a great example of that. We're seeing all sorts of nooks and crannies in the wreck structure. Um, and as a result, we're seeing that this wreck is really alive with marine life. Um, and so, Carol, I'm wondering if, from your perspective, um, I'm just curious if you've thought any more about the behavior of the sharks that we're seeing. Um, it seemed to me that earlier when we had a glimpse at some of those sharks that were pretty much hovering above the wreck that they may have been doing that so that they were oriented facing the current as it moved towards them. Does that mesh with some of your prior observations? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, it costs energy to swim. So, you know, you want to make sure that if you are, you know, trying to stay around a specific structure, um, you know, to be um, in your social network. Um, that you want to save as much energy as you can and making sure that you are um, lining yourself up to be, you know, hydrodynamic, um, uh, that's a lot of sense. But at the same time, we also see sharks swimming all different directions, right? So we see some that line themselves up with the current and then we'll kind of hover. It looks like they're hovering, but really they're, you know, moving just enough to stay um, neutral with the current. Um, but then we see other sharks sort of swimming all around you know, in, in all different directions. So, you know, lots to learn um, for sure still out there. I wanted to say give a quick hello to Paula. I haven't um, seen Paula in a long time, but it's really good to hear her voice on the line today. Uh, and, uh, yeah. and, and one of the things about these sharks, too, is sometimes they hover, they sit on the bottom and don't appear to move at all. And, that's really different from other sharks, more pelagic sharks or sharks like reef sharks that are sort of perpetually in motion. So um, really interesting just to see this diversity of behaviors today. And Carol, one of the sharks that we were just looking at maybe five seconds ago had some white markings along its side that looks kind of like ours. Can you talk a little bit about what those might be from? 
Yeah, I, I did see that uh, specific shark, but um, that's a really good point, Avery, because right now it is probably close to mating season for this species, and we know that um, sand tiger sharks are mating off of North Carolina, and you get these very, on, on female sharks, these very distinct um, scar scrape wound patterns around their pectoral fins, which is that front set of fins sort of on you know, the, the bottom of their body, right behind their gills. Um, and that is, those are scars that are, you know, come or um, bring during mating. Uh, so that can be really distinctive to let us know that we're looking at females, we're looking at females that are reproductive, um, and so forth. But I also have sharks, you know, I have over 2,000 sharks in the Spotted Shark database now, and we have a lot of sharks with a lot of scrapes and scars and wounds on them and all over their bodies, all different kinds of times of year. And so that's a whole other sort of side um, avenue of research that I'm really interested in looking at wounding in sharks and possibly even healing patterns and things like that. That's really interesting, Carol. Thank you for sharing that. So along um, that same line of thinking, you mentioned that now is likely the mating season for sand tiger sharks. And so far today, I've seen um, some male sharks and a few female sharks. Have you been able to get better um, the sex identification on the sharks that we've been seeing today? Are you seeing about 50% female, 50% male? Um, too early to tell. Yeah, so I've only been watching for about 10 or 15 minutes. And um, so, um, you know, I, like you, I'm sort of seeing a mix, but um, I haven't really gotten a good handle yet on, on what that ratio is. We do know that in some locations and at some times we see – like you said, about a 50-50 mix, while at other locations and other times, we see much more um, that there are aggregations of sharks that tend to be heavily dominated by one sex or the other, um, sometimes even just only females or only males. Um, but we're still really gathering information about that to try to figure out how male and female sharks behave differently um, throughout the year as they're migrating, during the reproductive season. And then, you know, one of the times when we see a lot of females together is when they are pregnant and overwintering here in North Carolina. And then we see large aggregations of very round sharks. We can't prove that they're pregnant, of course, um, but they do start to change shape and become very round. Um, so they appear at least um, to be pregnant. So we do know that the sex ratio changes over time and possibly for different reasons. Wow, that's so fascinating. And it's just another um, part of why the footage we've been able to gather today and we'll keep gathering this afternoon is so valuable um, for both archaeologists as well as ecologists and biologists. And, Tane, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about um, what the ROVs and the ship might be doing right now. It looks like you've lost the view of the wreck, and I'm wondering if we're repositioning for a different angle and thinking the viewers might also be curious. Yeah, absolutely. So we have just retracted the Boxfish 360 video camera, which was that sort of that boxy uh, black box with all the domes on it that was on a swing arm. That's now come back. Uh, we brought it in to do uh, some more sort of detailed survey with the ROV's main cameras. And we've pulled off a little bit to, to make another run at the shipwreck site so we can get, sort of get a better angle on it uh, to maybe see just a bit more of the wreck. So we're just sort of in the water column. We've backed up, and now we're going to make another run back at the ship again. And uh, I should also ask, too, we, we're going to have uh, Joe Schwartzer on with us from the North Carolina Maritime Museum System. And, Joe, are you with us today? I am here, John. And I mean, I say the visibility is striking. <laughs> well, good. Well, sir, we're very, uh, very happy to have you with us. And we've been talking about World War II and the Battle of the Atlantic. And now you're planning to open a uh, Battle of the Atlantic exhibit at the graveyard at the Atlantic Museum in Hatteras, North Carolina. Is that correct? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? That will be. That will be. That's right. That will be later in June, and it should be. It could should be quite striking. We're, we've been working on this for some time. We've got some remarkable artifacts, and uh, it's a great story. And uh, people need to realize that 
um, uh, that the war came very, very close to North Carolina uh, in 1941 when, uh, uh, when uh, in 42 when uh, declared war against Germany, uh, Dunas immediately sent 14 U-boats to the coast of the, of the United States, east coast of the United States, and they proceeded to sink over 90 vessels. Um, they were extremely effective, and E.M. Clark is one of them. In fact, E.M. Clark is one of, of, of uh, five vessels that sunk uh, within a two-day spread which is uh, phenomenal. And, uh, yeah, no, exactly, exactly, Joe. And, you know, putting a spotlight on this history is so important because a lot of the population in the United States doesn't realize how close the, the enemy came to our shores with these U-boats. I mean, in your estimate, how close did they come? Uh, close enough, to, close enough to, to surface at night and see freighters back with by uh, the lights on the outer banks and to hear music being played from 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 radios or uh, uh it was it was really remarkable it's why they, it's why they called it the the, 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 the turkey shoot um, they could really pick and choose their targets yeah absolutely and, and you know they use that to devastating effect uh, especially in 1942 you know, and, and uh, maybe that should be a lesson today. So imagine if that same type of activity with uh, an enemy of ours, the United States, was was doing these activities right offshore here. I mean, it was it was terrifying, not just for, of course, the, 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 the men aboard these merchant ships, uh, men and women, but, you know, the population on the shore, too. This definitely had effect on them. Absolutely. And, um, and uh, the... Um uh, I remember when we were doing our, our first video about the museum, Great Army Atlantic, and we went to interview some people that had actually lived here, and they said, oh, well, no, we can't have that. And we said, well, why not? And they said, well, Naval Intelligence told us we weren't to discuss it. Now, this is like 50, 60 years after the event, and they they still wouldn't talk about it. And we, when we did finally get to talk about it, it was pretty phenomenal. They described being asleep in their rooms, and all of a sudden the rooms would light up and the house would shake, and they'd run to the window and there'd be a tank or a flame on the horizon. And uh, uh, so they would, and school kids walked over, walked to school, stepping over debris on the beach, uh, and the wrecks and also occasional bodies. So it was, it, was, it was pretty dramatic. Yeah, that's incredible. And again, if you think about it, if that happened to you today, if you either lived on the Outer Banks of North Carolina, or if you're visiting having a lovely time with your family, you're having a good night's sleep, and then, boom, sky lights up, and then the next morning, yes. you know, perhaps you're seeing exactly. that the, the remnants of war on the beaches. I mean, it's terrifying. It, it, really, it really was, and they were, uh, they were understandably suspicious changes because of the, of the circumstances, and it was a war zone. It really and truly was, and... Um, uh, and, and we came very close, and this is the other thing people don't realize, because of the success of the U-boats, we came very close to losing that war. Uh, uh, it, 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 the, 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 the loss of shipping and materials, vital materials to Great Britain was, was crucial. I mean, just stunning. And if we hadn't stopped it when we had, uh, it might have been had a very different outcome. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you for that, Joe. And for the folks listening at home, that was a great overview of um, some of the effects of war from World War II, the Battle of the Atlantic that reached our shores here, all up and down the eastern seaboard, and of course the Gulf of Mexico, um, that World War II Battle of the Atlantic when the German U-boats were coming across the Atlantic and attacking our, attacking our merchant vessels. So we are at 1130, and we are about to have an interaction with the North Carolina Aquarium at Roanoke Island, and we're very proud to have them with us, as well as Joe Schwarzer from North Carolina's Maritime Museum System. He's the director and also um, affiliated with the Graveyard of the Atlantic Museum. Uh, I should remind folks, we are at the World War II tanker, the E.M. Clark. We are 260 feet on the seafloor, and we're off Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. You're joining us live as part of the Valor in the Atlantic Telepresence Project. It's a cooperative project with NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries and the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration. And now GFOE, as they're known, is, is making this possible. They built these ROVs, they designed them, they're piloting them right now, and they created the satellite capability to bring these scenes, these live scenes to you from the seafloor to you at home around the world. You know, so we're enabling this real-time exploration, and we could be more excited 
Um, I'm Tane Casserly. I'm a maritime archaeologist and historian with NOAA's Monitor National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, we protect the uh, iconic ironclad Monitor. Uh, we also have Chris Southerly with us with North Carolina's Office of State Archaeology. He's also an underwater archaeologist. And on the line we have uh, from NOAA's National Center for Coastal Ocean Science, we have Avery Paxton and Paula Whitfield. We're also very lucky to have um, with us from the North Carolina Aquarium System, uh, Dr. Carol Price. And Carol, hello, and thank you so much for joining us and, uh, you know, helping the interaction with the aquarium. We, we couldn't be happier to have you with us. Good morning, Tane. It's so great to be here. Thanks so much to, to NOAA for um, getting this mission underway and to the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration for making this available to the public. Um, you know, it's uh, it's hard to get out to these locations, um, especially water that's this deep. You have to be a really um, highly skilled and trained diver to be able to go see these locations. And so for us, um, you know, at the aquariums, we are all about protecting, conserving our natural um, aquatic resources and bringing them to public so that they can see, you know, what's out there under the water. Um, that you can't see just standing on the beach. And so this is just really a spectacular opportunity to bring the ocean um, to our guests today. Um, my understanding is they are getting into the theater right now. Um, they'll be, you know, having a seat and sort of getting checked in, and um, they'll get a little introduction from my colleague, Paul Maisy, um, at the aquarium there to let them know sort of what's going on. And... Um, Hey, the sand tiger sharks came out today, so that's really great. Um, I wanted to mention there's a, a question in the chat from one of the viewers um, asking if sand tiger sharks are native to the area. And um, while well, our folks in the theater are getting settled, I thought I'd maybe um, address that question. And the theater is yes, sand tiger sharks are native to North Carolina. They are can be found all along our uh, the Atlantic coast. Um, historically, they were found in the Gulf of Mexico, although that population is, um, if, if it's there, it's not very large. Um, and it's found really all over the world in many, many, many different places where it is a critically endangered species in many of the places where it lives. Um, here in the um, Atlantic, the Northwest Atlantic, we uh, we have sand tiger sharks. Their populations have declined by maybe 75 or even possibly 80 percent in a few decades. And so um, these populations that we have off North Carolina are really, really important for this species to make sure that we have a place where they can reproduce, where they can um, have their pups. Um, and where they can migrate through and, you know, do the things that sharks are supposed to do to make sure that this population and this species persists into the future so that many people can come and see them. Um, and I'll just know, Paul, if you have any questions from the guests today, go ahead and send them to me and I'll relay them um, out over the feed. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. And while we meet Carol, this is Avery Paxton, an ecologist with NOAA's National Center of Coastal Ocean Science. One of the things that I wanted to add in is that um, while the sand tigers are certainly use these shipwrecks as key habitats, one of the interesting um, results of them using these wrecks is that when sand tigers are present, we also see a higher variety of other species on the shipwrecks. So this goes to show that uh, these ecosystems, to be healthy, they often require all of the links in the food web, from the small bait fish all the way up to the large predators. And so having sand tiger sharks here is a really, really good sign. You know, if I could um, direct people's attention to feed two, if you're watching that, we've got some spectacular images as we're coming up with many, many sand tiger sharks. We're looking at the stern of the tanker EM Clark, and that's the end of the vessel. You can see on the right-hand side a structure that looks flat, kind of leaning down. That's actually the rudder, which steered the vessel. And in front of that, looking forward on the right-hand side, you're going to see a very large three-bladed propeller. And for a sense of scale, each one of those propeller blades is six feet long. So it's absolutely enormous, um, but just, just beautiful. And this, this type of uh, stern or the end of the vessel is called a fantail because it's sort of just think of it like your hands fanning. Or, 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 or a fan that you would use to, to cool yourself. 
that sort of spread design um, is very elegant and uh, it's just a beautiful architectural structure here too. Um, so, you know, we look at these sites archaeologically, historically, but they're incredibly important ecologically as habitat. And that's why we're so proud and pleased to be partnering with uh, North Carolina um, uh, Aquarium System, you know, Roanoke Island, and of course our, our renowned ecologists we have on the line too, helping to tell the story. And, and Carol, do you have any, any questions for us? Any thoughts maybe from the aquarium? Uh, not yet. They're doing a, a, a moment of silence, so everybody can just kind of take a minute to, you know, kind of get a, a view of what's going on and sort of maybe formulate some thoughts and questions and perspectives. Um, and so I anticipate maybe we'll have some questions coming in um, shortly. We, you know, we typically get a mix of questions. Some people are really interested in the, the sharks and the other fish community, but some of our guests are really um, fascinated with the technology that's being used, that ROV technology. Then, and then, of course, we have other people who come and are really interested in the history of this site and, you know, what is the re relevance to United States history of, of this shipwreck. So um, we've talked a lot about, I feel like we've talked a lot in the last few minutes about the history, but could we maybe get a quick rundown on the technology that we are using today and the challenges, especially today in this uh, bottom current? Yeah, I can speak a little bit to that about that. Um, you know, of course, the real experts here would be the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration. We're just doing a bit of a personnel switch here. But the, uh, yeah, it's it's incredible that, you know, it's almost bringing this sort of technology you would see to explore Mars or features in outer space. You know, we're literally using that same type of technology here to explore the seafloor, which, again, is a very challenging environment. And just, you know, they GFOE builds these ROVs, they design them, they pilot them, they know the system intimately. And they're, they're making this all possible. We could bring the science to it, but they're the ones who are pro providing this live interaction on the seafloor via satellite. And they had to bring everything to the ship. They had to build it out. You know, this stuff, this all this equipment isn't on this vessel. So they had to truck it here, load it out, connect everything, and everything has been working flawlessly. So it couldn't be more incredible to work with these very, very experienced folks here. And um, I, I should remind folks, when you're in the aquarium in Roanoke Island, it's really, it's about a six second lag between what we're seeing here live on the seafloor to what you're seeing there in the aquarium. So that's incredible. And that's the same around the world. And uh, there's really no one else that could provide this level of te uh, technological capability. So it's incredible, Carol. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, Avery was asking me just a few minutes ago about, you know, if we're seeing male sharks or female sharks. And, um, you know, I'm kind of seeing both, and just so, um, because we have such great images of sand tiger sharks up right now, especially on feed one, you know, the way you can tell males and females apart is um, on the low, on the bottom part of the shark, kind of towards the back, the males have external reproductive organs called claspers, um, and those are absent in the females, and so if you see... Um, large appendages um, sort of on the bottom side of a shark, um, that's a pretty good sign that that is a male shark. Um, those uh, are often not visible until they are adults. So sometimes in very small sharks, juvenile sharks, um, it's very difficult to tell males and females um, apart until those claspers have uh, completely developed. So we're seeing a lot of adult male sharks right now swimming by so that's uh that's kind of interesting to see that and carol one of the things we've seen sharks doing i'm watching one do it on feed one right now is it looks like they're almost rolling in the sand um, can you share with us what that behavior might be uh, i have no idea that's the first time i've ever seen that and i only just caught a glimpse of it out of the corner of my eye but um you know, that's a, that's really interesting. I haven't seen that before. We do know that sharks do have external parasites on them. So that can be external parasitic copepods, which are like little insects that, uh, they're not insects, but they're kind of, kind of like that and they will attach to sharks. Um, they also have, uh, fish, remoras or shark suckers, as some people call them, um, that attach to them. And so, you know, we don't really know. Um, maybe, uh, that behavior is associated with, um, you know, maybe trying to remove some small copepods or maybe just because it feels nice to kind of scratch your, scratch
got your rib cage there um, in the sand a bit. Um, we'll have to um, study that a little bit more. <laughs> That's a great question, though. What do yeah. you think? So my first reaction was that it was probably to remove some um, organism from it. Um, we see that behavior sometimes in amberjacks and other jack species where they'll almost, it looks like they're dive bombing the sand and they're kind of roll over onto their side, rub along the sand and then continue on their journey. Um, but I, I don't think it's well studied. I, I could be wrong though. So I, I didn't know either. I haven't seen sharks do that. That's maybe the fifth time I've seen one do it today. Um, so it will be really interesting to go back and review that footage. Yeah, hey, Avery, this is this is Paula Whitfield from NCAR. Yes. Um, I just want to say that like, I'm really glad you brought that up because um, I've been seeing that too um, today. And, and it's really not that uncommon to see, see them do it. So I've, done, I've seen them do it in the, in the past. But more often, like you said, it happens with the um, the amber jack or the alamoco jack. That they will also do that same behavior. So I think you guys are pretty right on what it, what it probably is, though. It's like the parasite that just feel good. <laughs> okay, excellent. So all three of us have the same hypothesis. So it sounds like we're we'll be on the right track. Um, so it looks like Carol, that there's about 50 people in North Carolina Aquarium Roanoke Island facility there who are tuning in. Um, have any questions come in yet from that group? Yes, we have a whole list of questions. So um, we have questions along the lines of why is the ROV moving so slowly and what is the bottom temperature? So if we can get um, some information about that, then I can continue with, um, you know, pick up some of the other questions after that and um, let folks know, like sort of start with the technology side of things. So can someone tell us about the ROV and the temperature and the water conditions today. Yeah, so we're going to bring in one of the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration's pilot, uh, Lars. You know, he's an engineer special with this. He's a ROV pilot extraordinaire. And, and Lars, can you can you help us with the question? Yeah, sure. Uh, you can hear me, right? Excellent. Um, right now, uh, the vehicles are moving pretty slow due to the high currents that we're noticing at the bottom. Uh, yeah, you might notice that we are focusing on the, um, the back quarter of the ship here, uh, and that is because we have the current that's coming towards the northeast, and we're kind of using the structure uh, to be able to um, protect us from the majority of that current. So we're moving slow, one, to get some good video uh, as with the box fish that we have out, as well as um, just being very cautious that we... Uh, have the currents under control and that the, the vehicles are set up in such a way that we're, uh, we're comfortable. And I like to point out, so we're on the, uh, the bottom side of the hole at the stern, which is the end. Uh, we're coming up a little bit up on top of the hole, so we're getting a lot of this great marine life. And just to the right on the bottom, we're seeing one of those giant uh, propellers and, and those propeller blades. Each one's about six feet long. So, um, yeah, beautiful. So maybe some more questions from the audience, Carol. Yeah, so um, I have a question about why does it look like it's snowing? That is a great question. And Paula Whitfield, would you like to take that one? Oh, you could start with that one. <laughs> um, so it looks like it's snowing right now um, for a few reasons. So sometimes there's gelatinous organisms moving through the water. Um, that when the lights on the ROV hit them, they can look kind of white like this. Um, it could also be detritus falling from the sea surface down to the ocean floor, something we call marine snow. Um, and then the other thing, it almost kind of looked like it was snowing a little bit ago because there were so many schooling fish that were glittering all in a big ball. Um, and those fish were largely two species, one called vermilion snapper, um, you can distinguish them because they have a kind of pinkish, reddish, I guess vermilion, like their name, um, hue if we have the ROV lights shining on them. Um, and there were also some Tom Tate in that school as well. Um, and Paula, anything else that you'd like to add, maybe about that school of fish that we just saw or perhaps the um, particles that we're seeing in the water that may include some organisms? Um, well, I guess I guess what I'd like to say is that you don't, like basically, when you go you go offshore North Carolina, the closer you get to the coast, the the, the more of that 
freshwater influence you're going to get or you're going to get the more sedimentation. And I think Joe was talking about this earlier where the water can be like a little bit greener and browner. And as a, as a diver, we use the term, you know, it, the water gets dirtier kind of thing. But it's not, it's not dirty. It's just that there's like debris in the water that, that's floating through and it could be, it could be sediment or it could be plankton or there's a lot of different origins of you know, whatever's in the water column. But what I will say is that the farther offshore you go, the closer you get to the Gulf Stream, the less you have that particulate matter in, in the water column. But, of course, you still have some, and that's a good thing because there's food in it as well. Like, it, it can be plankton, a zooplankton. And sometimes when you see those fish in the schools and they kind of all go up at once or they move in different directions and they scatter – they're feeding. They're going up into the water column, and they're feeding on whatever they're finding, and then they're just resuming whatever whatever they were doing right before that. So, so that's, yeah. Yeah, that's okay. incredible. <laughs> and I'd like to point people to uh, feed one and feed two. Please look look at the both because the feed two is giving us these great multiple views of the fish and marine life above the wreck and just, just underneath it. So we see some gorgeous things. Um, Carol, uh, maybe some more questions we'd be happy to answer from the audience. We do. Um, so we have um, a question about um, uh, somebody said they thought sharks always had to move, but there was one laying in the sand, and what's up with that? Um, and so, yeah, sand tiger sharks are one of the species of sharks that does not have to swim constantly um, uh, to keep air or, you know, water moving across their gills so that they can get <coughs> oxygen. Many sharks do. Um, they're called, for if you want the technical term, obligate ram ventilators. Um, but there are a few species of sharks that don't have to do that. And so sand tiger sharks are one of them. Nurse sharks are another. So that's another shark that you often see in aquariums. Um, they often will just sit on the bottom for long periods of time, kind of like that nurse shark, that I'm sorry, that sand tiger shark that you're seeing there right now in feed one, um, you see a couple of them just kind of hanging right there on the bottom while they're, um, you know, other sharks uh, swimming around pretty actively. Um, so it's just sort of a, a mixed bag there of, of what they're doing. Um, we had another question about was there a tennis racket? So I guess somebody um, in at the Roanoke Island Aquarium there um, saw a feature on the on the vessel that looked like a tennis racket to them. Do we have um, any idea of what that was, perhaps? Um, I didn't. Uh, this is uh, on the ship. Uh, I didn't notice anything like that. But, you know, yeah, these were uh, ships populated by people, and who knows what they brought with them, or maybe something fall, that fell off a local boat. It's a very popular dive spot for technical divers or charter fishermen. So, uh it, that could have very well have been a tennis racket, or it could have been another structure. I just didn't have to see it. Chris, did you I see I guess I, I didn't see it, but uh, trying to think about what we've seen before on the camera, I'm wondering if it might have been some of the uh, pieces and parts of the steering machinery that we can see some of on the, the top of the fantail deck uh, that we're kind of getting a, a look at now on the uh, on the feed and that that's a good point so we need to uh, maybe we'll we'll remind folks that when we look at this um, this ship is gigantic so it's uh, nearly 500 feet long which is only a hundred feet shorter than the Titanic and it's about 65 feet from the seafloor to the side of the hole so on the screen it might not look that large but we're seeing a gigantic shipwreck on the seafloor for scale And Carol, we'd be happy to answer more questions there if you've got more. I, so I've covered the ones that I've gotten so far. I've asked Paul to keep the great questions coming, though. Um, I, um, I I sort of have a you know a question, um, and I don't even know if, if if who can answer this. But you know, compared to um, you know when I look at this wreck, it's sitting on its side, and there's all these great caverns you know some of them are really big holes in the side of the vessel um some of them are really tiny little cracks and crevices um and it really just reminds me of like a, almost like a cave structure in in a lot of ways um and i i wonder for people who have a lot more experience than i do um diving off of north carolina if you compare 
you know, the shape and the complexity of a shipwreck, how does that compare to our natural hard bottom ledges um, that also have a lot of structure that fish can take advantage of? But I'm just curious, um, you know, what are some similarities and differences maybe? Yeah, Paula, would you like to start with that one or you want me to start? That's a great question, Carol. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, I could I could start with that. I think one of the things that I want to point out uh, is that on, on the natural rocky reefs, you definitely get a lot more encrusting organisms and like sponges and fans and gorgonians and um and algae. You know, you just you just you definitely see a lot more of that on the on the natural reefs. So I think that that a lot of times the smaller fish community. On, on reefs can sometimes I think it, they can be slightly more abundant. Although we didn't have enough, I, I want to admit that that most of our sites we had a lot of natural reef sites that we explored, like in the you know for about you know a decade and a half in the early 2000s, and and so this is just an observation. Like the, I didn't have enough wreck sites to really compare, but I do think that the smaller cryptic fish community can often be more abundant. On, on natural reefs, some of the natural rocky reefs, you know, and then I'll let I'll let Avery talk about like the difference in the fish communities. Yeah, and so to take a step back for just a second, one of the things that's going on is we have the sandy bottom, and geologically, there's a lot of these exposed rocks that form the rocky reefs that Paula was talking about and that Carol mentioned. Um, and oftentimes those rocky reefs can be very um, broad, continuous habitats. Sometimes there's ledges that can be taller than we are. Um, sometimes they are more of a mixed hard bottom um, where you have sand interspersed with hard sections of rock. Um, and they are incredible habitat for a diversity of marine life, like Paula said. But by and large, a lot of the shipwrecks, especially the one we're on today, are taller. Something that is critical for the fish communities. And so what we see is that a lot of large predators tend to hang out on these taller artificial structures like shipwrecks. Um, we've also started to see that in similar depth ranges, um, a lot of fish may be using the shipwrecks as they move from place to place, almost like stepping stones. Um, so some key structural differences that also translate to differences in the types and varieties of fish that we see on these wrecks versus the natural reefs. Thanks, Avery. Um, I, I did get another question. So kind of moving away from, like, the smaller fish we've just been talking about. Thank you, Paula, for, for, for all of that, too. That's, I'm just really fascinated by this difference between natural uh, reefs and um, artificial structures um, that and how they differ in their habitat quality. But moving on um, to another question that we got uh, from one of our guests at the Roanoke Island Aquarium. How do great whites? affect the ecosystem right, sir. Um, so we don't we're not seeing any uh, white sharks um, on the last couple dives maybe you've seen some other shark species have you seen any white sharks we have not yet seen white sharks on this mission there are however white sharks that do on occasion come to some of the shipwrecks that we have off the coast of north carolina and white sharks are one of the um, topmost predators in the ocean ecosystem and that's the case here off the coast of north carolina too um, and so one of the things that can help keep ecosystems healthy is having all of the different levels in the food web represented from the small bait fish all the way up to those top predators or apex predators like white sharks. Um, and uh, I have personally seen a white shark while diving on an artificial reef that was a ship off the coast of North Carolina. Um, Paula, have you encountered white sharks in your research off the coast of North Carolina as well? <laughs> I wish, I swear, but no, I haven't. I but I have heard heard definitely heard of them, um, but they're they're still not that common. So, but you saw one though. What was that like? It was really incredible. Uh, it was a female white shark, and she was just so majestic. 
um, and a lot larger than I figured she would be, to be honest, Um, but just such a neat thing to be able to see this top predator in the ocean um, using, in this case, an artificial reef that was formed from an intentionally sunk ship to enhance fish habitat. Um, But I I think bringing it back to today's dive, that we are seeing small fish on the site um, as well as those large predators is really great to see. Yeah, so I've, um, you know, as I've talked to a lot of divers and I get a lot of um, images from divers, including video, and we do have occasionally um, divers who have even captured while they're diving um, uh, a white shark. I think I have maybe one video of that um, and maybe a tiger shark as well. Um, there's other locations where um, in North Carolina where Um, so I, I'm sorry, I don't have the numbers right in front of me of how many species of sharks, but everything from sand tigers to sandbars and nurse sharks, um, hammerhead, uh, and so forth. So there's an enormous diversity of sharks off of North Carolina's coast, and we know that many of them are mating here, possibly even pupping here, and, and it's always amazing to me how little we still know about um, about one of the species groups that's most fascinating to people, and that is sharks. And, and just right off our coast, we know it's an important place for so many species of sharks, including, you know, the really charismatic white shark. Um, but there's still just a lot of science out there to do to learn more about these species. And maybe for our, our ecologists, can you uh, identify that uh, the smaller fish we were seeing when we were just up on top of the hole, there seem to be large schools of them? Yes. So you see the ones that were right on top of the hole looks like million sapper, maybe some tom tape mixed in. And Paula, is that the identification that you were able to get as well? It was a little fuzzy eye and Marcy. Yeah, that, that's what I was thinking. And it seemed like uh, so the vermilions kind of light up a little, like you see, see them turn red. That was always the dead giveaway when you're holding the camera up, got your lights going. If they turn red, you're like, oh, yeah, those are vermilions. In order to tell the difference between vermilions and tom tape, sometimes it's tough. And, Carol, I know we're coming up to the top of the hour. Are there other questions coming in from the aquarium visitors today? I'm going to send them a quick um, – uh, I'm going to mute myself and type because I don't want the typing boards to come across. <laughs> um, so hold on just one second. Okay, and while you check for additional questions from the aquarium visitors, we do have a question coming in on the YouTube chat channel that is asking what are the single filament-like structures growing off of the ship? Um, And I think what that question is maybe referring to is these kind of white um, spiral organisms. It almost looks like a pig's tail. And those are a type of coral. Um, We've been working with some of our um, experts who study organisms like this, and folks seem to agree that it is likely a black coral, although it does appear white um, when we're seeing it live underwater like this. Um, So I I think that's what we're looking at. But it brings up a good point that we haven't talked much about today. We've been focusing a lot on the fish. We've been focusing on the history. um, We've been focusing on the um, biggest fish we're seeing, the sharks. But one of the things we haven't talked about is how there's many different animals that can grow on the structure of the ship itself, including those soft corals like we were just talking about. Yeah, it's incredible. And as we're moving up, what we're seeing here is a view of the World War II tanker E.M. Clark. Um, what we're seeing on the main screens, that's the main deck of the E.M. Clark that the crew would have walked and worked on. The ship is actually laying on its port side, which is the left-hand side of the vessel. The starboard side is facing up towards the surface, which is the right-hand side. And in the distance on the right, you can see on the bottom there is the rudder, large, large 15-foot rudder, and then the one of the E.M. Clark's two uh, 
<laughs> propeller systems, each one having three blades, and each one of those blades is about six feet long. So just very, very dramatic uh, views from the seafloor at 260 feet off Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. And Carol, maybe any other questions for us from the, the aquarium? Uh, it looks like they're wrapping up and folks are taking off. So I think um, I think that's it for questions from the aquarium for now. Okay. Well, I know we have another interaction with the aquarium this afternoon, I think at 1.30. But I just want to thank everybody who's at the North Carolina Aquarium at Roanoke Island. Thank you so much from us at sea, from NOAA, from the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration. We are so happy to have you with us today and uh, hopefully tune in for more adventures in the future. And those of you watching uh, on feed two and feed one, we've got some great views of the, uh, the starboard side of the E.M. Clark, the World War II tanker. The vessel's laying on its side and we are moving slowly up the hull and just experiencing all these schools of fish. Beautiful, beautiful shots. I, I should talk about who we are and what we do. So this is the Valor in the Atlantic Telepresence Expedition. This is a cooperative agreement between NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries and the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration, or GFOE. Uh, GFOE has provided the ROVs, or remotely operated vehicles. Uh, they build them, they design them, they're piloting them right now. They brought them aboard the ship. They built out the whole infrastructure on the ship. They brought it with them from trucking in them in in huge containers. They built a satellite system, and that's how we're bringing you these live footage that you're seeing now with literally maybe a four to second four to six second delay from what we're seeing live on the seafloor to what you see at home around the world so my name is Tane Casserly I'm with NOAA's Monitor National Marine Sanctuary I'm also have on the ship with me uh, Chris Southerly with North Carolina's Office of State Archaeology and on land we have our ecology, ecological experts our ecologists with the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science Dr. Avery Paxton Paula Whitfield and we also have with us Dr. Kill Price from Paula, you know, what do you think of uh, what we're seeing? Um, this is Paula. Uh, I guess I'll start with um, what, what I'm what I what I'm seeing. I feel like is vintage North Carolina wreck diving. Where you really you've got the players that you normally see and on one of these like fantastic visibility days between the large predators and the sand tigers and the schooling, you know, bait fishes, which, which are the tomtates and the vermilion, and then the lionfish that you have. And if we, um, if there's a chance to get any, any lower or closer to the wreck, we could maybe try and explore um, to see if there's some smaller, smaller, more cryptic looking fishes, which, which often are like the tropical species that you see on these offshore wrecks. And this particular location, it stays warm enough year round. I feel very confident <laughs> it stays warm enough year round. You know, that means it has to be above 60 degrees for these tropicals to be able to survive in the, in the winter time. Yeah, it looks, like, on, it looks like in feed too, we saw a bit of a lionfish there too. Yeah, and there's some spots in hogfish that are kind of going in and out um, of the wreck. And oh, I think that, uh, I don't know, that looked like that could have been a snapper maybe, but I just caught the tail end of it. We also saw a very large snapper. I sort of wish Brian Deegan was on or, or Chris Taylor, but I almost wanted to call it a Kubera snapper, which is, is another um, large species of snapper. You were also seeing lots of lions. This is a really good shot. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, I was going to say, we're also seeing lots and lots of lionfish, which perhaps we didn't expect to see 30 years ago, but now they seem to be on every shipwreck here. Yes, they're going to be on every shipwreck that stays warm enough in the winter time. So if it stays above sixty degrees um, in the in the winter time, they're going to be able to survive. And and that's the whole reason why you get these more tropical communities that includes the lionfish offshore, and then inshore it's more temperate community. 
but not not quite as many tropicals because they just can't survive that cold water in the winter. And and Paula, you mentioned before about diving on these shite on these sites in North Carolina, and you know, for for me, this is uh, some of the best diving in the world. You know, people don't realize it's right offshore of North Carolina that you can get these gigantic shipwrecks, huge amount of marine life, uh, clear water, warm water. I mean, it really is fantastic. And I think it's one of the, it was one of the hidden gems, maybe being more and more known now, but I still think this is absolutely world-class diving. And, um, you know, it's for anybody that is able to get here. Uh, I couldn't recommend it more. Come dive off North Carolina. Enjoy these resources for yourself. Yeah, I, I agree. I've always felt like, you know, North Carolina was some of the best diving in the in the whole world and, and that it was somehow um, less, I guess, just unknown. But the people who dive here really appreciate it. But it, it's hard diving, though, right? Like, it's not, since it's, it's not like a he's where you can go 30 minutes boat ride and be right on a, on a reef. In shallow water, you have to go a little bit farther to get that real good water. So it, sometimes it's considered more, I would say, advanced diving. Yeah, absolutely. But with the proper training equipment, it's mm-hmm. it's worth it. And yeah. how, what for you, Chris? What do you think? I can say, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, North Carolina diving is it's, it's certainly not, you know, Florida or Bahamas or Caribbean diving. Uh, you do have to go a little farther. You do have to work a little harder, put up with a, a little bit more unpredictable uh, sea state. Uh, but I, I would have to say the, the reward for the extra effort is absolutely worth it. Uh, there are some of the, the best wrecks around uh, that are diveable and uh, such a, a variety of wrecks as well. And the, you add into that the the cultural heritage of the the historic story that we're telling here of shipwrecks from you know the civil war from the turn of the century world war one world war two right on up into modern era ships that are you know we're, we're still accidentally and sometimes on purpose for the reef program uh, to provide structure on the bottom we're, we're still wrecks are still hitting the bottom so we've got so many to 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 see and experience here in in North Carolina and as you said in near tropical waters in season. Yeah, it's amazing. And maybe Chris, you know, we're looking at a shipwreck from 1942, but what's the excuse me, what's the the age range of some of these ships that we have up North Carolina? I mean, it's it's incredible, right? Hundreds of years. I guess so. Yeah, we have the uh, the underwater archaeology branch. We have. Uh, been around for well, since the early 1960s and have done extensive uh, historical and documentary research on the the wrecks and the reporting of wrecks in North Carolina and the our shipwreck database we have over 5,000 known shipwreck losses in North Carolina waters so you know there's there's an absolute reason we're called the graveyard of the Atlantic there are abundance of wrecks out there and they range from the early sailing ships of the age of exploration when uh, some of the the spanish came up from uh, further down in florida with forays up against the english colonies uh, in in the you know 1600s up into the 1700s right on up through uh, the the 20th century and now the 21st century so there are there are abundance of wrecks out there yeah, absolutely. And as we're looking here, we're looking at the the high side of the vessel, uh, the E.M. Clark, the World War II tanker, part of the Battle of the Atlantic. It's laying on its side. Uh, the starboard side of the right-hand side is facing towards the surface of the water. We were just up on the top of the hull there, uh, getting some spectacular views of the hull, a little bit of the deck, and, of course, all of this amazing marine life. We've also extended the Boxfish 360 camera. Uh, we were getting such spectacular views that we redeployed this, and that's what is on this long black arm you can see in the feed. With a, it looks like a, it's a camera housing at the end because it is with three domes, and there's three lenses in there. It's capturing all this with video, and after the project, we'll stitch that together to, to give you an immersive 360-degree video experience of 
exploring the shipwreck, um, which you can download for free on our websites with NOAA at monitor.noaa.gov um, and all sorts of products too. But this is just some of the things that's going to come out of this project uh, that's made possible by GFOE and their technical expertise. You know, Avery and Paula, you know, as we're looking at the sand tiger shark, I noticed some of them have white marks on their skin. What is that? Hi, this is Paula. I was thinking, um, so Carol, I'm not sure if Carol's still on, but she was just talking about this earlier, but I believe that's the scarring from the mating, so that, that they uh, apparently, you know, will bite each other during the mating process. And Carol mentioned that the females in particular would be kind of t um, tore up, those white scars would be on their pectoral fins. Oh, that's fascinating. I think that's what it is. Yeah, so, um, you know, during this time of year especially, uh, we do see uh, mostly females with, you know, really significant uh, wounding and scarring right up there along the pectoral fins, which for those of you who, you know, might not know all the fins on a fish are the ones um, sort of on the bottom there towards the front, just right behind the gills. And, you know, that's just how sharks have to hold on to each other during mating. They don't have um, arms like we do. And so um, it seems odd to us, but that's just, um, you know, how this species has evolved. So um, totally natural and normal to see that kind of scarring. And, in fact, the females have, um, you know, different, you know, thicker skin and, um, and scaling there to compensate for some of that. But... We also see a lot of scars and scripts and other kinds of wounds on sharks, the pictures that divers send me, and that's males and females at all times of year and on all parts of their body. So one of the places um, we sometimes see a lot of scars and scratches is on their heads, right on their snouts. Um, and I've seen a few sharks, uh, you know, go by with, with those kinds of um, marks. Um, and, you know, we really don't know what causes that. We have some hypotheses, some good guesses, but certainly, um, you know, that question kind of leads us to, you know, what we, not only what we are seeing on the feed, but some behaviors that we haven't seen on the feed. So we're not observing mating behavior. Um, I haven't seen it on the feeds, on the ROV, you know, when I've been on um, watching. Um, so we haven't seen mating behavior, and we also haven't seen a lot of predation happening, so no, like, feeding events. So that's another place or activity where, you know, if, if sand tiger sharks are feeding up against um, these structures, either the artificial reefs, like this, um, the shipwreck of the E.M. Clark, or on natural hard bottom habitat, if they're pursuing uh, prey fish, um, up against these structures, then it's also possible that, you know, they're incurring some, some damage, some, some injuries when they're doing that and not causing those um, scrapes to show up in places like their head or other parts of their body even perhaps. But um, again, it's a, just another fascinating avenue of research to figure out what's happening, you know, what's hurting these sharks, what's causing those scars and scratches. So for some of them, we have pretty good ideas, but um, still, uh, still some mysteries to solve for sure. Yeah, exactly. I want to uh, make sure everybody knows who's watching at home. We are the on the World War II tanker, the E. M. Clark, at 260 feet of water. Um, we're off the coast of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, right now. And then um, I just I had one more question about the sharks. So, you know, we talked about feeding and not seeing that behavior, but um, you know, we're seeing them swim through these schools of fish. You know, when at a certain time of day, what is a, a switch going to flip and they're going to start feeding on this, these same fish they're swimming through, or do they have a different kind of feeding behavior? That's a really great question. Um, here in a couple of days, I think we're going to be back at this wreck for a night dive, right? Yeah, if we're able to, our, we have the right conditions, that's absolutely the plan to come back here at night and see what the shipwreck looks like. And the change of behaviors, maybe what we might see in the marine life. And we might see that. A few days ago, um, you know, we were on another uh, vessel, and um, 
and we were we were watching, and it was getting kind of dark, you know, you know, approaching dusk, and we did start to see some changes in behavior in the jacks, you know, becoming a lot more active um, as night was falling, and so. There is some really interesting research that's been done about sort of these trade-offs for sharks between um, prey detectability, so can they, can they see where the fish are versus can the, can the prey see them, um, and sort of those balances between, you know, when can the shark most effectively and efficiently feed? It, costs a, it takes a lot of energy to go hunt for food. And so the sharks want to make sure that they've got a pretty good chance of being successful in their feeding attempts. And so when it's, you know, when there's light out and um, good visibility, um, maybe it's just not worth the effort to try to feed. But, you know, as light decreases, maybe they get end up with a, a little better chance um, of, of feeding. And, um, you know, but that, those are some research topics that are still, you know, out there in the experimental phase um, for sure. Um, but it would be great to be able to see that switch in behavior. And um, and we do know from, you know, divers and, and other researchers that behaviors on shipwrecks do change um, for many of the fish population. I'm sure Paula um, and Avery, who experienced a lot of dives um, out on these shipwrecks, can probably talk a little bit more about some of those behavioral changes during the day. Well, what I've noticed, well, first I wanted to echo your comment that we're not seeing that, that prey behavior or the mating behavior, like, in the, in the day, basically. And I know in all my years of experience, I've, I've never seen it. Always wondered, you know, maybe it must be night. They must feed at night or during crepuscular time periods, like dawn or dusk. Um, that was just what I was thinking from the observations of of when seeing these sand tigers that are just so docile during the day, um, and when do they actually uh, start preying? But alternatively, I've seen a lot of prey be um, predator prey behavior of like some of the predators, like the king bass mackerel or uh, the amberjacks. Like, they'll come in and corral those um, bait species and then start going right through the middle of them. Like, they'll get them into a ball, and then they'll just start racing through the middle of them and feeding. And if, if you're lucky, that can, that can happen at almost any time. But it seems like um, toward the dusk time period has been the time period when, or later in the afternoon when the sun's lower, I've seen more of that behavior. So that's one observation. Yes, I agree with that. That's also been my observation, and we were so lucky to see the other day, like Carol mentioned, not only the jacks starting to change their behavior as dusk started to approach, but we also saw a lot of the large grouper that had been um, kind of hiding in the wreck structure start to emerge and uh, move more deliberately um, and with intention. And so, Tani, can you describe to the viewers where we are on the shipwreck right now? Or are we further down the wreck than we were originally? Yeah, absolutely. We're still towards the rear of the vessel. Um, so we're just, you can see sort of the curve of the end of the vessel there, what we call the stern, as we come back. But we are uh, looking at the starboard side of the vessel, which, is, <laughs> excuse me, is the right-hand side of the vessel that is facing towards the surface. You can see the propeller on the right-hand side. And the rudder is just underneath the ROV, but we're sort of at the end of the vessel, the tip of the end, the stern. We're up on top of it, and we're slowly making our way forward. Um, you know, we're dealing with a pretty challenging current, but it's a testament to the skill set of the, the ROV pilots we have here and the ship coordinating together to be able to move us to give us these spectacular views. And I did have a, a question earlier that we well, you know what's the difference between an ROV dive and a scuba dive on this site? And... Um, because from my own personal experience from diving on the shipwreck, um, one of the biggest differences is divers don't have a leash. So we have to remember that's how all these uh, visuals are coming to us now, is it's a live feed through a cable attached to these robots on the bottom coming up to us. So that all has to be moved in the water column of all that coordination. The difference in a scuba diver is I I'm not tethered at all. I can free swim. So 
we could work and operate much more easily in a high current situation, which sometimes wouldn't be possible with an ROV. But of course the trade-off is I get barely any time at a depth like 260 feet, maybe 20 minutes, maybe a little bit longer, depending on what type of gases you're using. Well, in ROV, we could literally be down here for days. So that's the difference. But I'll, I'll tell you from my own personal experience, again, diving on this site in high current is that we have a very skilled captain and he'll actually mark the shipwreck on his bottom finder so he'll see it you know up at the helm he'll mark it then he'll go up current engage how long it takes to drift to the shipwreck site and then he'll calculate how long it takes for our dive team to hit the bottom so he'll go up that up current up at the shipwreck that appropriate distance to make sure that when we jump into the water everybody together you have to be together drop all at the same time you all hit the bottom at the same time and at the same place and I would say 98% of the time, we're able to hit right where we went to at the start. But you just have to drift with the current. You can't fight it. You know, you have to be one with the environment. But, but that's some of the differences here. And, of course, um, you do your, your, your time on the shipwreck. You enjoy it. You do the work you need to do. And then you all come together at the end and make sure everybody's okay. And then we shoot a lift bag to the surface, which is essentially a uh, sort of a, a sealed bag that you can put air in, attached to a line that goes zoop, all the way up to the surface tells the service boat hey we're all here we're coming up we usually put another lift bag on it just to go up and say hey the whole team's together and then you slowly free drift away from the wreck together and decompress slowly coming up but it's a it's a ballet um, but that's really the, the differences the challenges between the two um, scuba diving may be a little bit more mobile and movable but again barely any bottom time versus having a bit more a bit more challenge to be able to come down with that tether but again unlimited bottom time so um but that's the difference and maybe for uh for paula you know you've dove the site which but your experience is getting to the em clark because it's like you said it's a it's a challenge to get here <laughs> yeah 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 definitely and um i was thinking that as you were talking you know i was just kind of nostalgically thinking about the last the last time we dove this we ended up getting like coming down and not being on the wreck. We were just slightly um, down current of it, and we had to swim into the current, oh. you know, to get to the wreck. And it was took every ounce of strength that you had, you know, to just make it to the wreck. Because once you were on the wreck, you could get stabilized. You could, you know, um, use that to, to, to be in the lee, in other words, in the lee of the current. And uh, that was one of the things that always struck me about the Clark is that you never really knew what conditions you were going to get. You know, once once I saw the the Clark in the most beautiful state ever, where you could see it from the surface. Oh. And you talked about this, Tony, where it's just it's beautiful and wow. and no no current. You can just see the whole thing. And then the next time I was there, there was about two foot of visibility, oh. and it was just murky and and horrible. And I don't think I lasted very long on that one. <laughs> But you just, you just don't know what you're going to get. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And again, that's and why we're so lucky to have these beautiful visuals today. And some of those beautiful visuals are now starting to illuminate some really interesting fish that we hadn't been able to see earlier. So we're now getting these close-up views of the structure and some of the um, spaces inside of the shipwreck where fish are using them for habitat. So we're seeing some grouper. We see a scamp on the screen right now. We're seeing um, fish that are red and yellow. Those are called spot fin hogfish. And I'm fairly sure that I just saw a beautiful angelfish um, about 40, 45 seconds ago. And we're also seeing some of the invasive lionfish that we spoke of earlier. Uh, barracuda, and we've been talking previously about some of the really interesting foraging behavior, the predator-prey dynamics, and about a minute ago while Paula was talking, we saw a beautiful example of that. We saw some huge predatory jacks um, almost dart up from uh, deeper portions, come up through an opening in the wreck, and start to chase after and try to corral some of the smaller bait fish, um, and I'm getting a really nice view of this angelfish and rov pilots if there's any way to zoom in on that maybe not with the box fish extended but if we could get some 4k video footage of this portion that would be really valuable 
And the angelfish, Avery, is that, Paula, is that in front of us just a little bit? Um, it was in front of us. Um, it was now behind us, I believe. I don't see it anymore. Um, but one of the things I'm hoping that Paula might be able to share with us is we started to talk earlier today a little bit about water temperatures and how water temperatures in this area play such a critical role in dictating what types of fish we see. Can you explain why that is? Does it have to do with the temperature tolerance of the species? And um, how does that relate to what we're seeing today? Yes, that's that's exactly what it has to do with. Like different different fishes are, are you know tolerant have different thresholds for for their lower limits for, for that cold water. And so what we found out when I first started diving off North Carolina, I remember, and this was in the 80s. I just remember thinking, where are all these tropicals coming from, and do they survive the winter? Like, that was one of the biggest questions that I had in my mind. And so the work that we did kind of set out to, to answer that initial question of, oh, there's the two, um, I just want to point out two, two of the angelfish, um, which is a tropical species that we're talking about. Go ahead. There's also two butterfly fish right um, kind of below them a little bit um, towards the bottom of the stream. They're hard to see, but they were right in there, too, which is fun to point them out because they're another one. Yes, exactly. And so I sort of lost my train of thought, except that, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, so you so were talking have, about yeah, um, ahead, tropical species. Um, you are talking about tropical species and what happens during the winter. Do they survive here? Um, do they go somewhere right, else? Right, right, exactly, exactly. And what I found out was that that over of a, as you go offshore North Carolina, like the shallowest dives we did were 60 feet to to 150 feet for for most of our work. As you go offshore, you're closer and closer to the Gulf Stream, and any anywhere um, like about 100 feet or further, it stayed warm enough for them to survive the winter. So the tropicals that are residing at these locations, like the Clark, are surviving the winter because we know that their thermal tolerances, because we collected temperature data at all of these wrecks for several years, and it found out that it was just perfectly in line with winter bottom water temperatures. I'm going to say, Paula, we've been talking we a lot. And another question. I can say yeah. Oh, we, you go ahead. I can say yeah. We've we've been talking a lot about the the temperature and the temperature variation and kind of sixty degrees being the threshold for tropicals up here. Uh, for for those folks that aren't familiar with the the coast of North Carolina, what kind of, of complete temperature variation do we see in in the waters, both inshore and and offshore, throughout the season? You know, what what would say our coldest winter temperatures be as opposed to our peak summer temperatures um just kind of a to give people an idea because everybody shows up at the beach and says oh well 70 degrees feels cold to me on a 90 degree day um you know what what kind of temperature range are would we be maybe talking about that's, i guess that's for me right and i'm sitting here i, I can say a paul paula you my... or avery either one yes First, yeah, I was, I was so kind of, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say I was going to let you take that answer that question. Oh, okay. Well, I was trying to remember, like, what that lower limit was, and, and so I, I thought, well, should I grab my, the PDF and look at that? But I know that it was probably around 10 or 11 degrees uh, Celsius. So I, I did the conversion for, for 15 degrees, so I just need to do the conversion for what that is um, in Fahrenheit. Uh, as, um, you're, as, you're, so was just, yeah, as, as you're thinking about that, Paula, I just want to point out that the ROV, uh, for those at home, is just uh, moving away from the shipwreck a little bit to reposition, and then we're going to make a run back at the shipwreck again. Uh, we just have a lot of currents uh, we're working with now with uh, coordination with the ship and the ROV pilots here with GFOE. So, uh, so stay tuned. Those that are watching, we will be zooming back into the wreck very shortly. Uh, Paula, back to you. Yeah, so some of the temperatures that we were 
the temperatures where they weren't surviving was, you know, anything less than 60 so, but some of them were about 50 degrees. It was getting as cold as 50 degrees at our nearest inshore sites, which were about 60 feet of water depth. So not that cold, really, when you think about it. But, trop you know, tropical species, you know, don't like it. And one of the really interesting things that relates to this is that our team did a study um, maybe five, six years ago where we compared the numbers of tropical fish on artificial reef habitats and shipwrecks to the number of tropical fish on the naturally occurring rocky reefs. And just like Paula has um, illuminated, we do see a lot of tropical fish on these sites but we were seeing many more on the artificial habitats like the shipwrecks. And we have a few ideas for why that may be. If these tropical species are perhaps moving poleward as climate change um, has impacts on the ecosystem that could relate to these fish, um, maybe these fish are able to use the shipwrecks, these little islands of habitat as stepping stones along their movement paths. Um, but we haven't been able to confirm that yet, so it's just at the hypothesis stage. But we do have evidence that artificial structures like shipwrecks do facilitate um, tropical species. And so that's been a really interesting and intriguing finding and something that the footage we're able to collect today will help us follow up on and um, hopefully observationally learn a little bit more about what might be driving some of these patterns. Is it perhaps something in the food source? Are the tropical fish able to find their food sources in higher abundance maybe on these shipwrecks than the natural rocky reefs? We, we simply don't know yet. Um, but really fun to think about and think about how we can use today's um, and previous and later mission findings to hopefully help us answer those mysteries that still remain. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, maybe this is a good opportunity to ask uh, our ROV pilots, um, you know, exactly what are we doing right now from your perspective? Um, because you guys are the experts on the scene. Sure, yeah, I can go ahead and take that. Um, today is a, a very challenging dive based off of the uh, surface and bottom currents as well as the wind. Uh, fortunately, they lined up just right, so even though it was on the edge, um, it was possible. We've been able to get down. Uh, you'll probably notice that we have been on the, um, <clears throat> the northeast corner of this wreck. Uh, we've kind of been poking out little by little every half hour or so to try and get a sense of what the bottom currents are doing. Um, throughout the day, the surface currents have been increasing as well as the wind. Um, and whenever the wind changes slightly from the surface uh, currents, it makes it a lot more challenging for the ship to hold station. Uh, so what just happened there was the wind shifted slightly, the ship's uh, thrusters ramped up, we were unable to hold station, so we safely got into uh, a position to be able to pull off the wreck, get back to a stable location, and then now, uh, once we've become stable, we'll reacquire the wreck if the conditions are favorable to do that in a, in a safe manner. But we will uh, get back to you as, as soon as the conditions improve for us to safely proceed. And, and, and Lars, maybe you can tell us too that uh, I think a lot of folks don't realize there's actually two ROVs in the water and you have to coordinate with both of those, the currents and the ship, is that correct? Yeah, so um, we actually run, like you mentioned, two body system, uh, standby one. And you can see how we're constantly at work here. These guys are working so hard to get us back on the shipwreck site. Um, and again, just adapting to every single change that you have to adapt to in real time. But um, we're very lucky to have that expertise with us. I, I guess say you, you really need three ears because you know, <laughs> you know, Lars is the navigator. He's he's got uh, one ear listening to the pilot channel, one ear listening to the science channel that we're talking on. And uh, he's also paying attention to the uh, to the radio, uh, being in contact with the uh, with the bridge. So he's uh, very much multitasking. Yeah, I, uh, I have a few balls I'm trying to juggle here uh, all at once. Um, but we we just got word from the the bridge. Uh, they are all stable. The conditions have lined back up again. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get out of tow, um, which is our uh, stable safe. Uh, configuration. We'll come back into work configuration and that will be Guru looking down at Yogi 
uh, giving you that nice bird's eye view that we're, we're used to seeing you know, in stream two. Um, and we will reacquire the wreck. Um, as you mentioned before, it is a two-body system. Uh, we have Yogi, which is the main vehicle. She's the one holding the 4K and HD cameras. Um, and then we have, uh, attached to Yogi through a soft tether, is Guru, which is, um, she acts as a, a shock stabilizer, so to speak. So trying to mitigate the amount of movement that the ship is seeing on the surface from being transferred to Yogi so that we're able to get those nice stable um, shots from from Yogi. Attached to, to Guru is 6-8 cable which runs up to the ship, uh, goes through a winch uh, that allows us to <coughs> get our video and power. Um, we'll power it down to the vehicles and then video back up through the cable and into our VSAT to be sent out um, from the ship itself. So this is a challenging system to run especially in high currents because on the surface current or sorry the surface you have the the currents you have the wind all acting on the ship that's trying to hold position uh, anytime the ship makes a heading change her rotation is around her midships so that will change where the a-frame is on the back of the ship which yogi and guru are attached to so any degree change that the ship makes with its heading will be about a, a hundred foot lever arm, so to speak, uh, of where Guru will actually end up. So anytime there's a slight heading change, the navigator has to calculate where that will put Guru, um, and then that will uh, determine where Yogi ends up as well. So it's, uh, it's a lot of moving pieces uh, that we're monitoring very closely, um, and uh, like I said before, uh, trying to juggle as many of these balls as possible to bring a, uh, a safe and uh, exciting dive for you all, but we will be back on the wreck here shortly as uh, Yogi pulls around and uh, we'll continue getting as many shots as we can with the conditions that we uh, were given. Yeah, that, that's great. Thank you, Lars. And, you know, that's I wanted to have Lars explain that because it's not just dropping a payload to the seafloor and then moving around. This is a hundred times more complex to that. So, again, it just speaks to the expertise of the, uh, the GFOE crew and, of course, the uh, officer's crew of the Nancy Foster um, making sure we we get to where we need to be, so we're we're getting there. Um, a for Avery and Paula, on the the sort of the quad view we're looking at, we're seeing several fish that are swimming at us. Some have a black stripe over the eyes, and some don't. Are they they look similar? Are they same species? Are they different species? What what are those? Oh, it's giving Avery a chance. I know that um, Almaco that are the ones with the black stripe, but I don't think I saw the ones that didn't have the, the stripe through the eye. Yeah, are you, um, no, are you seeing some I of those? I think both of them did, but one was okay. paint and the other was pretty, um, uh, it was more intense. And so they're likely amberjack or almacojack. Um, and one of the ways you can tell them apart is that the stripe on the almacojack um, extends further along the body and kind of um, ends with that dorsal fin. Um, so to me, that one looks like an amberjack. It also has a shallower head um, slope, and then the ones with the more steeply sloped heads, those are the Almaco jack. So a little bit tricky to tell them apart. Um, there's a few other giveaways, but oftentimes um, in some of the footage, we're not able to distinguish them very well. Well, it looks like we're getting some great views of them on that quad view here. So the ROV pilot. Hey, this is this is. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. No, no, sorry. I was just going to say the ROV pilots have told me they've retracted the box fish, and now they're going to try to come into the shipwreck site and get some zoomed-in views for you. And on the quad view, there's a great shot of a sand tiger shark coming at us. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Paulo. Okay. Were you saying oh, something? Oh, excellent. Side view. There oh, you go. Oh, look at that handsome face. Wow. Wow. This spectacular, beautiful boy, beautiful male shark. Yeah, Tony, while you were, um, you know, while we were waiting for the ship to reposition itself and all of that, you know, um, it really got me thinking about something. I, um, in addition to working for the aquariums, I also teach um, undergraduates at North Carolina State University. And 
I get a lot of questions about, you know, how do I get to be a marine biologist? How do I get to, you know, do this kind of work? And, you know, one of the things I, you know, always tell my kids, my students, is, you know, it's, you don't just have to be into fish. You know, some people think a marine biologist is just somebody who studies fish, but I think, you know, this mission, this expedition that y'all are doing here really shows how many different kinds of, you know, uh, experts you have to have to do this kind of science. Sure, you need biologists to, you know, ask these questions about sharks and fish and all that kind of stuff or the what kind of coral is that or, you know, those sorts of questions. But really, you know, we've got people with so many different skill sets, you know, making coming together to make this happen. So you have to have engineers and people who are good at IT and, um, you know, scuba divers and oceanographers, you know, just so many different fields of study, you know, you don't just have to be a biologist to be involved in this kind of really amazing research. And certainly the scientists couldn't do it without all of these other, you know, technical experts to help make this happen. And I, I think that this is just such a, a great reflection of that, that this is a career field that encompasses so many different um, you know, areas of study and areas of skill. Um, and so I just want to, you know, just kind of point that out. I mean, it's maybe kind of stating the obvious, but um, definitely as these videos go out, you know, for years to come, probably, you know, inspiring um, young people who can see themselves, um, you know, in some of these careers uh, that, that it takes to be able to do this kind of work. Yeah, no, a absolutely. So what we're seeing is the seafloor of the ocean at 260 feet of seawater off the coast of North Carolina, about 20 plus miles, and now it's beaming all the way to outer space. So this project is literally going from seafloor to space to be able to do what we're doing here today. And, and I'll just say the folks that we have here in the room, you know, we've got um, historians, um, archaeologists, which is uh, Chris Sutherland, myself, Tony Casterly, but the GFOE team is engineers, ROV pilots, um, designers, you know, we've got a television production expertise here. We've got a videographer expertise. You know, those people are watching online on the computers, and now we need a web team. So they're on Twitter, they're on Facebook, they're live now bringing this to you with the chat, plus all the science aspects of it too. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. So you could literally engage at almost any level to help promote, be part of this project. Um, so it's not just a scuba diver, it's not just uh, the scientist, but it's it's the entire team. So you're you're, you're absolutely right, Carol, that um, there's there's uh, professional opportunities to engage in this at almost every level, and um, yeah, it, it takes a village to get this done. It's not just one group, but it's it's everybody. And you can see we're actually approaching the shipwreck again. So you can see that that's the stern of the World War II tanker, the E.M. Clark. We're at 260 feet on the seafloor. Great view of a sand tiger shark here coming up. But we're getting hope for the ecologist here to really get some great zoomed in views of some of the marine life um, on the hull. And is there anything for you, for, for you guys on the call? Are there particular aspects that we could pass on to the ROV pilots you'd like us to focus on? Yes, so it would be great if we could get some close-up shots of some of the mobile organisms like the sharks and fish, um, if practical. And we'd also like to see some close-ups of the animals growing on the shipwreck structure um, and maybe some glimpses of what's inside of the wreck itself. Oh, okay. No small feet. We'll see what we can do out here at sea. The, uh, for the... I know. Lots of requests. <laughs> no, they're good. So for... Um, Coming up close and to look at the hull, would you like to look at the stern here or, would, or, more, or more on top of the vessel uh, like where we were earlier? What's your preference? Um, honestly, both would be great. And I'd say that if there's also archaeological goals to look at um, the kind of underneath portion and the um, tallest portion, that's fine. Um, and I'd also love if we're able to get a little bit more light, perhaps, onto the close-up views so we can make out some of the organisms a little bit more distinctly feasible. Okay. Absolutely. Well, everybody's listening, and we're getting reset and see what we can do for you here at sea.
You know, on the uh, on the quad feed, you'll see this. There's a shark that just rubbed his face into the uh, the sediment. Wow, and this footage is just incredible. So I'm looking on the main feed, feed one, at a lionfish in the sand. We were looking at a school largely of vermilion snapper. They had that pinkish red hue, um, and the light hit them, and they um, ended up darting out of the frame of view um, pretty quickly, possibly some sort of response to predation or perhaps even a startle response from the ROV's presence in the water. Um, we're starting to see a little bit of the organisms that are growing on the ship itself. We're seeing some of those spiral um, whip-shaped organisms. Those are a type of soft coral. Um, and there's likely um, sponges and tunicates and hydroids and bryozoans, um, all sorts of just incredible diversity of animals that are living on this structure, too. And I, I think... Hopefully, we'll be able to illustrate some of that diversity with the close-up views and the lights, which really help these colors pop. Um, and Chris Southerly, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about um, <laughs> colors and how um, colors attenuate with depth in the water and so why it's so critical for us to bring in the colors with these lights. I guess they ab absolutely, Avery. The, uh, yeah, the light penetration in water uh, is as it passes into the water, the water begins to, uh, as you use the correct term, attenuate the colors out. And that happens in the, the order of the colors that we see in the rainbow. So everybody from elementary school remembers, you know, RGBiv, you know, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. So as at about 15 to 20 feet, you start the, the red start to, to disappear and they become just kind of washed out and, and kind of a, a grayish or a, a tannish color, not really a lot of color. And then as you proceed deeper and deeper, more of the color attenuates out. So you really just see a, unless you bring an artificial light with you to to illuminate what we're looking at here on the bottom, everything's just going to look kind of tannish or brown or maybe a slight greenish or, or blue color. Uh, you know, blue and purple being the last to be filtered out. You know, that's why the ocean at the bottom still looks blue as the, as the light makes it down. Um, but the, that's one of the nice things about having the ROVs here is, you know, they are powered from the surface. They do have uh, powerful LED lights on them. And the uh, Lars, I believe the, the temperature on these LED lights have been uh, adjusted and calibrated so that they, they actually reflect the as if we were having actual sunlight down here so these are as close to a true true color that we be, we would be seeing even though we're 260 feet down yeah exactly chris um we we are very proud of the uh the products that we're able to produce with our video uh cameras and the the high resolution images as well as the uh the video and because of that we really take our time when we get to the bottom and set up uh, what we do a white balance. Um, so if you'll notice on the ECA robotic arm, it's a little electric uh, five function arm on the um, starboard side of the vehicle of Yogi. So that has like a, a little yellow plate, uh, sorry, white, excuse me, white plate. And what we'll do is we'll bring that in front of the camera. We'll zoom in at, the, at a um, known angle and zoom. And then our videographer Roland Bryan can go ahead and adjust uh, what we see because we know that's true white and you can adjust what we see through the video at that time and change it um, depending on whichever environment we're in. Uh, so that allows us to make sure that all of our videos are as close to the actual color you would see if you were seeing this on land on you know at the back of the deck looking at it directly um, to try and maintain as much consistency and um, in crispness as, as possible. Like you say, and, and the pilot now so has... So I'm going to interject a, here yeah, and go, ask absolutely. if we could get some 4K footage of what we're looking at. Um, we're seeing some really incredible soft coral, that kind of pinkish purple behind it. We're seeing some butterfly fish. Um, and we're seeing a lot of what Paula was talking about earlier, these small, kind of hard-to-see fish that are associating really closely with the structure provided by the corals that are growing on this. And so it's just another 
example of how these animals um, and these wrecks are able to support such an incredible dive. Oh, my goodness, look at that. Oh, my goodness. Is that a little puffer fish? I've been thinking I've been seeing some of those. Is that what, is that what you think those are, a little... Yeah, so we yeah. that is a sharp nose puffer. Paula, would you like to tell us a little bit more about those? Um, well, I don't really know a whole ton about them, I'll be honest. But, you know, they just have this characteristic. Like when you're IDing fish on the bottom, the thing that you really hone in on is the silhouette and their behavior and the way they hold their body. And if you look at this little puffer right now where he's just kind of he looks like he's like, I'm not here, I'm not here. You know, he's just hiding. They're both, like, hiding, like, under by that Gorgonian coral, just using it, like, as um, as a form of habitat, really, to just orient to it and, and hopefully not get preyed upon in their location. And so this is one of the things that our teams try to actually measure when we're doing surveys. So we try to measure not only what the structure of the wreck is like, but how tall the organisms growing on it are. And that's because just like Paula said, animals can use the shipwreck for refuge and habitat, but they can also use these invertebrates, the soft coral gorgonian that we're seeing here for um, biological habitat cover. It's just a really remarkable layering um, of the different types of habitat and different functions that these wrecks can serve. And so to me, this view is absolutely stunning. It's, um, I, I guess my best analogy, if I were to go into my backyard right now, I could see all the grass, I could see the structure, um, but I wouldn't be able to see the ants and their little ant hills. Um, and so now we're in at that level. We're able to get this incredible detail and the ability of the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration's team to hold position, especially in the strong currents that we're seeing today, is just remarkable. So thank you all. You know, Avery, I had a question for you and, and Paula and, and Carol that you know, we're seeing these beautiful tropical fish, these, these very small fish that are that are calling this wreck home. But, you know, how do they get here? Are they, I feel like they would be preyed upon if they're moving on this, this desert environment until they get to a shipwreck. So do you see them moving a lot? Or, like, how do they actually get to these shipwrecks? I, I, that's, that's a, that's a great, great question. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> no, you first, Carol. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, you know, there's um, there's a lot of different ways that fish are getting there. Some of them might be, you know, spawned and, and born right on these shipwrecks or in nearby shipwrecks and then sort of drifting perhaps back and forth or able to move between shipwrecks if they're really close together. Um, in other cases, you know, it might be, eggs that are laid far away and drift with ocean currents and that are then hatching out at these, you know, very places that are far removed from where the eggs were spawned originally. Um, and the same with, you know, larger fish, you know, they might just be moving with the currents actively, but maybe storm events. Um, we know storms can sometimes move fish around, you know, when a, a strong current gets set up. So there's really no one size fits all. Um, it's really a variety um, of, of these mechanisms and part of perhaps why as these structures age, you know, the longer one of these reefs is in place, you know, some of them have more biodiversity over time in some cases. Um, but these are very complicated interactions. And now I'm going to let Avery um, chime in. <laughs> Sure. So we have another ecological expert who I don't think is on the phone line, but he's contributing in the chat. Um, and his name is Dr. Steve Ross. Steve has studied the animals that live on these shipwrecks um, in deep waters, shallow water. He's also studied rocky reefs uh, very prolifically. And Steve says that many of the tropical fish actually spawn as far north as North Carolina. Some others, he adds, drift up with the Gulf Stream currents, and once on a reef, they'll usually stay there. Um, and one of the other things that I'd like to add in here is that I, I do still think there's mysteries surrounding this, so it was a great question, um, Tane. But one of the ways that some of my collaborators are addressing this question is they're actually studying the sounds that occur on these reefs. 
And one of my collaborators, Rebecca Van Hoek at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, for example, is testing how the types of sounds that she hears. She puts an underwater microphone called a hydrophone out on rocky reefs, and she also puts them out on artificial structures. She's trying to understand how those sounds differ, and she has found out that they do, in fact, differ. And so one of the potential follow-up avenues is, are there um, sound cues that can attract or bring some of these fish to these sites? Um, and we're getting a beautiful glimpse of an urchin um, underneath a, another um, just brilliantly colored orange soft coral. Um, and, and again, these wrecks are just so alive with marine life. Um, and Steve, are you on the phone line? If you are, just um, maybe we can more formally introduce you. But if not, we'll love to get your feedback via the chat. And ROV pilots um, and GFOE team, it would be great if we could get some 4K video of this as well. Yeah, Avery, the, uh, I believe the, the primary feed is the 4K camera that is uh, being recorded on that. So that would be the bottom uh, oh, bot bottom left on the uh, on feed two should be the uh, primary feed. Oh my gosh, so we're getting a brilliant look at a grouper. Um, so this grouper has yellow around its mouth. We're waiting to see its tail, and it looks to me like this is a scamp grouper. Would you agree with that, Paula, based on its coloration, that yellow on the mouth and its distinctive broom tail um, shape? Yeah, yeah, I would. I would agree with that. Sometimes, I mean, there are yellow mouth grouper, too, that can sometimes be confused. But when you see that broom tail, um, you know, I always mm -hmm. consider that to be a scamp. Did you see that sea urchin, too, that, that, that was coming down? Those are pretty long spines, and you don't always see sea urchins with that long a spine on these wrecks. I, I thought that was a little bit unusual. That was earlier, though. Yeah, that was really interesting to oh, see. So and so for those watching, um, there were formerly two red dots that were appearing on the side of this grouper. Um, those are lasers that the ROV is outfitted with. So we're able to shine those lasers on the fish. We know the distance between the two points. And so knowing that, we can then calculate the length of this particular fish. So there we go again, um, those lasers showing up. And so one of the things that we're seeing is that fish are not only using the area around the wreck. We saw sand tigers and bait fish in the water column around the wreck. But now we're seeing that both small fish and big fish, like this grouper, are using some of these internal spaces in the wreck. Yeah, we're seeing some spectacular views here from the seafloor. We are on the World War II tanker, the E.M. Clark, at 260 feet on the seafloor, about 20 or so miles off the coast of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We're the Valor and the Atlantic Telepresence Project. It's a cooperative project between NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries and the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration. And GFOE, as they're known, are the ones who are providing this spectacular view that you hear we've all been talking about and excitedly uh, describing what we're seeing. They, Their engineers have designed these ROVs. They've built them. They brought all their equipment to the ship we're on, the NOAA ship, Nancy Foster. They installed it, bringing multiple semi-trucks here to unload and put this equipment on here. They have a satellite dish on the back deck that's beaming this to you around the world. So it's a fantastic project. We've got a series of experts with us here today. My name is Tane Casterly. I'm with NOAA's Monitor National Marine Sanctuary, and we protect the iconic Civil War ironclad. And to talk about the surrounding history we have here off North Carolina is Chris Southerly, an underwater archaeologist and with no, no excuse me North Carolina's Office of State Archaeology and a, you know a, a very close partner with NOAA and on the line we have other uh, partners as well and experts we have ecologist uh, Dr. Avery Paxton and Paula Whitfield from NOAA's National Centers for Ocean uh, Science uh, Coastal Ocean Science and um, do we also have a few more experts here Avery with us we do. We have Dr. Carol Price on the line from the North Carolina Aquarium. She is the conservation research coordinator for the aquarium system here in the state. 
And we also have a guest who's just joined us, Dr. Steve Ross from the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. And Steve has done a tremendous amount of exploration and foundational science in the field on deep shipwrecks and rocky reef habitats and the type of animals that inhabit them. Um, and Steve, I'm wondering if you can share with everybody today your initial thoughts on what you're seeing. Um, thanks, Avery. Uh, I just joined the call, so uh, you know these deep water wrecks are a really interesting because they're less explored than the shallow water wrecks that are within scuba depth. So you know what we find out here are that a lot of of animals are distributed is deeper on these wrecks than we maybe thought they were. Uh, lionfish is a good example. They occur, you know, deeper off North Carolina than they do in their natural habitat in the Pacific. Um, so we're finding that they've adapted to a, a wide range of conditions. And uh, I was kind of surprised to see the sharp-nosed puffer at this depth. Uh, I'm not sure I've seen them that commonly at, at these kinds of depths, but they're and here we're coming up on two lionfish now, it looks like. Um, so this is an example of why, you know, the lionfish are going to be almost impossible to eradicate now that they're here because they occur in such deep water and thrive here. Um, so, you know, that's some of my initial observations. This is an interesting wreck. Thank you, Steve. And as you were talking, a question came in in the chat about grouper. Um, somebody is wondering if grouper are territorial fish, and if perhaps they are territorial, could the scamp grouper that we just saw be the same individual that we observed on this wreck um, earlier this week? And um, Steve, do you want to try to take that question? Well, I could. I mean, you're an expert on groupers as well, Avery. Uh, so, uh, yeah, a lot of these reef fish are... are are territorial and habitat dependent. And as I said earlier, once they settle on a reef, a lot of these animals stay there because they're dependent on reef type habitats. So they don't move very far. A grouper might be an exception because they're a large fish and they're capable, of, you know, of significant movements. And they, there is an indication they move around, especially for spawning. Uh, but we also, they're also territorial uh, and they do stay put. There are a number of wrecks where we see consistent, you know, large aggregations of grouper, and while we can't tell if they're the same individuals, it does appear that they stay in, in a particular area for a long time. But they can Thank move so to much, other Steve. places, especially, especially the spawn. Sorry. Okay. Oh, no, that's perfect. And one of the things I was going to add is that a lot of research is now being done where fish can be tagged with um, tags that emit unique acoustic signals, and we can actually use that signal to track where the fish are on shipwrecks like this and whether they're moving from one shipwreck to another or from a shipwreck to a natural reef. Um, and we're working with collaborators at North Carolina State University right now to answer some of those questions on shallower reefs, looking at grouper and how um, strongly associated they are with particular structures, and we're able to contrast that with um, this idea that some of the larger predators may be moving, um, it, larger predators associated with the water column may be moving over longer distances from place to place. And so, Tane and Chris Southerly, we've talked a lot, and we're getting some really phenomenal um, videos of the organisms growing on the wreck structure. I'm wondering if you can talk about, from the archaeological perspective, what that growth means for the shipwreck state and degradation. I guess so. Yeah, sure, Avery. The uh, the as iron and steel corrodes in salt water, uh, especially, uh, it goes through a, a chemical process of the iron bonding with the the chlorides from the the salt water. And as that process happens, uh, it, it forms uh, what we call concretion uh, because it's, it's similar to concrete, very hard. And whereas you know, concrete has Portland cement, gravel, and sand, the, the marine concretion that forms has the, the iron corrosion product mixed with sand or shell or whatever else might be 
around it as as it begins to form and that uh, concretion encapsulates the the metal and in the process of doing that it helps to slow down the corrosion process and actually is preserving the wreck and you know, as in addition it's taking the relatively smooth steel pieces and creating a, a rougher texture which is ideal for the marine growth to to grab a hold of and continue to build on as a as a substrate so the really the 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 corrosion although it it degrades the shipwreck once it's encapsulated like this actually helps to protect it and and again provides a, a really nice textured substrate you know similar to, to some of the the rock ledges that we have offshore that the the marine growth can can form on so it's it's really a, a great way to to see the these shipwrecks whether they're down here as the em clark is as a as a casualty of warfare or whether they're done as part of a, an artificial reef program that various federal and state agencies will will do to to provide a substrate and a and a habitat for the the marine life So, and, and I think that's that's something Excellent. too. When, yeah, when I think too, when I, when I noticed when we were zoomed in on that that beautiful reddish purple gorgonian and earlier is like the hadn't noticed before, but but noticing the the little itty bitty tiny uh, puffer fish that were on there, you know, as, as a as a scuba diver, you know, seeing that is like really emphasizes the fact that that this is a a perfect. The structure here is a perfect protection and habitat for all of those juveniles, the, the tiny juveniles, to uh, to be able to grow to maturity that they, they may not have. You know, we've got lots of nooks and crannies on this wreck that may not necessarily be as abundant on, say, a natural reef environment, uh, you know, by comparison. Yeah, and Steve, while you're on the phone, I'd love your insight into that. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your observations, either here or previously, on um, how fish are able to seek refuge or provide or find food resources on these wrecks? Well, you know, one of the things that comes to mind is um, these shipwrecks are islands often in an area where there are no other resources. They often land on sandy bottoms that don't have any reefs. Uh, of course, there's an argument of, of, you know, to be made about whether or not that's a good thing, uh, whether it enhances the population or just concentrates animals. But having said that, you know, these wrecks, you know, do start to colonize pretty quickly with uh, invertebrates and attached uh, animals and if they're shallow enough, of course, algae, and the structure itself um, attracts lots of, of fish. So, uh, and the juveniles, you know, as, as we just said, it, you know, are looking for a place where they can shelter. Um, so it's and it's a multi, it's a multi-use sort of facility. You know, from you know the, the once the animals settle from the plankton. Uh, all the way through adulthood, um, there, you know, there are lots of, of uses both for shelter and food. Uh, one of the things I was going to say real quickly is there's an article that just came out in Smithsonian Magazine about how shipwrecks, in fact, the title is How Shipwrecks Shape the Seafloor. So it's, it's all about, it, that, that article is mostly about shallower wrecks, but um, it's, it's exactly along the topics that we're talking about now. It's, you know, what is the impact of wrecks on the seafloor? So it's a good article if people want to look that up. That's a great point, Steve, and it goes back to, I think, one of my favorite things about these shipwrecks is, like you said, they're these islands of habitat, almost an oasis for marine life. Um, in today's shipwreck, the E.M. Clark resting um, 260 feet underwater, this shipwreck is rising about 50 to 60 feet off of the sediment or the sand on the seafloor. So it is a monstrously tall habitat, but the size of it, even though it is such a large ship, 
um, in the sense of um, typical ship construction and length, it is still the small little piece of habitat on the seafloor. And so it's just pretty magical to see so many animals using it for their home. Um, on my screen right now, I'm looking at a beautiful school of vermilion snapper. Again, this distinctive color gives them away. Um, and like Paula was mentioning earlier, the particular shape and orientation of their body. Um, also seeing some lionfish mixed in and some other smaller cryptic, we call them, fish, and have been seeing glimpses of sand tiger sharks off in the distance, um, not as close up as they were earlier today, but still definitely, oh, I spoke too soon. And here's one that's very close. Um, and so, Dr. Carol Price, are you still on the line with us? And if so, I'm wondering if um, you can share some thoughts about sand tiger sharks again and how they're using these wreck structures. We've talked about lots of different possibilities, but wondering if you can summarize that for our viewers who have just joined. Sure. Um, yeah, so um, I study, for those just joining the call, um, I work for the North Carolina Aquarium, and one of the species that I study is sand tiger sharks, which are the large fish that you see. Sharks are fish, um, remember? And so the largest of the fish that we're seeing out there today are sand tiger sharks. Um, these are um, native to North Carolina. They grow to be, the adults are, you know, six to eight feet long, typically. They can get a little bit bigger than that, but the average size is in that range, um, with sometimes females maybe being a little bit larger. Um, and they are one of the species of sharks um, that divers uh, very, very often encounter um, out on the on the wrecks when people go to come from all over the world, really, to go dive and see these spectacular communities, as like we're seeing today. And many of them are treated to being able to dive with these you know, beautiful big sharks. Um, they're a favorite amongst divers because they are docile. Um, you know, they tolerate human activity and presence uh, very well. So you can um, be diving with, with these big sharks uh, right next to you. Um, and it's a real treat. Um, some of the other sharks are not quite so tolerant of humans and maybe dart away a little more uh, readily. Um, and another really interesting thing about sand tiger sharks is that when you see one sand tiger shark, you often see two, three, 10, 20, um, sometimes aggregations of, of maybe even hundreds of sharks um, congregating around these shipwrecks. And so we know that um, this kind of habitat is extremely important for this species. We know that they are gathering at these shipwrecks. Um, we're not completely sure why, um, but we think um, it has to do with their social structure. Um, and this is the time of year that this species of shark is um, thought to be mating um, off of our coast. We're not seeing any of that reproductive behavior necessarily during the daytime. Uh, we think it might be happening um, sort of when the lights go out. Um, but uh, we do think that this is important habitat for uh, reproduction. And we also know that there are some shipwrecks where we see these, uh, especially the female sharks, um, you know, later in the year when we think they're probably pregnant, um, that they're continuing to stay in North Carolina waters um, and perhaps even pupping um, around here. So we're still trying to get information about all of that. Some of this is speculation, hypotheses um, that we're working on. And so the research project that I work on, which is Spot a Shark USA. Um, you can find out about that online um, at spotasharkusa.com if you want to know more. But we do ask divers to come and uh, when they're out taking um, photographs of their adventures to take photographs of the sand tiger sharks and we can use the spot patterns on the sides of these sharks um, to identify individuals. Um, and then be able to track them over space and time. Oh, look at that beautiful guy. Um, so, you know, we, um, oh, look at those little tiny fish. It's amazing how close up these cameras can get. It's just amazing to see the detail um, that we get here. Um, and maybe we'll be able to, um, at some point, get a, a nice side shot of one of our sand tiger sharks and be able to see the spots along the sides 
so viewers can see what I mean by the spot patterns that are unique that we're using to so, identify these fish. So, folks, uh, if you're Thank if, you. if you're maybe seeing feed too, there there are uh, sand tiger sharks to the right hand side of the screen, and we're able to see the uh, spot pattern you described, Carol. That's perfect. That's great. Thank you, Tane. And so, Thank Steve, you. while we have you, um, can you explain to viewers what the behavior? So the red fish um, that Steve's going to describe that was in the bottom left of the main feed one. Uh, well, I, I mean, from the view we've we've got, it looks like the fish is just sheltering out of the current, and that that's one of the things that you see. Uh, it's another impact that these large shipwrecks have on the bottom is they they not only influence the bottom currents, which can be strong in this area, uh, so. That sometimes is a is a good thing in terms of delivering food and changing the turbulence of the bottom, but it also provides a, a you know on the down current side of a wreck provides shelter. And so it also a lot of these fish you'll see uh, using that to save energy. Uh, they can hover in the same uh, place you know without being buffeted by the currents. It sort of looks like that's what that snapper was doing, but. Um, it's hard to it's hard to tell exactly. And Tani and Chris Southerly, we've been talking a lot about the ecological value of these shipwrecks, but I'm wondering if we can transition a little bit and talk about how these close up views, like the one that we just had into the fan tail of the stern, um, may be able to help with some of your objectives and understanding more about um, this ship and its um, current state on the seafloor. I guess say, uh, yeah, Avery, absolutely. The uh, you know being able to get a a a, a long duration uh, close look like that of to to assess the the current condition of the shipwreck as as we start to see it degrading. You know, it's it's been on the bottom now since uh, March of 1942 when it was uh, you know torpedoed by the the U boat. And it's, you know, we're, we're able to, to look and get a, a really good visual assessment of the corrosion, uh, how, how the, you know, these, these would have been riveted ships rather than welded ships. So as you see the, the differential corrosion of, say, the, the rivets or the bolts to the, to the steel plates, um, you know, as, as the, you know, look at looking at the, the the fan tail and on parts of the the hull, you can see where like rectangular chunks seem to have fallen off and leaving the the windows, if you will, to look inside the vessels. Like the so that's some of the the plating falling off. So you know we we can look at that and observe that over time, compare it to what we've had uh, before when this wreck was visited by divers, and continue to monitor this into the. Uh, into the future with the future expeditions like this to look at the at the corrosion at the degradation of of this resource and then use this as a model to apply to other shipwrecks to compare compare the the deeper offshore wrecks to the the shallower nearshore wrecks to to really give us a work on getting a predictive model on what our um, durability would be on some of these shipwrecks as we look to at the bigger picture to, to manage all of the our submerged cultural heritage out here uh, that, that tells the story of, of people interacting with the sea and it's it's just uh, having having this technology is just invaluable to to collect all manner of data that can uh, contribute to, to the current study and, and future studies Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, well, well put and well said, Chris. Um, you know, and this is also uh, you know sort of the representation of the worldwide conflict that was World War II. You know, a lot of folks don't realize how close it came to our shores. This is direct evidence um, of the impact of the war. Um, this happens to be twenty or so miles from shore, but there's U-boat um, victims much closer to shore. You know, and the U-701 actually 
uh, was about a mile offshore in Virginia Beach. It mined the mouth of Chesapeake Bay, caused havoc up and down the coast. And that's just one example of the scores of U-boats that came here. So for those who, uh, who are um, uh, students of history, uh, you know, really looking at that, this is a perfect example of a World War II battlefield uh, on America's shores. It's incredible. And it just looking at this, for me, um, I just love and appreciate so much how this, this weapon of war is now turned into something completely different. You know, now we're enjoying it as the habitat, and uh, I just find it incredibly fascinating as a historian to see this change and this whole new life that's been breathed into this, this resource. And so, Tony, the wreck that we're looking at today of the E.M. Clark is about 260 feet underwater, um, and I'm wondering if Dr. Steve Ross can weigh in a little bit about what that what that depth zone is like. Um, are the animals and plants that we're seeing here today, I think I've seen a little bit of macroalgae, um, are those typical of this depth range? Or, um, yeah, what are your thoughts? Um, well, I, I said something earlier about uh, that. It, in, you know, we're, what we're finding is that the depth ranges of some of these animals are wider, uh, deeper than what, what we thought. Uh, there is, of course, a, a, a limit to that where you transition from um, outer continental shelf sort of fauna to the deep sea, continental slope, and, and deeper. Uh, and one of the things I was going to say is our technology now is allowing us to examine some really deep sh shipwrecks, and we, we can ask the same questions no matter what depth we're in, what's the impact of the wreck on the bottom, uh, and these, these questions are both archaeological and biological. You know, how is the shipwreck uh, uh, preserved? How, you know, how well is it faring? And, you know, one of the things that may be of interest is there's going to be a major um, expedition to the wreck of the, of the Titanic, uh, which lies in 3,800 meters of water. That's over 12,000 feet deep uh, off Newfoundland. And we ask some of the same questions with that expedition as we do here. Uh, that wreck is deteriorating rapidly. You know, what's causing that? Uh, how long do these shipwrecks last? The Titanic's been on the bottom now for 100 years. Um, and also, how does it function in the deep sea? Is it the same function as we see for these wrecks on the, on the continental shelf? So, it, you know, we're, allow it, we're now uh, able to expand our horizons, you know, quite a bit, which will give us a... A, a wider picture of what's going on in the deep sea. Uh, Thank you, Steve. I completely agree. And to me, that's one of my favorite things about studying shipwrecks is that there are these experimental networks, these multiple sites in different conditions, some shallow, some deep, some older, some more recent. Um, and so they're really just incredible places for us to be able to ask ecological questions. Um, and more so to be able to have this fusion of the ecology and the history. Um, and, Tani, I think you were about to say something. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, Avery. Well, I was going to tell Steve that, um, you know, I was on Titanic in 2019 with an expedition, and one of the things that struck me was uh, sort of the, the lack of the, the larger uh, marine life that I'm used to seeing in North Carolina on these somewhat, you know, quote-unquote shallower shipwrecks. Um, but it was a whole different environment down there, maybe on the macro level, that uh, I, I didn't quite appreciate till seeing it firsthand. It was it was fascinating. Yeah, the Titanic represents a, a whole different depth zone, and in, in, in you know, and in, in there, uh, there's food limitation probably there that doesn't exist on these shallower wrecks. Um, one of the thing tools we're going to use this summer is a, a new uh, five person. Um, manned submersible, which allows us to move around the wreck uh, more freely than an ROV. Um, and, and the main topic of this investigation is biodiversity in the deep sea. And we'll see a major contrast between that wreck at that depth and these kinds of shipwrecks. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it'll be great getting your, uh, your thoughts on that after that project is finished in comparison to what you're seeing today. And so, Steve, I wanted to pick your brain a little bit. We've heard from the historians and archaeologists how valuable the sort of footage we're getting today is, how we're able to have nearly unlimited bottom time, um, how we're able to connect 
with the um, anybody who's interested in visiting the website right now and viewing this footage, as well as experts like me, who I'm sitting in my home office in the coast of North Carolina. Um, and so I wanted to hear from your perspective as another ecologist, how what can we use this sort of footage for? We're going to be using it to assess patterns in fish communities over time, but what's your sense of that? Well, it's a it's an incredibly valuable resource because we can reach a broader audience. And I'm sitting in an office in Oregon, uh, even further away. Um, you know, one of the things that's improved over the years, all of us who have used video or visual uh, information to identify fish have struggled with with that. Um, it's very difficult to identify some of these fish visually, especially the deeper you go. Um, and our video tools have improved tr tremendously. I mean, some of this, this video is excellent quality, and the ability to zoom in and get very detailed, clear close-ups of some of these animals, uh, you know, allows us to identify things that we couldn't before. So, um, you know, now we can have people very experts in different fields dial in where normally, you know, when we go to sea, yeah, if we're lucky on a large ship, we may take a scientific crew of, you know, maybe 15 or 18 people at the at the best, and sometimes a lot less. Um, and that and they're usually focused on um, particular topics. Uh, so this allows us to, you know, have people focus on you know all sorts of things all at once. And that's another great point is that when we look at the ecology and biology of shipwrecks, we're not just focused on the sharks and the fish. Um, there are experts who study how benthic invertebrates, like the corals that we've been seeing, all of those animals growing on the structure, um, how they colonize and how they persist over time. Um, there's also colleagues whom we're working with who are studying the microbiome, so the microbial communities um, that are living on these shipwrecks. So they're truly habitat for a diversity of organisms from the smallest microbial um, organisms all the way up to these large predators that we've been seeing. And if people are watching the feed too, we're getting some great side views of sand tiger sharks again. Very nice. I, this is Carol Price. I'm I'm uh, very happy with how cooperative uh, these sharks are being in in terms of letting us see those uh, beautiful spot patterns. <laughs> and speaking of Dr. Carol Price, we're about to launch an interaction with the North North Carolina Aquarium at Roanoke Island. Um, Carol, can you tell us a little bit about the aquarium and uh, maybe what the audience is going to be uh, seeing today as they come into the auditorium there? Yeah, so I'm really glad you reminded me. I mean, time flies when you're having fun. You know, this is great fun for a marine biologist. I, time totally flew by, so thanks for that reminder. Um, yeah, so the North Carolina Aquarium has three facilities, uh, one in uh, Wilmington, at Fort Fisher, one in uh, Boat Banks at Pinal Shores. We also have an educational pier at Nags Head, and then we have um, the Roanoke Island uh, Aquarium there up in Manteo, North Carolina. Uh, we get over one million visitors to our sites every year, and um, our objective is to um, to spark uh, passion and enthusiasm for appreciating conservation of all of these uh, freshwater and marine um, habitats in, in North, North Carolina. These aquariums are primarily focusing on species that you can see in our state. Um, and today we will have um, the live feed streaming into our uh, theater there in Manteo, and the guests that are there will be able to ask questions through um, one of my colleagues, Paul Maisie, who is um, going to be leading uh, a, an activity there where people can watch the stream and then send me questions, and then I will um, project them out to, to the, everybody here that's on the call today to get those answers. So we um, should be getting people um, getting into the theater here in the next few minutes. It'll take them, you know, a little while to get settled. 
um, and kind of get a get oriented to what they're seeing and some background information from Paul about this amazing um, uh, collaboration between NOAA and the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration that's bringing us this live footage from the EM Clark today. So I'll uh, let you know when um, I start getting questions from Paul. Okay. Well, thank you uh, so much, Dr. Carol Price. So. Thank you, everybody who's joining us live on the Internet around the world. And for those of you uh, streaming into the theater at the Roanoke uh, Aquarium with the North Carolina Aquarium System, uh, welcome. You have joined in progress the Valor in the Atlantic Telepresence Expedition. This is a, a cooperative uh, project with NOAA and the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries and the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration, or GFOE. Now, GFOE is the one that's really making this all possible to what you're seeing today. They design these remotely operated vehicles, the ROVs, they built them, they're piloting them right now on the ship that we're on, and they also provided the satellite capability, so they trucked you know, two or three large semi-trucks worth of equipment here um, to Charleston where our project mounted. They unloaded the vessels, put it on the NOAA ship Nancy Foster, which we're on right now, and they set everything up to what was a bare bones operation if now flushed with almost looks like a NASA control center. Um, so again, they are making this possible to bring you this live images. I'm Tane Casserly. I'm a maritime archeologist and historian with NOAA's Monitor National Marine Sanctuary. I'm joined on the ship by underwater archeologist Chris Sutherland, and he's with North Carolina's Office of State Archeology, span our partner in all this, telling the shipwreck story. Uh, but this is also a biological story, it's an ecological story, and we've got our partners at the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science, Dr. Avery Paxton and Paula Whitfield, and of course, we couldn't do this right now with the aquarium without Dr. Carol Price. And uh, Avery, do we have any more uh, ecological experts on the phone? We do. Dr. Steve Ross from the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, um, an expert at deep sea exploration and biology, is also on the line today. Um, so, Carol, have any questions come in yet from the aquarium visitors, or are they um, getting oriented to the rec site? I think they're still getting oriented. I'm, I'm waiting for uh, Paul Mavey, um, who's one of the educators at the aquarium. He's the one um, sort of leading this um, activity from the aquarium side. So he's going to be sending me questions. Um, through our own uh, sort of chat system to make sure that um, I can ask those questions live here and get those um, answered by all of the experts here today. So as soon as he starts sending me some questions, I will um, pop up with, with those. Um, but certainly, uh, you know, just giving, you know, the folks there some background about this expedition and this um, that, you know, which, which ship we're looking at, where are we right now, um, helping them get a little oriented. Um, you know, this, this ship is, is pretty close to where they are, uh, you know, maybe not so close in terms of uh, distances that we think, but um, think of, but um, fairly close off there, off of the outer banks, um, but hard to get to. Uh, this isn't a place that the average human can easily uh, get to and explore on their own, so this is a really great opportunity to be able to share with the public um, the amazing resources that we have right here off of our coast and to highlight the um, biodiversity value of these shipwrecks. So a, a great, um, you know, coming together of history and archaeology, obviously technology that brings us here, um, that, that makes this all possible. Um, and then the amazing biology that we're all getting to see here. Yeah, exactly. Well said, Carol. So uh, for our audience today, uh, we are on the World War II tanker, the E.M. Clark. Now, the E.M. Clark was lost um, from a U-boat attack on March 18th of 1942. It was attacked by the U-124, who shot two torpedoes at it, and it went down um, very quickly. Off the, off the coast of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. We're approximately 20 miles or so offshore, and we're in 260 feet of water. Uh, there was one loss of life during the sinking. Uh, thankfully, all the rest of the crew got off the ship, but there was one poor individual who was in the ship's hospital um, just above where the torpedo exploded, the first torpedo, and um, he lost his life. But thank goodness everybody else got off the ship. But 
you know, so we're talking about the shipwreck, um, the, the, the fish, the marine life that call this home. And, you know, this is a representation of that World War II's Battle of the Atlantic on our seafloor, just off our shore. And just a testament how close that war came to the United States. Um, so it's fantastic. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, Carol, any, any maybe thoughts or questions from the audience in uh, Roanoke Island? So Paul has just let me know that um, he's giving everybody a, what he's calling a moment of silence for people to just sort of, I guess, watch and absorb what they're seeing and sort of become centered in, in that space. Um, and so typically it takes a, a couple of minutes and then the questions will start rolling in. Um, you know, one of the questions we've gotten in the past uh, when we've been doing these um, live feeds uh, for, in collaboration with the aquariums is, why are we doing ROV? Why not go scuba diving? What are some of the benefits of ROV expeditions compared to sending live divers down to uh, gather, you know, video data in that way? So maybe we can talk about that while we're waiting for questions to roll in. Maybe it's a good one for Chris Sudley. You want to share, at least from the archaeological standpoint, uh, why this technology is, is a benefit to us? Uh, absolutely. The One of the things with the, the depth of this shipwreck being 260 feet to the sand is that the, uh, the training and qualifications of the divers to be able to do this safely, there's the, a small percentage of of divers that would even be uh, safely capable of making a dive on this wreck and you add to that because of the depth and the physical limitations of the divers uh, the bottom time that they would have on on the wreck would be 20 maybe 25 minutes and then have to go through a, an elaborate process of ascending back to the surface doing safety stops with for decom taking time for decompression uh, to return back to the surface. So the the bottom, t the biggest benefit here with using the ROV is that a diver's bottom time is very limited. Um, you know, even if you're putting you know six or eight divers down as part of the dive team uh, to cover the wreck, uh, it's it's not a lot of not a lot of bottom time. And with the ROV, we can spend virtually unlimited time uh, on station on this wreck. Uh, looking in every nook and cranny, getting high definition video, 4K video in some cases of, of what we're looking at to be able to record that and then do the analysis back uh, either live aboard the ship or after the fact. And the, the, other RO, the other benefit of the ROV is exactly what you're seeing today is you know, we have a team of engineers from GFOE, about 10 engineers on board, uh, Tane and myself as uh, archaeologists and historians uh, that are physically here on board the ship. Uh, but we're able to stream this out almost live. We have a five to eight second delay from what we're watching to what you all are watching, you know, there in the auditorium at the aquarium or sitting at home on your iPad or your you know, your tablet or your phone, however you're watching. So we can bring in, uh, like, in uh, subject matter experts like Dr. Ross, uh, like Dr. Avery Paxton, uh, Carol, yourself, to, um, to witness this live and comment on that for us. So it's, it's just tr a tremendous benefit for us. Thanks. Um, so I've, I, this is Carol. I've got a couple of questions, uh, really great questions, uh, coming in from the Roanoke Island Aquarium visitors. Um, so one of the questions was, what happened to the oil when the boat sank? Um, well, Do we that, know um, so, uh, about anything like that? Does environmental impact at the time? So that that's a great question. Um, the bottom line is we don't know. You know, we, we haven't seen any indication of oil or fuel on the shipwreck now. Uh, historically, this shipwreck hasn't had any reports of leaking oil or fuel. So the bottom line is we just don't know. But, you know, during these the sinking events off um, the Outer Banks from World War II, very violent. Um, this ship, this particular ship didn't burn, but it did roll. Um, some of these wrecks 
broken half. So um, the bottom line is there's more to learn about what's going on out here. But for this particular shipwreck, uh, we're unsure, but we have never at this point seen any indication of uh, fuel or oil on the vessel. Well, thanks for that. Um, so um, another question is um, about how many species have we documented? Um, and I, I'm, with the question, I'm not sure if they just mean um, today or in the past, but um, maybe this is something that um, I know Paula, who's one of those um, NOAA divers that's visited this vessel and has a lot of experience, um, you know, with fish communities and documenting those. Maybe Paula and Avery can talk a little bit about how many species of fish and organisms we might expect to see that have been documented or that we might expect to see. Carol, could you please repeat that question? My God, I dropped off the phone call. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, one of our questions is about how many species we've documented. And I know um, you and Paula have dove this wreck, and there's some historical information perhaps from previous surveys about how many species of fish and other marine life um, that maybe have been documented here, or maybe even just how many you've seen um, as we've been watching this wreck today. That's a really... Um challenging question, actually. So today, I can estimate um, that we've probably seen about two dozen different species of fish. Um, the ones we're looking at right now are lionfish. They are an invasive species in the area. Um, they're really distinctive. They almost look like they have frills on them. Um, they have venomous spines and can eat a lot of the um, kind of unsuspecting reef fish that we see. Um, as far as the sheer number, um, I, again, I'll make that estimate of about two dozen, but I think the point I want to stress is that this site is just such a, um incredible habitat. It's an island of structured habitat created by this vertically extensive um, and very long shipwreck on the seafloor. Um, and I'll let my colleague, Dr. Steve Ross, weigh in a little bit more there. Steve, um, do you have a good estimate of approximately how many species you would usually see on a wreck like this? Um, I, I know it obviously depends on depth and things of that nature, but I'm wondering if you have a kind of average number in your head, perhaps. Um, maybe. <laughs> uh, you know, one, yeah, one of the problems you pointed out is that the numbers of species change with depth, and in general, at least for fish especially, the number of species start to decline as you go deeper. Uh, above shallower than 200 feet on a, a lot of well-developed reefs, including shipwrecks, we've probably documented over 300 species of fish. So that doesn't mean you'd see all 300 on every site, but it means the pool of available species is, you know, 300 to 350 species, and that includes you know, the pelagic ones that use the wreck. As we go deeper than 200 feet, um, I'm not sure we have as good of information to, you know, create a, you know, a solid number, but I would guess it would drop to more like 40 to 50 species of fish we might expect to find at this depth r related to the wreck. It, it could be higher. Uh, we're still investigating wrecks at this depth, but, you know, hopefully that at least gives a ballpark. Thank you, Steve. And one of the other things I'll add is that in the aftermath of this mission, from the ecological side, we will thoroughly review all of this footage and um, count the number of species that we see, and um, we may also um, identify the number of each species, so not only which species are there, but how many of each, and we can use some of the imagery that the ROV has collected today that has lasers. Um, where we've shined those lasers onto the fish to estimate some of their sizes. Um, so lots of post-processing work that we'll do to really um, get a better understanding of the ecology of these special habitats. And, and for those folks at home in, in, the, uh, in the auditorium of the theater at Roanoke Island, I want to describe what you're seeing. So the tanker E.M. Clark is actually laying on its side. It's lying on its port side, which is the left side of the vessel. And what you're seeing in your screens is actually the, uh, the E.M. Clark's rudder. 
So it's a very large, about 15 foot long rudder. And just beyond that, you can see the very large uh, propeller and each one has about a six foot blade on it. So the vessel is approximately 500 feet long and about 60 to 65 feet, perhaps off the seafloor, maybe a little bit less, but just, just gigantic. And it did take two torpedo hits in World War II. Um, Carol, uh, any more questions from the audience? Yeah, um, we do. We have a, uh, a couple of interesting questions. One is, um, uh, do we remember an instance when a shark became very curious and came close to Yogi? Um, so certainly we've seen a couple of great um, shots of the shark, you know, swimming straight towards the camera. Um, those are, you know, just spectacular and very fun to see that. Um, Y'all, you know, obviously spent a lot more time looking out at these views. Um, you know, how, how frequently are the sharks or other fish coming right up to that camera? And, you know, are, are we worried that they're going to, you know, perhaps damage any of this equipment? Oh, speak of the devil. You'll see something in just a moment here on the quad view. Um, Avery, that's a good question for you. <laughs> yeah. Speak of the so, devil, um, right? <laughs> So sometimes the sand tiger sharks are very curious. So one of the things we take great care at is making sure we're not disturbing them. So all of the movements made by the remotely operated vehicle are very slow and controlled. Um, and we aim to do no harm to the shipwreck, the marine life, or um, any other organism that may be um, encrusting the wreck or on the seafloor. Um, and so I'll let the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration weigh in a little bit more on the equipment side of that. Um, one of Carol's questions was, is there concern that if a shark does bump into the ROV, it could damage the equipment? Yeah, for one of our ROV pilots, if you're ready to answer that. And they may not be able to just quite at the moment. Um, are there more questions, Carol, that we could help answer for your audience? Uh, I just wanted to point out a beautiful angelfish that just swam by. Sorry, I had to do that. Um, one of the questions that I got was, you know, what is the best part of your job? Um, and I think that's really a question for all of us on the call. Um, certainly, you know, this is great. I mean, for me, this is just such a treat to be able to see this. And, you know, one of the other great parts of my job is I get to work with a lot of young students um, who are just starting out um, their careers in marine science and so um, being able to work with them and um, you know teach them and, and you know inspire them um, to get into this field um, those are probably the two best parts of my job hmm. and I can weigh in there that for me I've always loved mysteries and I've always loved science and in being a scientist one of my favorite parts is that we get to make observations and pose questions or um, find mysteries that remain, and we try to answer them. So we're kind of like science detectives. Um, and I know that answer may sound cliche, but it's what leads us to sites like this, right, to try to understand how the fish are using these cultural resources, these shipwrecks, for their home um, and to document the diversity of life that is here. So for me, no two days are ever the same, and it's the ability to pose these fascinating questions and then be able to um, obtain the evidence to help answer them. That's really intriguing. Um, what about you, Steve, also from the ecology side, and then maybe we can transition to the archaeologist. Well, yeah, probably one of the things that people don't realize is that scientists spend an awful lot of time at their desk analyzing data and writing grants and, write, and writing reports. And for me, you know, you know, the best part of the job is going to see and collecting the data. And to follow along, what Avery said is, is, especially the deeper you go, almost every dive and every sample has something new in it. Um, and when you're operating in even deeper depths than this, almost everything you see is something that that nobody has seen before. Um, and that's very exciting because it's, it's difficult, as Avery says, these are mysteries, you know, to try to figure out 
Right now we're looking at some gorgonians or uh, small black corals. I think they are sticking up off the wreck. You know, what are they feeding on? You know, why are they there? Is that a new depth range or a new geographic range for these animals? So there are you know, lots of discoveries in these deep water areas. Yeah, I can say from the archaeological standpoint, um, this is a uh, tonic castle, Noah's Modern National Marine Sanctuary, that we've been lucky enough to be part of several of these types of expeditions. And what struck me is that that sense of awe as we're seeing some of these resources for the first time, you know, not just the marine life, but maybe a ship you've been looking for for years, you finally see it in front of you. And that sense of excitement and accomplishment I have, it, it was such a small group on the ship to share it with. So for me... Uh, now, my emphasis and the joy I get from work is sharing it with the public live, just like we're doing now. So we could reach people um, in underserved communities, you know, folks that uh, have maybe difficulty uh, finding this as a possibility for a career path. You know, we're showing them that anybody can do this and inject at almost any level. You know, we're sharing this from the ocean floor to outer space and everything in between. We need to have support systems there to help make these projects happen. So anywhere from the Twitter feeds we're doing now, the photography, video production, the engineers, of course, the scientists and experts we have on the line, but you know, it takes a team to do this. So for me to share this in real time, that that's where I find joy and include more folks in this real time exploration. And how about you, Chris? I guess say yeah, absolutely. I I would echo the feelings that everybody's expressing here, but for you know, for me, it's like you know the you know, we we do spend a lot of time doing administrative aspects of our jobs, so the opportunity to get out in the field, uh, to work on projects like this, to actually be part of the exploration and the discovery, to, to be the, the first person or a small group of people to, to see these things and to experience it firsthand and the, to, to see and discover the new th aspects of it. And the it is the you know tani has mentioned tani has mentioned before that you know a lot of what we do as an archaeologist is like crime scene analysis we're taking and looking for pieces of evidence about the the shipwreck how the shipwreck went down some of the details what's left over to help tell the story you know we have the written account but can we expand on that story with by looking at the shipwreck itself looking how the the ship has broken down on the on the seabed to to help tell that story and then to bring that story to a, a broader audience it's the whole reason why we do what we do as an archaeologist is not just for personal satisfaction but to tell the bigger story to tell the story of the merchant sailors that were on board this vessel that ex what they experienced as it went down and tell the bigger picture of how close the war came to North Carolina it's, it's all about the people and the stories for me. Exactly. And uh, I just want to point folks to feed number two. Um, maybe this gets to what you know our ecologist has been saying. And for you, Carol, and the audience there in Roanoke Island, you'll see the sonar view with our blue view. And you can see all those little silvery shapes. And that's all the marine life that's here that's all over the place. But it's just sort of a, a really spectacular view of um, all the fish you can see in real time on the sonar. Um, Carol, do you have some more questions for us? I'm waiting to hear from um, Paul in the theater right now. Um, I've sort of gone through the questions, the first round of questions that he sent me. Um, so, but it looks like he might have a, a few more coming in. So, uh, if you give me just a minute, I'll see if I've got some more questions coming. Great. And while we see if more questions are going to come in, I was going to take a second and orient viewers to what we're seeing on um, view two, feed two. So like Tane said, that's an imaging sonar. It's mounted on the remotely operated vehicle and is looking out. It's kind of like a, the equivalent of an ultrasound, except underwater. Um, and as you go from the very bottom of that screen where you see that black semicircle, it expands out into a fan, and that's getting us further from the ROV. So we have um, distances. Um, we have two meters, we have four meters, six meters, eight meters, ten meters going out from the ROV. And we can see some of the bait fish, like Tane was talking about, those um, brightly colored um, or brightly toned um, spots. You can also see some of the sharks, which are kind of oscillating on this feed. There's one coming into view right now. You can get that shadow, and it's a really 
um, elegant way for us to be able to um, measure actually and understand how some of these organisms are swimming, but it also provides the ROV pilots with an um, additional way of seeing. Um, so they're able to see some of the wreck structure that may not be apparent from the field of view um, of the remotely operated vehicle's video on its own. So really powerful technology. Yeah, exactly. And we can actually see part of the rudder assembly on the radar, on uh, the sonar, excuse me, um, that we're seeing in the live feed. So uh, again, it's it's a very powerful tool uh, for navigation and for the archaeologists as well. We're very lucky today that we've got fantastic visibility, but imagine if we couldn't see essentially our hand in front of our face down there. So that's where that technology really comes its into, our, in, into its own to become um, um, a viewing platform for, for scientists, but also for safe navigation. And again, that's another very complex tool that the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration has brought to the table. I guess so. Yeah, absolutely. It's like because you've got the range on the uh, on the forward-looking sonar there, so you know you can see we've got the we're about four meters from the the hinge, the pintles and gudgeons on the uh, on the rudder, and a little further out with the uh, the bright spot um, in the about the six six on the six to seven meter range is is where part of the propeller is the the point that central point on the propeller. So it, it really gives with the working with the current and the navigating around the site uh, lets the the primary pilot who's uh, flying Yogi to to know exactly how close they are because the the last thing we want to do is is have a physical impact on on the wreck or on the marine life uh, or to potentially do damage to the ROV. Uh, and, and Carol, if you look at the feeds, we're getting some great views of the size of the sand tiger sharks with their spots. Yeah, I'm absolutely seeing that. Of course, it's making my, you know, just makes me so excited to see that. Um, you know, we've gotten some really great um, comparison shots um, of males and females coming by. So um, for those people who are interested in learning more about how you can uh, figure out if you're looking at a male or a female shark, um, on the males, you can see there um, they have uh, reproductive uh, re appendages um, sort of at the bottom of their bodies towards the back. Um, those are called claspers, um, they're sort of large and white. Um, they have two of those, and here's a female swimming by, and you can tell she doesn't have those. And so that's how you can um, tell adult sand tiger male and female sharks apart. Um, I'm loving this view across that beautifully rippled sand. This is a very, um, very beautiful view that we're getting right now. And do we have any more questions, Carol, from the audience there at Roanoke Island? I'm, I'm not seeing any. I, I think we might have had a few technical issues. I'm, I'm not quite sure. Um, I've been sort of uh, texting back and forth with Paul there in the theater, um, but I think for now we are um, probably wrapping up getting questions from the folks there at Roanoke Island. Okay. Well, we, we were talking before about what phenomenal resources we have off the coast of North Carolina. Um, the shipwrecks are just one of them, but as we can see here, they're fantastic for scuba divers, whether you love our history, if you love marine life. Um, it's just, it's a fantastic view. It almost feels like I'm, I, I am physically at the aquarium at Roanoke Island. Uh, it feels like some sort of scene that you would see there that's set up, but this is a natural environment. And uh, I just can't believe just this, the, I'll call it the majesty of what we have on our screens right now. And yeah, Monet, I'll echo that. Um, I was going to say that in the, the quad view right now, there's a beautiful um, pretty wide angle view that shows these sand tigers are gliding around the wreck, some hovering or looking like they're hovering off the sand, vermilion snapper, um, schooling mixed with some tompate, and in certain portions it's almost like the fish are obscuring our view of the wreck, um, which to me just is another indication that these shipwrecks are so alive with marine life. It's yeah, that, really that, visually stunning. That quad view, if our videographers are capturing this, because this is a fantastic shot of, again, of 
everything that we want to see on these shipwrecks is right in front of us, especially maybe on the HD cameras. These are absolutely stunning shots. I'm so glad we we're able to share these shots with the uh, the North Carolina Aquarium at uh, Roanoke Island. Yeah, it looks like we, we got our technical um, issues worked out, um, it, and it uh, and so the folks are still there, I believe, um, but I know wrapping up their session there, um, so I did just want to thank my colleagues there, and um, if they can see, we're seeing some of that behavior from the sand tiger sharks that we talked about earlier, of these um, sharks that seem to be rolling in the sand, um, maybe rubbing parts of their body um, in that sandy substrate adjacent to the shipwreck. And, you know, we're not really sure why they do that. Um, maybe removing some external parasites that might be, um, you know, attached to them and maybe a little itchy, or maybe it just feels good to roll around in the sand. We really don't know. But it's uh, just so amazing to watch these animals um, doing doing what they do. Um and uh, seemingly really unperturbed by the presence of these cameras down there that are just giving us this, um, you know, great opportunity to peek inside the, the life of this shipwreck in real time. Yeah, well said, Carol. Thank you. And you guys are about to see a great view on the, the quad cam of a shark coming quite close. Well, I want to make sure I thank everybody that uh, tuned in today, and especially the, the audience that we had in person talking to live at the uh, Roanoke Island Aquarium, part of the North Carolina Aquarium System. Um, you know, a fantastic partner with NOAA, the Monitor Nash Marine Sanctuary. We actually have a, a quarter scale monitor shipwreck in a sand tiger shake, uh, uh, in a sand tiger shark tank there, as well as the ironclad uh, sanctuary exhibit and so much more. So thank you so much for joining us today. Some more great shots of yeah, sand tigers. Thanks to my colleagues um, in the aquarium for helping to make this happen and um, really bringing this to the public um, in a in a different way. You know, in addition to this being live streamed, you know, offering this as an um, activity for people who just came to the aquarium today. You know, with their family to learn a little bit about North Carolina's aquatic resources. Um, this is a great extra bonus that they perhaps weren't expecting. So I really appreciate my colleague um, taking the time to um, set this up and um, make this sort of like interactive times two. <laughs> Absolutely, it's phenomenal. So we're just holding station here as we're just letting these sand tigers swim across us and just getting this fantastic view on our, our, our quad view here. I guess as it's been noted. I think I, can we request a 4K view of um, the sharks on feed one, please? Uh, roger that. It's being done now. Perfect. Go ahead, Carol. Yeah, so I, I wasn't really sure. I was kind of looking at one of the other feeds, but it seemed like out of the corner of my eye there on feed one that it looked like there was a small group of, was, did I see a small group of fish kind of congregating around the head of one of those sand tiger sharks for a minute, or was I just imagining things? Um, I may have missed that particular glimpse, but it wouldn't surprise me if some of the bait fish were schooling around the sand tiger shark. As you know, sometimes we'll see that behavior. Um, one of my colleagues, Nick Coleman, um, has done some work studying previously collected um, videos of sand tiger sharks and observing the behavior of the sharks relative to the schooling fish and has noted some really interesting associations that suggest that there may be benefits um, where the sharks are almost able to hide um, using this cloak of bait fish. Um, and some of our team's work has shown that there's a halo of influence around these sharks where by having a shark on a wreck, you can have a greater variety of fish types in its immediate vicinity. So lots of really intriguing behavior that we're seeing, um, and some of which we don't fully understand the motivation or explanation for. So just another reason that we'll be able to um, hopefully untangle some of these things using the video footage collected today and previously during the mission. 
And one thing I will also say is that the glimpse we're getting today, the snapshot provided by the remotely operated vehicle video footage of the dive on the EM Clark is showing fish, some of which are similar to what we observed on this same wreck site a few days ago, but some species we didn't see a few days ago. And so every time we are able to have the opportunity to get eyes on these shipwrecks underwater, we're able to learn something new. Um, and to me, that's one of the most special parts about what we're doing. And I want to, I want to point out, Avery, that we've uh, been talking to the ROV pilots, and we're going to move the ROV, if we can, uh, back up to sort of on top of the hull. I want to uh, remind folks that we're on the shipwreck of the E.M. Clark. It's a World War II tanker that was sunk by the U-124 in 1942. Um, the ship is on its laying on its port side in the sand, which is the left-hand side, and the right-hand side, starboard side, is up facing the surface. So, Avery, we're actually going to be hoping to move the ROV up on top here, move forward a little bit, and maybe get some additional views that we're getting a little bit earlier in the day, if that works for you. Oh, that would be wonderful, and I'd love to preemptively request that we record some of this in 4K. I think these views are going to be pretty remarkable. Roger that. We're getting the thumbs up. And and I'm just observing what we're seeing here, but I'm seeing, to me, here on the ship, uh, the schools of fish have seemed to be moved towards the stern here, where they were a little bit more forward, and we're seeing more more life on the stern now. Yeah, it's absolutely incredible how dynamic these habitats are. Um, we could be looking now and look one minute um, before now, one minute into the future, and we might see very different um, behaviors. I'm seeing sharks mixed in with jacks, mixed in with schools of fish that are usually eating plankton out of the water column. Those would be vermilion snapper most prominently that we're seeing right now. And Dr. Steve Ross from University of North Carolina, Wilmington, is on the line. Steve, what's your impression of the fish behavior that we're seeing right now on the screen? Uh, well, it's pretty typical of, you know, what you'd see on a high-profile reef is, you know, the vermilions uh, up in the water column and mixed schools of fish, you know, layered around the wreck. So, um, you know, this is a, uh, an amazing density of uh, vermilion snapper, which is a uh, an important commercial uh, reef fish, uh, in, especially off North Carolina. So it's, it's this this wreck, uh, you know, one of the things that that I mentioned earlier is that these deep water uh, reef habitat uh, in these deeper areas is is less abundant than maybe in some of the shallower areas. So these wrecks represent an important uh, habitat resource that otherwise would not be there. And along that same line of thinking, oftentimes these shipwrecks, which form these islands of habitats, are almost like rest stops that we know um, large predators like sand tiger sharks can use as they move from place to place. So imagine I were to hop in my car right now in North Carolina and drive to Maine. I would need to fill up on gas. I would need to rest. Um, and we think the same thing may be happening with these shipwrecks. They're providing habitat in areas that sometimes may not normally have hard structured habitat that these fish can use for resting, um, or other words, seeking refuge, finding prey resources, um, and all sorts of other life functions, perhaps like reproducing. Um, and so, again, a lot of mysteries remain around how fish are moving from place to place, how long some of these fish may stay around this particular wreck, what they do at nighttime, and later in the mission we're hoping or planning to get eyes underwater um, with the remotely operated vehicles at night to try to understand a little bit about what's going on behaviorally during this other time. And I want to point out something interesting. And that so, Tane, as we... Oh, I'm sorry. Switch, oh, I was going to ask you, as we switch views here um, and go on to the side of the rack, the um, the tallest portion of it, are you noting anything different um, structurally? than? What no, it looks the same to me. What I was going to note, though, uh, especially for the ecologists, is I've seen sharks. We've seen them swim on top here, moving with the currents that are on the seafloor, but I've also seen them sort of swim directly out, dart out, uh, vertically coming out of these large gaps we're seeing in the hull. And that it always seems fascinating to me where, um, I know as a scuba diver on that shipwreck, when that would happen, I would 
give me a bit of a start because I wasn't expecting to see them come up vertically like that at me. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a really, really interesting. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you go ahead, Carol. <laughs> um, yeah, that's one of the really interesting things about this species is that, um, you know, they, they seem very comfortable, um, really tucked inside of some of these wreck structures, um, not just on the E.M. Clark as we're seeing today, but on other shipwrecks where we have rather large openings, um, you know, that go into the um, body of the, of the wreck. This seems to be a shark species that doesn't mind. Um, being in close quarters, um, and I can, um, you know, yes, as a diver, you know, that probably would give you quite a startle. Um, but fortunately, this is a, a shark species that's, uh, you know, very kind to divers, and, uh, you know, we're, we probably startle them sometimes just as much as, as they startle us. Um, but it's, um, you know, something about this species also, as we've talked about earlier, this species can um, hover. Um, you know, they don't have to be continuously swimming really fast to be able to get water across their gills for oxygen. And so perhaps that's part of the explanation of why they feel, you know, comfortable in these tighter quarters um, where perhaps larger sharks or, you know, the more pelagic sharks um, uh, may just not want to get inside something that's so close and confined. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I was going to say, one of the things from um, NOAA's office of Nashville's, Nashville's Sanctuary standpoint is uh, working with our partners like North Carolina's Office of State Archaeology and, uh, you know, to look at these wrecks archaeologically and historically, because obviously they're incredibly important to that uh, that world story of this worldwide conflict of World War II. But, you know, we, we recognize that NOAA is an ocean agency and they're not just shipwrecks. You know, they, they are habitat. They are important to this ecosystem and perhaps you know looking at uh, climate science and things the shipwrecks themselves can tell us some things about how if the environment is changing so we're we're working with more and more experts just like we have on the phone right now to really look at these shipwrecks with all of those viewpoints then because they are just so much more um, than just history but the history itself is incredibly important um, you know and Chris suddenly uh, what do you think about that from the North Carolina standpoint I can say uh, absolutely and it's you know we kind of have the same it, within the state system have a, a very similar structure uh, my office the, the office of state archaeology is uh, our overall parent department within this state is the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources and you know, natural cultural resources also incorporates uh, the aquarium system where Carol is. So, you know, we are able to to look at these resources uh, that affect the the citizens of North Carolina, the really with the ocean, the citizens of the world, and do a, as much of a big picture, comprehensive interpretation. Clark, uh, this would be the the side in the water column. Uh, the ship is laying on, it, on its port side. Uh, seeing the species of snapper and some of the, the smaller schooling and uh, schooling fish. Seeing sand tigers in the, uh, in the background uh, on some of the feeds. And just some, some amazing views that we're seeing here. So this Carol, I, I just have a quick question. Um, you know, one of the questions I get a lot from people is, you know, are the sharks orienting to the current? Are they hanging out on the leeward side of the shipwreck? Um, and those sorts of questions about how, um, you know, the the oceanographic conditions that the that are you know at the wreck at the time, how are those um, affecting or directing the animal's behavior? And so. You know, a, a couple a couple minutes ago, we kind of noticed that there seemed to be a movement of this big school of fish um, from the uh, up towards the stern. I think I can't remember exactly, but did y'all happen to notice a shift in currents or anything like that um, around that same time, or did was it all sort of static and just the fish moved, but we don't necessarily know why. Well, let's bring in the pilots, the ROV pilots from GFOE, and you folks maybe talk about 
some of the challenges you've had moving around the rack and if you're if you've seen that changing current in the in the how the ROV had to adapt. And they're about to come on. Hello, can you hear me? Gotcha. Yep. Loud and clear. Hi, this is uh, John Mefford with GFOE. I'm currently sitting navigator with the co-pilot Sean Kennison and the pilot Lars Murphy. Uh, we've been for the last little while now navigating around the stern of the M. Clark and uh, it's been a precarious dance um, for sure. We have really strong surface and bottom currents. We're seeing about two knots of current on the surface and down below. In the lee of the ship we're still seeing about half a knot or so and as we move around the stern of the M. Clark we have to uh, pay attention to how the current is affecting both of the vehicles. The closer we get to it, the vehicles sometimes drop lower and closer to the ship, so we have to pay extra careful attention that, uh, of the range to the ship and make sure we don't bump into anything. And the pilot is taking extra precaution as he lines up for these beautiful shots that you're seeing on the screen. Um, and so it's a very coordinated dance between the three of us and also uh, coordinating with the ship and the officers on the bridge to make sure that we keep the vehicle safe and uh, are also getting the shots that science requires. So, it, Maybe for our, our ecologists, we're seeing a lot of activity here uh, on the quad feed, if you guys are seeing that. We are Absolutely. not fully seeing that. Um, we're seeing, oh wow, yes we are now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, we're seeing the Amber Jack and Almaco Jack. Um, they look like they're trying to corral some of these smaller schooling fish. Um, this is a behavior that seems to me like it's gearing up for some sort of predation event. Um, we also have the sand tiger sharks starting to exhibit a little more movement. Um, and again, such a dynamic um, view that we're looking at right now, the shipwreck. So maybe if you can help our audience, Avery, what is it those those larger predator fish are doing to those the smaller fish as they come darting through and everybody starts moving around like a flock of birds? Yeah, that's a great analogy. Um, Steve Ross, do you want to answer that one? Um, well, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that. Um, you know, one of the things that is interesting about this is you see predators and prey swimming around in the same vicinity, uh, almost in the same space with, without really apparent interaction. Um, and then all of a sudden, that can change. Um, you know, we, we've seen a number of uh, times I've been on a wreck where you'll see scenes like this, large numbers of small fish and predators like amberjack and sharks. And then all of a sudden they herd smaller fish into a ball and start eating them, and th then it stops. So it's it's a it's kind of interesting how quick things can change. It, all, right now everybody seems happy getting along together, and then all of a sudden somebody will start eating each other. <laughs> it is fascinating to see that, and we have seen um, we have seen things change. For it seemed like sort of a calm aquarium type environment to things now be getting a little more lively out here, which is exciting to see. And then some of the quad view, we're actually seeing some barracuda, it looks like, as well as the sand tiger sharks and all yeah. sorts of things. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, those sand tigers that we're seeing there on, on feed one really seem to be a lot more active, um, you know, doing some tight turns and maneuvering, um, you know, a little bit more than we've seen perhaps throughout the day. Um, so that's, that's kind of an interesting observation from from the sand tiger shark behavior. So maybe they're um, starting to get, uh, get the message that, you know, maybe the light conditions are changing to be more favorable towards, um, you know, being able to, to do some hunting later on. Um, but it is really interesting just to watch how how this changes so quickly um, and and really not be able to pin that to any one specific thing. Uh, you know, Avery talked about so many mysteries still to solve, and um, there definitely 
um, as we're seeing today. Just lots of lots of questions out there still. Well, maybe and that's another good point to talk about this ROV, this uh, remotely operated vehicle technology that allows us to have this extended, non-intrusive, in some ways, bottom time here where uh, the, the ROV itself is actually quite a ways back from the back of the shipwreck. We can see in the quad view, but it's able to focus cameras and zoom in so far to really see these interactions. So perhaps we're, we're seeing some things um, without the marine life feel like they're being intruded upon because the ROV is so far back instead of sort of intruding to that, that personal space. Um, perhaps, but that's one of the, the advantages of an ROV is that it'll allow that zooming in really to see that stuff that could be, you know, 30, 40 feet away. That's such a great observation. You know, we've had this kind of technology on land for a long time. I mean, you can go buy a wildlife camera, you know, at Walmart now and put it up in your backyard and see who's coming to, you know, visit at night when we're all sleeping. And, you know, it, it's really eye-opening um, to so many people to see, you know, what's out there. Um, and these kinds of cameras are really giving us a, a very, um, you know, real snapshot of what these animals are doing, which is probably a little bit different when there are, you know, dive teams in the water and, and people swimming around that does perhaps impact their behavior more. So, you know, this is very much just a candid camera. Um, and it's, you know, it's just taken a while. It's a lot harder to do this work underwater, 250 feet down, you know, with currents ripping. And, you know, uh, you know, it's just so much more difficult to get this same kind of view um, that we can get pretty easily in our backyards and even in the forest, uh, you know, where other people put out wild cams. So it's just so great to see this technology finally being able to be deployed in the ocean um, and get these just long, you know, just hours of, of footage, um, which is not possible um, just using, you know, just human time, you know, just scuba divers in. So um, great to see. It's just great to see this technology being put to, to use for these ecological studies. Yeah, there it really is incredible. And uh, it may, might, for the folks at home, appear easy. And what we're doing is quite simple, but it is anything but that. I can tell you here, this, uh, this Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration team is you know, bat battling currents. Um, there's two ROVs in the water at one time that they're maneuvering together to give us these views. Um, you know, we're, we're linking to a satellite, if it's a satellite dish on a moving ship. Um, so it really is, it takes a village to get this done. And, um, but they just make it look at easy. And my expert, uh, Chris Sudley and I, literally just sitting in chairs behind them with a cold drink in our hand as they're very capably moving around the wreck. So, um, we're very lucky for all of us to be able to have this interaction and document um, these ama this amazing marine life in the shipwreck uh, with this technology. And I'll remind folks who are joining us that we are on the shipwreck site of the E.M. Clark. It is a World War II tanker sunk by a German U-boat. It was sunk by the U-124 on March 18th of 1942. Um, this is a victim of the Battle of the Atlantic, World War II's Battle of the Atlantic, that extended um, through all of the Atlantic Ocean from the coast of Africa, uh, Central America, South America, North America, Europe, Northern Europe. Uh, it's this worldwide conflict. Um, this is some of the remnants of that off North Carolina. And uh, folks don't realize how close World War II came to our shores, how close the German U-boats came to our shores, but this is but one of scores of these shipwrecks um, that are off our eastern seaboard in the Gulf of Mexico from that battle. Uh, some of the German U-boats came within a mile of shore, um, uh, putting down mines, sinking ships. So this is just a phenomenal, uh, incredible historical resource that has worldwide uh, importance and, 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 you know, really telling that story. But also, as we see here today, uh, it's an incredible habitat that we're so happy to share with people. I see there have the... ROV's arm out on the uh, the quad cam, if you can see that, and they're just sort of moving the um, claspers around. Just taking a look. And the pilots are just resetting. We're going to come up and move just a little bit. 
And, and Carol, as we're moving around, are there certain things that you'd like to see on the shipwreck? You know, we have to work with the current, but is there anything we could help highlight for you? Uh, yeah, thanks for asking. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm just so appreciative of what you guys are doing. I hate to ask for favors, right? Um, I think, um, you know, for um, for the research that I do on the sharks, obviously trying to get those great images of the sides of the sharks with the thought patterns is really useful. Um, I know we've got the laser rigs that, um, you know, or the laser technology that we can uh, project the laser rigs onto the, or the laser dots onto the sides of the, some of the fish. Um, I don't know if we've been doing that for some of the sand tiger sharks, but if that's something uh, we could do, um, that would be fantastic to really understand, you know, what size are these sharks? You know, we can kind of estimate. We think they're, you know, six to eight feet long, but um, having that actual data would be really interesting. Um, I'm also interested in, um, you know, how, how the sharks move around the wreck. You know, for the most part, what we seem to be seeing, and this is just sort of a, a general observation or um, feeling, is that most of the sharks are on the side of the wreck or down at the bottom near the sand. And we do see them come up above the wreck um, from time to time um, up to that, you know, that part that's up in the above the, the wreck more towards the water column um, and that is something that I'm kind of interested in is where the sharks spend most of their time and um, and that's something that's really hard to capture from the still photographs that divers are typically submitting to spot a shark uh, USA um, so just being able to see that um, in more detail here um, is really interesting I'm also interested in you know the fish that hang out around the sharks um you know dr paxton was there you go great laser technology there thank you that was um <laughs> um that was that was awesome um you know uh dr paxton mentioned earlier about how um you know when you see shipwrecks with lots of fish those are also shipwrecks where you see sand tiger sharks and there seems to be some sort of a correlation there between fish diversity and the presence or absence of sand tiger sharks i think that's really fascinating because most of us might think wow there's sharks all the fish are going to swim away because they don't want to be breakfast or lunch right um and what we're seeing is really the opposite of that um you know kind of counterintuitive a bit I mean, these sharks are swimming right up against, um, you know, these all these other species of fish that they could easily munch on if they, you know, those are just scooby snacks to them. Um, <laughs> so to me, it is really interesting that, you know, seeing how the largest fish on these reefs, which is the sand tiger sharks, are interacting with the, the smaller fish, to me, is, is really quite fascinating. And being able to figure out maybe when that relationship changes in terms of when feeding behavior might start um, is something I'm really hoping to maybe see when we do the night dive, um, hopefully the night ROV um, mission here in a few days. I think that'll be really interesting to see the, to be able to compare, um, to compare that. So thanks you guys um, for the great data that you're collecting here. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I just want to chime in that this view that we're looking at right now is just beautiful. We're seeing a large school of mainly vermilion snapper hovering above the shipwreck. Um, these are fish that during part of their life phase, they'll eat plankton um, that's floating or gently moving in the water column. Um, and so this is one of the phenomenon that we think is happening on shipwrecks where by creating this really tall obstruction um, or structured habitat underwater, it's able to alter the flow of the water. So it's able to create little eddies that may concentrate some of this plankton in form of a buffet almost for these schooling vermilion snapper and other similar species to um, grab plankton as they float by. And so our team's been trying to gather concrete evidence that supports this hypothesis. We're beginning to chip away at it. Um, and so far, the evidence is lining up. Um, but footage like this 
us as well as observations from the ROV team will help us be able to continue to put some of the pieces of this mystery together. And Steve Ross, I'm wondering if um, you can add a little bit to that. What are your observations from some of your submersible dives and remotely operated vehicle dives of how fish relate to the current in terms of where they're located and what they may be able to gain from it? Well, yeah, that came up a, l a little bit earlier. Somebody asked a question about the, uh, the currents. Um, it, you know, one of the and I was looking at the at the view as we were as I was thinking about that. Uh, the larger fish, like those sharks, you can see are able to move through these currents without much difficulty. But if you look at the behavior, like right right now, the lower left, you can see these mammalian snappers seem to be pushed around by the current more. Uh, they can still hold their position, but you know, the smaller the fish, the, the closer they seem to be to the wreck. And, of course, a lot of these fish don't want to be swept off of this productive habitat. So the influence you, you know, of the currents is really important. The wreck provides shelter, but at the same time, the current hitting the wreck can be accelerated on one side. Um, so it's a real mixed environment oceanographically. Yeah, that's a great point. And one of the tools that our team will use to try to tease apart answers to some of these questions is that we'll um, emit pulses of sound downwards into the water column. Um, and we can use that sound pulses and how it reflects from harder objects to not only map shipwrecks in the seafloor, but also to map where the fish are and be able to estimate their sizes. Um, and so through using one of those tools called a split beam echo sounder, we are able to find out that just like we're observing today, some of these big fish predators like the jack tend to stay um, close to the wreck. Um, and then some of the bait fish will actually be a little bit further away. But there's this push and this pull, this threshold, where those dynamics can change, um, especially if the current strengthens. And then it's too costly for some of these fish to try to hold their body positions. And so in those cases, some of the fish will then hunker down um, in areas that are protected from the current, sometimes inside the wreck, sometimes um, just literally using the wreck structure to shelter themselves as a block on this for the current. You know, one, one thing that comes to mind, Avery, to add to that is in some of my deeper works, say down to five or 600 meters deep, uh, there's a fish that's sort of equivalent to these vermilion snapper called Alfonsino um, in the genus Barrix. And th they often will will occur in these same kinds of schools around a structure like a canyon wall um, or a deep-sea coral reef. Um, and I've seen large schools of those up against a cliff wall sheltering from the current. But at the same time, that species feeds up in the water column, sometimes quite a distance off of the bottom. And so the question that I've always had is, like, and vermilion snapper also can feed quite high in the water column. Uh, how do they get back to the wreck? How do they maintain their position over a wreck in these large currents? And I don't think anybody's ever addressed that uh, very well. Yeah, I I certainly um, haven't seen an answer to that. It's a compelling question and something you just said about what you're seeing on some of the deeper um, walls, for example, it reminds me of the coral reef literature where they call this phenomenon the wall of mouths, where bait fish will sit right at the edge of that reef. Um, and as areas of upwelling bring the water and the current upward, they'll sit there right at the top of this reef wall um, and eat the plankton as it comes through. And so it seems like that pattern may be more pervasive. Um, but, Tani, so we've talked a tremendous amount recently about the ecology um, and wondering if you can share with us a little bit more about the um, history of this wreck. We've talked a little bit about its sinking circumstances. We've talked about how it's oriented on the seafloor. We've talked about the rudder. Um, et cetera, but anything else that you'd like to highlight from the uh, the history and archaeology side? Yeah, well, thank you, Avery. Um, you know, maybe I'll pass it to my cohort here on the ship, Chris Sudley, because he's actually looking at some of the data we've collected 
over the years that we documented on the E.M. Clark, and he's actually looking at the uh, photo mosaic that we created of the shipwreck site. And uh, maybe, Chris, what's what's uh, so, some of your observations from what you've seen from data collected from years past to some of these incredible views the uh, audience at home is seeing now? I can say, I, actually, I'm comparing the, the uh, photo mosaic that looks like you and... Uh, you and Joe were able to uh, photograph and, and put together on one of your dives a while back. Um, you know, and just making the observations here, the, the wreck seems to be pretty in pretty good shape, pretty consistent to, uh, to what I'm seeing here in the, in the mosaic from, from several years ago. The, in terms of you know, the, the same uh, look, looking at the stern area, the, the same level of, bower, of uh, burial and scour, uh, the exposure seems to be almost exactly the same. Um, and, and same thing, of course, the, the photo mosaic doesn't lend itself well to, uh, to catching a lot of the, the smaller schooling fish. But, but again, seeing the same thing with the, with the sand tigers, uh, seeing them congregating around the bottom uh, as well as a few of them. Uh, cruising around up top on the the starboard side, so I'm, I think what we're seeing is is pretty consistent from what was observed before to, to what we're seeing here today, uh, which which bodes well bodes well for the preservation on these shipwrecks. I think absolutely. And if uh, folks are looking, I think it might be feed two on the quad view. You can actually see I'm going to call it a whole fleet of sand tiger sharks on the right hand side on the seafloor. It's just fascinating for for me. As a as a diver and enthusiast, just to see so many of them just laying there. Well, and, and the same thing with the uh, rear view camera from uh, from Yogi, uh, the black and white that's in the the lower right of uh, feed two, a whole s score of them, you know, fleet herd squadron, um, you know, <laughs> hanging hanging out uh, behind the uh, behind the ROV where you see the uh, the tether that the the neutral tether that goes up to uh, to Guru the the uh the higher up rov and maybe for, for carol is this sort of yeah. um what what is this behavior we're seeing where there's so many sharks there on the seafloor yeah so you know that's really interesting um you know i was, I was kind of thinking about this um when i started to look at the quad view there you know um and really what it made me think about is the the word variability right so what we're seeing is, you know, a couple dozen sharks at least, a couple dozen sand tiger sharks on this wreck right now, and they're not all doing the same thing. So presumably they're all sort of experiencing the same ocean conditions and, and all of that sort of thing. But we see them doing really different things. So we've got this one, you know, cluster of sharks that's aggregating there with their noses into the current. You know, they're, they're fairly close to each other, um, all sort of doing the same thing. But off of the wreck, uh, very tightly, more tightly associated with the sand. And then even coming into view, we have this other group of sharks um, doing completely different things. So they're swimming around the wreck. Some of them are very active. I saw some really acrobatic swimming um, a few minutes ago coming up around the top of the, the top of the ship there, um, swimming at the top of the – above the ship and almost like – splitting through that river of, of smaller fish there. So, you know, this to me is just fascinating is, you know, what is the difference between those sharks, those, you know, 12, 14, 15 sharks hanging out there on the sand and their, um, and their buddies that are, you know, much more actively swimming in different parts of the wreck. And, I mean, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, and I, but I think as scientists, that's what makes our job you know, so fascinating is that, you know, in, in just a few minutes, right when you think you know what's going on, everything can change just in a blink of an eye, and, and it, it kind of leaves you scratching your head. So certainly all of the sand tiger shark swimming behaviors that we're seeing right now are normal, but they just exhibit this wide variety of, of behaviors, and um, it's what makes it just so fun to do our jobs. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible. And, and Avery, I believe it's called, a group of sharks like this is called a shiver. Is that correct? <laughs> that is correct, Tony. Well done. 
Uh, you earned your ecology gold star for the day. Yeah, uh, impressive. Uh, uh, I, I will share with our group that um, uh, Avery and I are, are you know, sort of uh, co-leads for this project, so we're constantly texting each other to make sure we get the 4K recorded and if she has something in particular um, that she'd like to see that we capture, so she shared that expertise with me. I. I, I don't pretend to have any at all. <laughs> so <laughs> I looked at the, uh, the wonderful marine life and appreciate it uh, for their natural beauty and for what perhaps they taste like um, sautéed with butter. And that's about mm. the level of my expertise. <laughs> yeah, well, I wonder if it's a, if the original reason was uh, it's a shiver of sharks because if you see that many together, it makes you shiver. Oh, that's <laughs> to, to think about it. Maybe. Um, for our ecologist on the line, our actual <laughs> degreed archaeologist, uh, what would be the, the origin of a, a shiver of sharks? That is a good question. I do not know the answer to that. Carol, do you know the answer to that? I, I sort of missed the yeah. Yeah. idea. Um, it's, a, it's, a great, um, it's a great question. Um, we'll need to get some linguists. Um, on our um, on our our team here of experts to give us the etymology of, <laughs> of that word. Well, and, and, and actually, that's interesting so, because the the term the the shiver me timbers that goes back to the the days of sail. The the shivers of the timbers were actually the the splinters or the shrapnel that would be blown off of the the wooden timbers when a uh, when a cannonball hit. So the uh, the the shivers of the timbers were the were the splinters that were coming off of the uh, uh, coming off of the uh, the wreck itself, and that's today's uh, pro tip from our underwater archaeology <laughs> team. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that reminds me of is how um, the current is pretty strong right now, and we can see some of the organisms growing on the structure, shivering, if you will, or moving back and forth. And I'm wondering if there might be an opportunity to get up close and see some of those. It might be challenging with the current, so if it's not possible, that's okay. But I think what we'll see is that not only are the sharks facing into the current in many of the situations right now, um, we've already talked about the vermilion snapper kind of moving to and fro, being guided mainly by the current, um, as well as their own volition. And then I think we would also see some of these filter feeding organisms with kind of feathery appendages um, possibly moving a little bit in the current. Roger that, Avery. And I believe just a second ago, we may have seen a different species of fish that we hadn't yet gotten a good view of. Um, Steve, to me, they looked like scad. Did you see that silvery um, group of bait fish? And do you think they were scad? I couldn't get a 100% positive ID. No, I, I'm sorry, I didn't see those. Um, so, oh, yeah. but Stad, Stad could be here. Yeah, that would be really interesting. That um, Avery, as you know, that's one of the fish that's often very tightly associated with sand tiger sharks. That you talked about uh, Nick Coleman's work on that. Um, you know, sort of documenting that um, relationship between the sand tiger shark and the scad. Is that is that them right there that they're zeroing in on right now? Um. Gosh, so those still look like um, vermilion snapper in the foreground, but I think those are scad in the background, the smaller, kind of more slender Tiny one. ones. But again, I can't quite get a positive ID on them. That would be really exciting to see them and maybe get some video of that interaction between the scad and the sand tiger shark. Stay tuned. Oh, okay, our ROV pilots are repositioning, but if it's possible to go back where we were on top of the hole there to look at those uh, species that we were describing just a few moments ago. Tony, we're also seeing a few organisms that are white. They have a spiral to them. We just passed one of them. They look kind of like a whip or almost like a pigtail. And those, we believe, are a type of black coral. Um, I don't see one in the picture right now, but wanted to alert viewers in case they see them um, in a second. Um, as a novice, maybe I could ask the question that, uh, the, so you think they're a species of black coral, why are they white? 
That's a great question. So um, I actually did not know the answer to that until a few days ago um, when somebody asked that question and we um, asked some of our experts and learned that when the organism was first identified, it was usually sampled and brought up um, onto ships. And at that point, the coral um, died and it looked, um, it looked black. Um, and so now we're able to see it underwater and see that in its living form, the main component of it does have that white coloration. But again, I'm no coral expert. Um, Steve, do you have anything to add there? Uh, yeah, I could add to that. Uh, and we, we see a lot of black coral in the deeper work that I do. Um, and some of it is, they're absolutely magnificent colonies of all sorts of colors, white and orange and bright red. But that's the uh, outer skin, the living flesh of the coral is a lot of different colors like these we see here are white. And they appear in a lot of different uh, types of forms, but the internal skeleton is very hard and very black. Um, and that's the part that they make jewelry from. Um, you'll see that in a lot of tropical places. not a very good practice ecologically, but... Um, it is a very hard material that can be carved. And some of these black corals, probably not these small ones we see here, but some of the large ones in the deep sea can live for several hundred to um, over a couple of thousand years old. So they're that some of the oldest incredible. living organisms. Uh, yeah, and you, and, you know, we've dated those from a, a lot of different places. And you can also use the rings inside the coral as um, ecological markers for different events over time, just like you use tree rings. And Steve, can you share with viewers a um, little bit about how these black corals feed? What's their strategy there? Um, they have polyps, uh, just like regular corals, uh, little tentacle sort of structures that uh, are sit on the skin and they're covered in those the tentacles come out and they basically feed on whatever's drifting by the water column um, plankton small particles well wow, that's fascinating um yeah I, I had no idea you know that it's a good lesson for for all of us when you're visiting these sites you know you do the classic take only pictures leave only bubbles um, treat the shipwreck, treat the, the habitat and the environment with respect, use good neutral buoyancy, enjoy it, but um, leave it intact, leave it for the next person, and leave it for the, the marine environment to uh, still thrive and don't affect it. Uh, I'll mention this, this project, um, we're not taking any samples, we're not doing any artifact collection. There is an arm on the ROV, but it's for um, emergency procedures to be able to move a line. Um, so we're really sort of taking, other than us being in there physical space, we're taking a non-intrusive viewpoint um, of these surveys to try to keep it as, as natural and as pristine as we can. Some great shots of sharks here again for Carol. So, Watana, that actually brings up a question to, to my mind is the, we've observed over the past couple days when we've done these dives that it seems like later in the day the or the longer we're in the dive the the more schooling the more activity we see sometimes it's like it's you know we've been attributing to the being getting later in the day and the and the change of normal normal activity but i wonder as well if it might be the fact that the the fish and the other critters around are starting to become more desensitized to the rov being there because we were talking about how even observing the behavior looks different than it does as as it would when we're divers. You know, open circuit if we're making bubbles or even closed circuits if you've got the, the strange sounds coming from the the closed circuit rebreather with the with the oxygen sensors, the injection and, and everything. Um, if they're getting used to the ROV and so they're going back to a more active, more you know, quote unquote normal behavior as if the ROV weren't there. It's a great question for the ecologists on the line. Steve, I'm going to let you tackle that one. <laughs> okay. Well, it could be some of, of both that 
Uh, fish change their activity patterns during the day. You know, most fishermen know that there are different times when you can catch fish because they're feeding at different times. Uh, so activity does change during the day, but it's also very likely that they are getting used to the RV. When something first appears on the bottom that's different, some fish are repelled by it and others are attracted. And then over time that becomes less novel and they, they can't adjust to it. And, Steve, that actually relates to a question in the chat that I think is a good one for Carol. Um, Carol, one of the viewers is wondering if any of the smaller fish that we're seeing today might be prey for the sand tiger sharks that we're seeing. Uh, certainly some of them might be, um, but um, our, you know, what we're seeing is that during the day we're not seeing these sand tiger sharks really foraging on any of the other small fish. We think that that's probably happening maybe at dusk or at dawn or sometime during the night. Um, in fact, you can see that little tiny school of tiny, tiny fish. I'm not sure what those were um, around that shark. And many of the fish are really not avoiding the sand tiger sharks. So the, the, some of those smaller fish, the snapper and so forth, are, are really not avoiding the sharks. Um, so it's almost like they know that those sharks are not in, um, you know, predatory mode right now, although we suspect that that probably shifts once the light levels go down maybe later in the day. Um, sand tiger sharks feed on a variety of organisms. They feed on fish and um, um, even other shark species. So they are definitely, um, you know, could eat um, the, the other fish around there, but for whatever reason um, are not actively feeding at this time. And you can see that the fish really aren't um, aren't really avoiding them. You know, uh, they're not running away. They somehow have, have some sort of sense that this is not dinner time for the sand tiger sharks. So great question. Um, I'll remind our viewers at home that we are on the World War II era tanker, the E.M. Clark. We're at 260 feet on the seafloor right now. The E.M. Clark is approximately 500 feet long and extends about 65, 60 feet off the seafloor itself. It's, it is laying on its left-hand side, the port side. And right now we're at the stern of the vessel, which is the, the end of the vessel. Uh, we just saw the propeller which is to the right of the screen there, and we went over the rudder, and we're coming up over on the right-hand side of the hull, the, the starboard side, coming up to the side of that there, and that's the side that's facing the ocean, excuse me, the surface, because it's all in the ocean, of course. Um, and as we come up, and we're going to get some really nice views here of uh, the sand tiger sharks. You can see openings in the hull. You can still see the framework of the vessel with its construction. And I should mention, too, this, this vessel was sunk by a German U-boat, the U-124 on March 18th, 1942. Uh, two torpedoes were fired into its side. Uh, it sank quite quickly. It only had one loss of life. It was just one poor individual who was in, actually in the ship's hospital, their infirmary, um, and the torpedo exploded right by him. Oh, here's some great views here for the audience. And you'll see it in just a moment. Oh, wow. Okay, so that's what we've been talking about. So that was a... Um I would call that a bait ball, so a very densely oh, yeah. packed group of fish, and they're silvery, they're moving quickly and in a coordinated fashion together, um, and I also caught the tail end of that where it looked like there was a jack following behind them, um, corralling them, to use that word we've been going back to today. So a really great example there of some behavior that we see on these sites. Um, and just beautiful to see how it can change so quickly. We can go from a relatively um, kind of harmonious, static state all of a sudden to that um, energy being infused as that bait ball forms and moves as a cohesive unit trying to avoid predators that may try to take a bite out of the stragglers. Yeah, that was fantastic. Well, maybe, yeah, that was really quite something to see. Maybe for our ROV pilots, if we're able to get uh, if we able to hold position up, that side again we might see more of that behavior and it's a spectacular view up here on top of the wreck as well 
So, Tani and Chris Southerly, one of the things from the ecology perspective that we've been really interested in is understanding how fish associate with different materials. Um, and so this stems from the cases where artificial reefs, so intentionally deployed objects are placed on the seafloor. Sometimes they're metal ships, sometimes they're concrete pieces, sometimes they're made out of rubber or other materials. And one of my questions for you today is I know this is a metal ship, but can you talk a little bit more about um, its construction and uh, is it all metal or there are other wood pieces somewhere on this ship that may be um, mixed in as well? I guess, yeah, sure, Avery. We'd be glad to uh, talk about that a little bit. The, uh, this particular ship is uh, steel construction, so all of the internal structural pieces uh, as well as the, the hull would have been uh, designed and, and made out of, of steel uh, rather than wooden frames. It would have been more like a, a metal I-beam type of thing. Um, the the hull plating on the outside uh, is as opposed to a more modern ship where the, the plates and pieces would have been welded together to form a more solid surface. Uh, these were done, they would have been riveted on um, to the to the framing members and that's one of the reasons as it's degrading and starting to, pieces starting to fall off, you see like rectangular openings where the individual riveted plates would have come loose or either been blown out or the, the riveting starts to fail. The um, there would have been the the main deck itself uh, was in all likelihood uh, wood. So as if you recall back, or you, know, you can actually uh, folks at home can actually rewind in in their YouTube uh, feed a little ways. If you can uh, kind of like you would a, D a DVR, uh, if if you slide back from the live view, you can, where you can see the 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 top part of the fantail which would have been on the left hand side um, you can see the the decking uh, the the deck beams that are the, the metal support beams there that would have had the the wood decking uh, laid over top of that but this would have would have been primarily steel construction uh, throughout the uh, the vessel so but, but again that's that's one of the reasons why the these ships do uh, hang around so long as opposed to um, the the wooden vessels where in, in which cases the wood wood construction or primarily wood construction all we would see left of it would be the um, the machinery and the, the steam engines uh, and and the mechanical parts of the, the ship would be uh, would endure unless it were buried under the sediment And so the burial and exposure portion of the ship is really interesting from the ecological lens as well. Um, as we know, this area is so dynamic and we can have sediment that moves quite dramatically. Um, and one of the things that can do is if a portion of the shipwreck is covered up, the organisms that grow on it are also covered up. And so over time, that can kind of give you a clean plate. It can wipe that surface relatively clean. Um, and it'll be a relatively bare surface that new organisms can colonize once it becomes exposed when that sediment moves off of it. So really interesting parallel there. Um, we do have another question coming in on the chat. Um, we have a viewer wondering if the light from the remotely operated vehicle may be influencing the feeding behavior. Um, of the fish or potentially other behaviors. And Steve, Ross, would you like to take that one? Uh, sure. Um, that, that always comes up when we do this kind of work, um, and, and sometimes other, challenge, other scientists will challenge us and say, well, you know, what you're describing in your scientific paper is really a disturbance factor because you're using an ROV or even a scuba diver. Um, so there is an impact there, and it's difficult to measure because your, your, your observations are coming from the device that may be causing the impact. Uh, you know, right now, if we look at these fish, um, they're well lit by the lights from the ROV. They do not seem to be ch 
changing their behaviors. Um, other times we see fish uh, dart around, and especially where I work in the deep sea, even deeper where there's no light, uh, all of a sudden turning on a bright light has a, a major impact on animals. Um, and, but they, it can be a repulsion or an attraction, or in some cases as they've become used to the vehicle, uh, there's no impact. So it's a, it's a full range. And also there's noise uh, from these vehicles. Steve, I have a, this is Carol Price, I have a, another question that maybe that I get a lot that I usually kind of have to shrug and say I'm not real sure, but um, maybe you can um, help me learn a little bit more. I get a lot of questions about um, the electromagnetic field around um, these metal vessels and whether sharks or other fish are orienting to that, um, to, to that. And I, I'm just curious what you think about uh, that or even their what the you know the equipment that is down the ROVs and and the ships whether um, whether you think that is also an attractant or perhaps a repellent do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I have some thoughts, but not very much uh, actual data or facts. I, I, you know that's come up a number of times, and particularly with sharks. Sharks have the ability uh, more than a lot of fish to to um, sense electromagnetic fields. Uh, they have a sensory system that uh, that allows that. Uh, what, you know, whether these wrecks they, you know, still have, um, of course, they're, they do have a magnetic signature because a lot of the times when we were searching for wrecks, um, people used to use magnetometers, um, you know, to look to find a steel signature. Um, I don't know of much literature that's, that's um, available to address that. Uh, I know that the question has come up a number of times, um, especially with sharks. So, uh, of course, the ROVs, you know, have some similar, you know, magnetic or electronic signatures that are possibly sensed, but, you know, we, we can't tell that there's an impact there. Sorry, I don't have more specific data. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, I sort of, uh, you know, I'm not, you know, I sort of say some similar things when asked so I figured if I if I had you um, had your expertise available I would um, I would see if I could uh, learn a little bit more um, I, it's just been fascinating here to watch these um, these interactions here and things have really shifted and unfortunately I have to get off the call now um, but um, I just wanted to say thanks again to everyone for having me on today and um, it's been really great to hang out with such great smart people and learn a lot <laughs> and thanks to all to noah and the gfoe for this opportunity yeah thank you so much uh, dr and carol Price. thank you so much for oh yep i was just going to say thank you so much for joining us today carol it was wonderful to have you on the line with your expertise um, and as Carol hopped off one of the things i wanted to highlight was you should be seen or you may have just seen some other interesting behavior on your screen. Um, I was seeing a smallish school of silvery bait fish that was moving quickly over the side of the shipwreck, um, and we're seeing a lot of jacks almost patrolling around the edges of the wreck, which is a behavior that we do frequently see. Um, and, and so as we look closer um, towards the wreck structure, we're starting to get some really nice images of the organisms growing on the wreck. Um, a lot of these, if you look closely, you can almost see them swaying as the water moves by. Um, and some of them are bushy, almost um, filamentous isn't quite the right word. Maybe bushy is a better word. Um, and some of those are likely hydroids or bryozoans that are growing in a kind of fuzzy um, layer on the shipwreck itself. Um, I've also seen some sponges, a few tunicates today, and we've seen some beautiful purple and pink soft corals. We've seen some hard coral in the um, spaces inside of the wreck, likely a type of Oculina, um, which is a coral type that we see here. And right now on my screen, I'm looking at two fish um, that are very close to the wreck structure. They have two vertical black bars along their body, and those are reef butterfly fish. Um, and they're a tropical species that we do see a lot of on shipwrecks. 
um, especially in deeper waters. And now we're getting a phenomenal view of the underside of what looks to be a female shark. I didn't quite get a good view of the underside. Um, we'll get a better view in just a second to see if there's claspers there, which would, oh, nope, there are no claspers. This is a beautiful female, and you can see um, the spots along the sides. Here comes a male into the screen of view. You see the claspers um, towards the tail, which indicates that that's a male shark. Uh, Avery, are we seeing adult sand tiger sharks here, or is there a mix of juveniles and adults? So, Tane, that's a really good and difficult question. It's a little bit hard to tell without having the scale um, to understand how large those animals actually are. They can grow to be up to about 10 feet. Dr. Carol Price from the North Carolina Aquarium, who was on the line earlier, estimated that these individuals were maybe 7 to 8 feet. Um, and when we are able to see the reproductive appendages of claspers um, like that, it does mean it's uh, not a juvenile. Um, it's more of an um, adult animal. But I, I don't have a 100% answer on that. We'd need the size information to be able to tell for sure. Oh, thank you. Well, I should uh, point out for my, the... My oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Dr. Ross, why don't you go ahead? I, I was... I was just going to add that my impression is, I mean, um, Avery's right, you know, we'd need more specific data. My impression is that most of these are adults. Mm. Yeah, we got another good view of a shark. Oh, um, for our audience members at home that are just joining us around the world, we're, we are the Valor in the Atlantic Telepresence Project. Uh, this is a, a cooperative project with NOAA and the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries and the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration, now known as GFOE. They're responsible for providing this beautiful imagery to you today, live from the seafloor. Um, we are using two remotely operated vehicles used in tandem, two ROVs, they're two underwater robots, um, and they design them, they build them, they pilot them, and they provide all of the infrastructure here, as well as the satellite capability that they brought aboard the ship. Noah's Nancy Foster installed everything. That's how we're bringing these stories to you live, this real-world exploration. Uh, my name is Tane Casserly. I'm a maritime archaeologist with Noah's Monitor National Marine Sanctuary. I'm joined on the ship by Chris Southerly. He's an underwater archaeologist with North Carolina's Office of State Archaeology. Hoping to talk about all these wonderful shipwrecks. But, of course, these aren't just shipwrecks. They're incredible habitat and so important to the, uh, the region's ecology and the story of that here. And that's why we're partnered with uh, NOAA's National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science uh, with Dr. Avery Paxton we have on the line. And Avery, you've got some, some additional experts with you, is that correct? Yes, we have Dr. Steve Ross from the University of North Carolina Wilmington on the phone with us today. Um, Steve has for decades been exploring and studying the shipwrecks and other habitats that we have off the coast of North Carolina and beyond. Um, Steve, what are your um, impressions of this shipwreck so far? I know we've talked about a lot of different components, um, but just very curious if this is what you expected to see when you joined today or if we're seeing something unexpected perhaps. <clears throat> well, I, I'm not seeing anything unexpected, but it's a spectacular uh, habitat. Um, you know, as we said before, it represents an, an unusual island at what normally would be a sandy bottom. Uh, and one of our views before, we saw uh, ripple marks on the sand, and basically what that indicates is that they're pretty strong currents that sweep through this area. So. This, this shipwreck has provided a, not only a, a structure for the fish, but it's also modified the local oceanography, uh, changed the way the water currents maybe deliver foods. Um, we're seeing a large number of these vermilion snapper, which the commercial fishermen also call bee liners. Um, and I assume there's probably some commercial fishing on this wreck, uh, but they're still quite a number of fish. I think one thing I'm kind of surprised about is that I don't see more grouper. Uh, I would have expected perhaps to see more grouper. Um, we do know that the sand tiger sharks have used these wrecks uh, for a long time. And one of the original 
hypotheses was that they were uh, forming spawning aggregations, uh, and I think to some extent that's true. Uh, but they're also here because they're drawn to the food source. So it's a it's an extremely interesting habitat. You know, and the deeper you go along this outer continental shelf, say between 200 feet and 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 600 feet, um, it's a, an amazing transition zone. Yeah, it's amazing. But yeah, thank you, Dr. Ross. And uh, I believe we also might have Joe Schwartzer with us. Joe, are you with us on the line? I am on, Tony. Well, Joe, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Joe Schwartzer is the director of the North Carolina Maritime Museum System, um, You know, focusing in on the graveyard at the Atlantic Museum there in Hatteras, North Carolina. Fantastic museum. We've got really uh, wonderful exhibitry. A lot of it focuses on the USS Monitor, which is near and dear to my heart, but but Joe, we're on the the World War II tanker, the E.M. Clark, um, you know, sunk in 1942. And I know I really want to give a plug to your upcoming exhibit talking about World War II and the Battle Atlantic uh, to be unveiled at the graveyard at the Atlantic Museum. Is that correct? Uh, yes, Tony. Thank you. Uh, we are. It, it'll be in later in June. And of course, uh, we'll be talking about E.M. Clark and the and the 78 other ships that were taken out by U-boats in the in the first few months of World War II and how critical that was, uh, not only to the to the war effort but to our, the war along our coast. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, for folks who are just joining us, this tanker, the E.M. Clark, was sunk by the U-boat, the German U-boat, U-124, on March 18th, 1942. Uh, it had two torpedoes fired at it. Uh, it sank quite quickly. It did have one loss of life, which uh, one poor individual um, who was in the infirmary uh, near where the torpedo exploded, and and he lost his life. But thank goodness, all the other mariners got off. So we're we're looking at this shipwreck, you know, helping to tell that worldwide conflict uh, about the Battle of the Atlantic and World War II, and how close that war came to our shores. This is a victim of that war here on the seafloor, and as Joe mentioned, there's scores more of them, especially here in North Carolina but up and down the eastern seaboard. So we're very happy to be sharing this story with you. It's incredibly important that we remember um, what occurred off our shores and to celebrate uh, the shipwreck. And and we think about and remember, of course, all those that lost their lives um, during all these conflicts and, and, and any sort of activity off, off our oceans, which it's not just the wars and the conflicts, but, you know, they don't call it Cape Hatters for nothing. There, there's storms and all sorts of events that have sunk literally thousands of ships off North Carolina. So, Joe, thank you for joining us today. Delighted. Thank you for having me. So maybe for Dr. Ross, are there um, maybe some things in the shipwreck uh, that you would like the ROV to take a look at for you? Maybe some things of interest we haven't seen yet. Um, I'm, we're, we're sort of hovering all around the same area, of course, you know, the ideal thing is to cover as much different territory as possible. Uh, are we able to get to the uh, top deck area that's on um, more toward the port side that's in the sand? Um, yeah, I can ask the ROV. That? I can ask the ROV pilots that that might be a possibility. Um, we're actually battling a 2.4 knot current at the moment, so that's why we're yeah. somewhat hiding uh, behind what we call the lee of the ships we get a little bit of break from the current but uh yeah if we're able to we'll definitely give it a, a go but it might be challenging for us today well that, that's that's probably what i expected and you know you have to the currents dictate often what we well we're able to see yeah absolutely so it's you know we're we're privileged as researchers to to see the subject matter and but we have to remember that we are um, we are very uh, lucky to have the NOAA ship Nancy Foster, who or is dealing with surface conditions. So you'll have them have to compensate for a strong wind, a strong wave action, and a strong surface current, which might be in three different directions. And then of course the ROV pilots here, who are dealing with that, the moving ship, two ROVs in the water, and the current. So uh, it's, it's a, a delicate dance and ballet, but we're doing pretty well so far. But uh, if we're capable um, capable of moving, uh, Dr. Ross, we will try to get that view for you. And there's been another question. Oh, go ahead, Steve. No, I, was, no I, I had nothing. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, I was going to say um, that we have another good question from the chat. 
Um, we've identified that we've seen some male sharks come through. We talked about the um, claspers, those reproductive um, modified pelvic appendages. And the question is, have we also seen female sharks today? And yes, we have. I don't have a good estimate for the proportion of females versus males that we've seen, um, but we have definitely been seeing both males and females today. And Tane, is the ROV repositioning right now? Is that what we're seeing? Yep, absolutely. Just kind of the ship is moving a little bit, so we're compensating too to try to get us a better view of the shipwreck. So again, it's just part of that delicate dance where we back off to make sure we're safely um, away from the shipwreck. Um, we maneuver and then try to come back in. One of the things you guys have mentioned several times is this complicated dance between the two-bodied ROV and its umbilical and and the ship. Um, it's hard to appreciate that unless you're you've been on board and watched one of these operations. The the Nancy Foster I've used on a number of cruises, and um, they have an excellent crew. Uh, it's a good platform. They have what's called dynamic positioning that. Um, tries to keep the ship in a stable position, but as the ROV needs to move, so has the ship have to move, and there are different conditions on the surface than at the bottom. So uh, it's, that's, that's something that viewers have a hard time appreciating, how difficult these operations are. Yeah, very and, well said, Steve. Um, yeah, thank you for that. There's a good segue there to another question in the chat, which is that with two remotely operated vehicles, um, yogi and guru in the water where are the tms positions on the boat are they at the stern or the bow so um, that will probably be a question for the global foundation for ocean exploration rov team um, i'm not sure if they're in the middle of the maneuver and can answer that um, but if not we'll get to that question when we're able to yeah i'll pass it to the if the rov pilots are able they're just in the middle of a maneuver um, pilots are you able to answer that question And maybe not quite right now. So actually, I've been given the word, Avery, that um, the the, equi the equipment is maxed out now with our thrusters on both the ROV and the ship. So I think we're going to actually have to call the dive because of the environmental conditions. Oh, that's too bad. Okay. So, but we did have um, several hours, nearly a full day, to be honest. So, um, but thank you, for everyone, for joining us. But again, it's in Cape Hatteras. Um, the... This, the, I'm just sorry. I'm just looking at the wind and things. Um, yeah, we're getting wind gusts that are over 25 knots, uh, sustained Ooh. about 18, and then 2.4 knot current. So, um, you know, we, we want to be safe. Uh, we want to be make sure the equipment is safe. We want to make sure retrieving the uh, equipment over the side. Make sure the personnel is safe, and of course the the resources, well, the shipwreck and the marine life. So, um, the smartest thing right now when we get towards that edge is to pull back. And that's what we're doing today. So, but I want to say thank you so much for our experts today, lending your voice to this exploration. You know, sharing this with the world, this real-time um, experience. So, thank you, Dr. Ross. Thank you, Jim Schwartzer. We had Dr. Carol Price on earlier from the North Carolina Aquarium, at Roanoke Island. We had um, Paula Whitfield, and of course, Dr. Avery Paxton and Chris Suddley from North Carolina's Office of State Archaeology. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us today. And you know, as we're ascending. Um, you know, maybe some folks have some final words. So, Dr. Ross, from joining us today, joined us in a few of these dives. Um, you know, you're you're intimately uh, part of this story. You know, what's your thoughts as we as we leave the site now and as we start ascending? Well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, NOAA and the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration for doing something. I mean, this is, I know I'm sure the public realizes, but this is really cutting edge technology that is changing our ability to bring this to the public's you never get to see a shipwreck like this especially at this depth and uh, and then to, to bring it to bring it to the public and let them know what it represents um, the courage the sacrifice the conflict and how close how close we came to to losing um, uh, everything that's worthwhile and um, I'm, I'm just I'm just very pleased to be a part of this project I think I think it's doing very well I'm sorry about the current and the nature and uh, the weather, but you can't control that. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you, Joe, so much. And, uh, 
you know, it, it's very important for us to be, be able to share the story with the people of North Carolina, especially the, the people in those coastal communities that call this home, that their relatives, maybe they're still alive, that saw some of this action, um, and to bring this to them live. It's a very special thing we're able to do, so we're, we're privileged and honored to do it. Um, so maybe, uh, Chris Hudley, what do you think about what we saw today? The, uh, I'm, we got to come back to the, to the Clark, and we got some amazing video and continued to uh, deteriorate a little bit from what we saw this morning. But I, th I think kind of as, as a final thought for me, it's like, you know, what you said, of Tani, of, of bringing the story to the, to the people of North Carolina is like I'm thinking not only the, the folks along the coast and the, and the communities that, that, you know, have maybe have a personal memory or family memory of, of seeing some of this going on with grandparents or great grandparents and you know maybe remember some of the the fires offshore or the the rescued sailors coming ashore um of them back in the day uh but also you know taking the images and the message to the to the folks further inland um you know that in, in some cases you know I'm, I'm thinking again back to world war ii you know i had you know my grandfather lived in the mountains of virginia and he went into the navy and you know, some somebody local or family for him would have no clue about what he experienced or what he saw um, without doing something like this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Chris. And uh, Dr. Paxton, maybe some closing thoughts from you. It appears that Dr. Paxton is speechless. So maybe we'll see she'll join us towards the oh, end. Well, yes, I am speechless. <laughs> I am speechless, um, but I was also muted, which was part of the reason. Um, but I was <laughs> saying that this is just such a fantastic illustration of the fusion between the history and the biology. Today we've seen not only a culturally significant shipwreck, but we've seen that once it came to its final resting spot on the ocean floor, it has now taken on a new life, forming habitat for a diversity of marine life, ranging from small silvery bait fish all the way up to large predators. Um, so I thank everybody for joining in today. Um, I really enjoyed getting to share um, the insight that my colleagues brought to the table on the ecology side and have that combined with the expertise that the archaeologists and historians brought to the table. So, Tani, back to you. No. You, know, you you captured it very well, Avery. Thank you for that, and and that is that that is why we're doing this. You know, we're the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The ocean is in our name. We're the nation's premier ocean agency. Um, again, this isn't just a shipwreck; it's so much more, and we're so happy to tell that story. And, and for me, maybe building on what Chris said, that it's so important to share this history with people all across the country. Obviously, there's some folks that are going to be a little more immediately touched with this in North Carolina and this coastal communities, but this is a international story. So for the folks in the heartland that maybe have volunteered for service in World War II, their families can actually see this now from anywhere in the world and learn about this heritage that maybe they had a family member that uh, was part of these stories or even they just read about it. But, but that's why we're so happy to share that with you. So no matter where you are or who you are, you can be part of this process. So I think with that, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, I'm Tanai Casserly, again, signing off for Monitor National Marine Sanctuary Exploration. Please join us tomorrow. Stay tuned, and we'll see what we can do. Thank you so much, and I wish you all fair winds and a following sea. Thank you. You are currently the only person.